the Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Stories from the world's great literature of pure excitement. A new series frankly dedicated to your horrification and entertainment. Week by week, from the pick of new materials, from the pages of best-selling novels, from the theater of Broadway in London, the sound stages of Hollywood, will parade the most remarkable figures ever known. CBS gives you... Suspense. Tonight's presentation is one of the finest of the contemporary stories of mystery and terror. John Dixon Carr's famous novel, The Burning Court. Ah, a glass of sherry by the fireside of a beautiful suburban home. What could be more comforting? You're an admirable host, Mr. Defar. And it's really a shame our first meeting is under such a cloud. It's also a shame I have so little time to tell you which one of your guests here ah, murdered your uncle last week. Now, let's see now. I believe we're all here. Your wife, your friend, Mr. Stevens, Captain Brennan. Yes, and incidentally, yourself. Just who did you say you were? Well, no wonder you've had so much difficulty with the case, Captain. My name is Cross, Godan Cross, the writer. As a matter of fact, it's because of my just-completed book, Poisoning Throughout the Ages, that I happen to be here now. And Ted Stevens there happens to be a member of the firm which publishes my work. I'd never seen him until tonight, but I've been told what happened. This afternoon, he began reading my manuscript for the first time, on the train. The commuter's train, which every afternoon deposits him safely and soundly here in Christmas. I imagine he was halfway home by the time he finished the first chapter. Then he turned the page. Attached to the following leaf was a picture. And looking at it, the young man stiffened suddenly and all but cried out his shock. It was a picture of a young woman. And under it had been printed, Famous Poisoner Marie Dobre. 1676. Ted Stevens was looking at a picture of his own wife. Imagine, imagine his 25-year-old wife in 17th century costume. The face, the features, even a wistfulness of expression were identical. Even the name, Dobre, was his wife's maiden name. But no, 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 that was ridiculous. This woman in the picture was, well, one of his wife's ancestors. Yes, that was it, that was it. Simply an amazing family resemblance. Marie would be waiting for him at the station, and he'd have to tell her about it. He wondered why, however, she'd never told him about it. Oh, well, but you don't discuss such an ancestor, do you? Ted Stevens glanced down at the chapter to which the picture had been attached. It was entitled, The Affair of the Non-Dead Woman. <laughs> Ted. Stevens was almost jolted from his seat. It was Dr. Weldon, professor of English at the college, an old friend of his. Quickly, he thrust the picture beneath the manuscript and moved over. I, I didn't see you, Doc. Oh, here, have a seat. Oh, I thought maybe you were giving me the, uh, what do they call it? The brush off? Oh, no, I, uh, say, as a matter of fact, Doc, you're the one man I do want to see. Yeah? Very flattering. Remember those discussions we used to have about murders? <laughs> Better than bridge any time. Well, I got the idea that you made sort of a hobby out of the old cases, the historical ones. Well, I've studied quite a number of them, yes. Ever hear of a woman named Marie Dobre? Marie Dobre? Marie Dobre. Oh, yes. Uh, that was her maiden name, of course. One of the finest specialists in arsenic poisoning you could ever hope to find. Oh, we're almost at our station, Ted. Let's get to the door. Yes, a real charmer Marie was. Must have disposed of half a hundred husbands, lovers, suitors, and just plain friends before she was caught. Uh, what happened to her, Doc? She was beheaded and burned. Crispin! Oh, 
absurd, laughable. Ted Stevens kept saying this to himself, and yet what he knew was a foolish dread followed him straight through the small suburban station and clung to him as he reached the street. And there in the roadster was Marie, leaning toward him a little to hold the door open and smiling at him. Oh, Ted, what on earth are you staring at? That street light shining on your hair. I like that. Oh, you're tight. Come on, get in the car. Then, like a wisp of smoke, it was gone. The whole ridiculous fear. The delusion. When at home, Marie brought the cocktails into the living room. The logs were burning brightly in the fireplace, throwing a soft, dancing glow upon a room that was darkening with dusk. To you, Marie. And to you, dear. As Stevens placed his glass down, he noticed the manuscript of my book. It was there on the table, right where he placed it when he first came in. Deliberately, he turned from it. And then turned back. The manuscript had been moved. Only an inch or so, but it had been moved. Keeping his back to his wife, he thrummed through that early chapter and discovered, just as he knew he would, that the photograph was gone. For a long moment, he thought of what to do. Then slowly, he turned around. This book by Cross I brought home. Yes? Uh, there was a story of a poisoner in it. It's rather funny. Her name happens to be the same as yours. Oh, your maiden name, that is. Oh, that is odd, isn't it? <laughs> Darling. Well, she a relative of yours? Why, Ted, you're serious. In a way, yes. Oh, I don't mean it really important. It's just that, well, when you run across a person who's a dead ringer for your own life and who lived 300 years ago and was a top flight poisoner, well, you like to hear about it, that's all. What on earth are you talking about? Darling, be honest with me. Didn't you look at this manuscript when I was out of the room? No. You didn't take out a picture of a poisoner named Marie de Bay? I most certainly did not. Oh, kid, what is this all about? What are you getting at? Well, just this. Somebody took that picture out of that manuscript since I've been home. Now, who's that? Well, I'll take a look. Wait, I don't feel like... Why, it's Mark Sitar. Mark? Ted, wait a second. Yes? Ted, whatever it is he wants, promise you won't do it. Promise I won't do I it? I mean, promise you won't get yourself involved. Please, Ted, don't go out tonight. Say, what in the world is... Well, anyway, we can't let him stay outside. Mark, how are you? Come on in. Thanks, sir. Thinking about giving you a call later. Oh, let me have your hat. Oh, thanks. I, Marie, I, I hope you'll excuse me for popping in like this, but, well, I wanted to talk to Ted. It, it's rather important. Oh, I don't mind at all. Come on, Mark. We'll step into the library. Oh, you mind, dear? Of course not, Ted. I'll be making sandwiches for us. Oh, grab that chair in the corner, Mark. Well, let's hear it. What's the trouble? Ted, my Uncle Miles was murdered. Murdered? Oh, the talk hasn't reached you yet, but it's already started. It's nothing definite, of course, just that there was... Something wrong about Uncle Miles' death. But I don't... Mark, are you sure of this? You know he was murdered? I don't know. Of course I don't. I just don't see how it could be any other way. Uncle Miles, you know, had been sick for quite a while. But last Saturday, he seemed so much better that Miss Corbett, uh, that was his nurse, decided to take the day off. And, oh, well, you know all this. You and Marie were over that afternoon. Anyway, Lucy and I went to the club that night, to that masquerade party, and we left the old boy completely alone. I've cursed myself a thousand times since. But what about your housekeeper, Mrs., uh, what's her name? Uh, Henderson. Wasn't she around? Oh, sure. In that little house out in back. We told her to look in now and then, but, well, that wasn't good enough. It was after midnight when Lucy and I got back. Uncle Miles was dying. Ted, it looked exactly like one of his regular attacks. But then later, after he was gone, I happened to glance under the chest of drawers in his room. There was a small silver cup under there almost drained, and Uncle Miles' cat. The cat was still warm, but quite dead. Oh. I managed to get the cat out of the house and buried without anyone seeing me. Next day, I had the contents of the cup analyzed. It was poison? Yes. Arsenic. Well, what do you want me to do? Help me open the crypt. What? I want to have a private autopsy performed. Help me get Uncle Miles' body out of that vault. Oh, I know it's a tough job. The thing is sealed solid, but we can do it. You mean without the police knowing about it? Without anybody knowing about it. Mrs. Henderson's visiting her sister, and I managed to send Lucy over to the club. You must be crazy. You're playing with dynamite, Mark. 
This is something you've got to tell the police now. I can't take that chance. But they'll have to know sometime. You're only I've got to know first, I tell you. You don't understand, Ted. There was somebody in Uncle Miles' room that night, handing him something in a silver cup. Mrs. Henderson was on the porch by the window. She saw her. She saw her? Ted. She thinks it was my wife. Oh, Lucy. It doesn't mean anything to Mrs. Henderson yet, because she doesn't suspect anything. But, well, Ted, you've got to see why I've got to be sure. Why I've got to know how Uncle Miles died. Because it wasn't Lucy, Ted. I know it wasn't. Of course not, Mark. She had an alibi. Well, she was with you at the club, wasn't she? Yes. Except for half an hour. I see. You will help me, won't you, Ted? When do we start? As soon as you can make it. Okay. Come on now. I'll get your hat. You turn on a hat now. Come over as soon as I can see Marie. You're not going to tell her about this. Of course not. I'll think of something. Don't you worry about it. No, thanks, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, Marie? I'm coming. Uh, darling, uh, Mark asked me to... Uh... I know, Ted. Here. You better take your sandwiches with you. You'll be hungry. Oh, but you knew I was going off? Yes, I knew. You listened to her? I couldn't help it, Ted. I had an idea what Mark's visit was about. To talk about his uncle's death. There's a lot of talk about it in the village. That's why I tried to tell you why I didn't want you to get mixed up in it. But it's too late now, isn't it? I mean, you're going. I can tell by the way you look. Ted, wait a second. There's just one thing I want to tell you before you leave. And that is that no matter what happens, no matter what you find or think or believe, I love you. You remember that, won't you? I remember you said so, Marie. By the light of a dim kerosene lantern, Mark and Ted Stevens pounded their way through the thick shelf of rock that covered the Depar's ancestral tomb. Pried open the great slab of stone which lay across the subterranean door, and then at last descended to the dank, ink-black chamber. They found the coffin. They dragged it from its crypt and placed it on the cold stone floor. They unclamped the lid and opened it. Mark. It's empty. What? That's impossible. It can't be. But it is, Mark. You know what that means? That body wasn't in this coffin when it was placed here. I'll swear it was, Ted. From the time that coffin was closed on Uncle Miles, somebody, the undertaker or Lucy or me, somebody was with it until it was buried. And the crypt was sealed right after. Then somebody beat us to it. Somebody's broken in here ahead of us. Broken in? Listen, Ted. Lucy and I have hardly left the house since the funeral. Do you think anybody could break in here? Smash through that stone and cement without our seeing them? Or without our hearing them? Well, well. Well, you might as well come on up and... But who is that? Me, Mr. Depard. Up here. My name's Captain Brennan. I'm from the office of the Commissioner of Police. From the... I'd like to talk to you if you don't mind, Mr. Depard. Here, uh, follow my flashlight up. But I don't understand. How did you... How did you know about this? By listening, Bingley. Do you mind if we go up to your house, Mr. Depard? Why, no. Not at all. Oh, thank you. Oh, Freddie. Uh, look here, uh, Captain. Uh, uh, Freddie, this is Mr. Depard. That sounds great. How do you I do? know you, Mr. Depard. And Mr. Uh, Ted Stevens, is it? Well, how did you... How did you know my name? Very simple. I got the names of everybody who was here at the Depard the day the old man died. You and your wife were included. Oh, here we are. But I don't... Uh, uh, Captain, who gave you those names? Why, your housekeeper, of course. Mrs. Henderson? You didn't think Mrs. Henderson saw the dead cat, did you, Mr. Depard? But she did. She also saw you bury it. And uh, we've been interested in the case ever since. Well, nice place you have here, Mr. Depard. Now, let's see. According to Mrs. Henderson, your wife was wearing some kind of a masquerade costume that night. What kind of a thing was it? Well, it was... A... Oh, there, you can see it. It was copied from the dress in that old painting over there. Oh, yes. Oh, funny. Uh, where's the woman's face? It's always been that way. Long as I can remember. Somebody must have thrown acid on it or something. <laughs> Can't blame them much. She was a poisoner. A poisoner? Yes. The story goes that one of my ancestors was responsible for her execution. Marie Dobre, her name was. Oh, yes. I've read about it. Learned all the poison tricks from one of our lovers, guy by the name of Godass de Croix. Godass de... Oh, yes, Mr. Stevens. We cops read now and then. Did, did you say Godass de Croix? That's French. We call it cross. <laughs> Absolutely no limit to a cop's education, is there? <laughs> but to uh, get back to your wife, Mr. Depard, she was just like the famous Marie. Now, when Mrs. Henderson looks through that window... Just a minute, Captain. 
Mrs. Henderson can't prove she saw a thing, and you know it. Now, what do you mean? I mean you haven't any right to insinuate that my wife was in that room. Well, who's insinuating? I, I'm trying to say that Mrs. Henderson, after thinking it over, realized that she was kicked by the costume. The woman she saw in the funny clothes, handing a cup of poison to your uncle, wasn't your wife at all. What? Because your wife is an unusually tall young woman. And the one Mrs. Henderson saw was fully half a head shorter. More on the order, let's say, of... Uh, Mr. Stevens' wife. My wife? Captain, Why, this is absolutely ridiculous. Well, I don't know. It's... All right, what's the matter, Mr. Stevens? You're sounding like a leaf. Uh, tell me now, uh, just for fun, where was Mrs. Stevens that night? She was home with me. The whole evening? Certainly. You retired early? Yes, we both did. You, I suppose, were sound asleep by midnight. Yes, I was. Then how do you know where your wife was? Well, uh, Look here, Stevens. She had to have a costume that would match Mrs. Big Paz. How did she manage that? Where did she get it? Well, she, she never had one. She never had a dress like that. And what about our motive? Why did she poison it? I don't know. Well, so many suddenly, then what was it? Hate? Did she hate my husband? Yes, yes, she did. No. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, I tell you. Brown. Yes, Betty. I phoned and got hold of Mrs. Depard, the nurse, all right. That Mrs. Stevens couldn't reach her. The phone won't answer. Okay, I don't think so. I'm going home. David, come back here. I'm going to get my wife. My name is Cross. Go down, Cross. Cross? Where's my wife? What have you done to her? <laughs> you fiend, what have you done to my wife? You are nothing at all, young man. Here, here, here. Sit down. You're lying. Something's happened to her. The police just phoned. There wasn't an answer. Why are you here? Why am I here? Well, because your wife, reading my chapter on the Dubrays, realized I knew more about the family than even she did. Because she found my phone number on the front cover of the manuscript. And because I know an exceptional case when I hear one. Does that answer your question? No, you know it doesn't. Can't you see I've got to... I've got to know whether... Yeah, I see. Whether your wife is that Marie Dobre, who was burnt. Burnt by order of the High Tribunal for all poison cases. The burning court of France. Witchcraft. Black magic. The world across the threshold. You're quite sure, no doubt, also, that I'm Godin St. Croix, who first wooed her. No, no, my boy. <laughs> no, my real name happens to be, of all things, Tom Simpson. Most unsuitable for a distinguished writing career... And Marie Dobre is no more your wife's real name than mine is, Gordon Cross. What? Your esteemed wife was an adopted child, Mr. Stevens, adopted by people in Canada named Dobre, remote members of the real family of poisoners. I can't believe it. Oh, why? Why didn't she tell me? You, why? Because until I told her half an hour ago, she didn't know it herself. You see, in the course of my research on the family, I found out about it. And in the course of talking with your wife, I found out something else. How for years she was haunted by the fear that she might be a poisoner by inheritance, by blood. And you can see, can't you, why she never talked about it or yes, her past yes. to you? Yes, yes. And yet, Mr. Stevens, you had all but made her forget that past. You. And that's why she was willing to lie, to steal a picture, do anything, in order to hold you to her. Yes, yes, I, I see that now. You know, young man, I, I rather think she loves you. But as you will see, though, I, she comes only when I call her. Uh, Mrs. Stevens? You mean she's... Yes, Mrs. Cross. Marie, it's you. You're all right. Oh, yes, you're both all right now, and nothing can change it ever. Marie, listen. You want to say me, dear? Say Maggie. Maggie? Oh, well, that's my name, my real name. Maggie McTavish. And it's a lovely name, dear. The most beautiful, gorgeous... Darling, ever. darling, please. You don't understand. The police, they think you had something to do with my old death. They think I did. So... Now, Mr. Stevens, before we go back to the Debars, don't you think you'd better tell me everything that's been said and done up to date? Having just saved your wife's soul from the burning court, now I'll rest her body from the electric chair. <laughs> yes, Mr. Depar, truly excellent sherry. Don't you think so, Miss Corbett? Yes. It is very nice. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I happen to be here. So let us consider first that supernatural hocus-pocus in the crypt. That body that walked out of the sealed tomb. That body that never was in the tomb. Never was in the tomb? No, Mr. Depart. The murderer knew that very soon Mrs. Henderson's story would bring about an investigation. 
He had to get rid of the well-known corpus delicti. Yes, but who could have kept the body out of the tomb? Who, Mr. Dupin? Why, you, sir. What? What? No, what? <laughs> I, I don't understand. Well, it's very simple. You had the opportunity. I believe you said yourself you were alone with the body before the burial. And you had the strength. I dare say you carried it down to the furnace. Where it's now probably nothing but ashes. Ridiculous. Why would he spend an hour smashing into a crypt for a body he knew wasn't there? Why, Captain? Hmm. To impress Mr. Stevens, his witness. And also, apparently, you. Oh, that's perfectly fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, no, Lucy. Just comic. And I suppose, Mr. Croft, that I also put on a woman's masquerade costume, went into my uncle's room and handed him a nice cup of arsenic. No, no, no. That had to be done by a woman. Your accomplice, as a matter of fact. Oh, now, come, come, come. You mustn't all look at Mrs. Depard, because Mark Depard's one noble act was his frantic effort to prevent his wife from being charged with the crime. A crime which he and nurse Myra Corbett committed. Myra Corbett? Why you? Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Stevens. This quiet little lady beside but, me. Well, why would I do such a thing? Money, Miss Corbett. A cutout of Mark Depard's inheritance. Payments for services rendered. That's an absolute lie, Croft. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Captain Brennan never bothered to check Miss Corbett's whereabouts on the night of the murder. Why even think of the nurse? She was the custodian of the old man's health. Oh, you're crazy, you're crazy. And yet who but a nurse could so naturally offer the old man a cup? A cup he was sure contained medicine. You're making it up. Oh, and who but Miss Corbett, living right here in this house, would know what kind of masquerade dress she must copy, would know when Mrs. Henderson would pass the window that night, pass and see her, and accept her, she hoped, for Lucy Depart. No, that's not true. Oh, yes, Miss Corbett, yes, Miss Corbett, that dress was the touch that wrecked you. That was your own idea, wasn't it, not Mark? You weren't content with a mere murderer's share of the profit. You wanted a white share, half of the whole estate. You wanted Lucy Depart convicted and out of the way for good. <laughs> Mm. Well, I give you a toast, Miss Corbett, with Mr. Depard's excellent sherry, to a particularly ruthless poisoner. And yet, you know, on the whole, I'm rather partial to female poisoners. Why, only tonight I... I... <coughs> Mr. Cook, what's the matter, Bernard? This man's dead. Oh, and from cyanide, if I know anything. Cyanide from that glass of sherry. Cyanide that a nurse could get quite easily. That glass was right beside you, Miss Corbett, and nobody else was near it. Too bad he didn't drink it as soon as you hoped. A second ago, we had nobody to use against you. But we have now, Miss Corbett. We have now. And I arrest you for the murder of Gordon Cross. <laughs> Months ago, that the prominent author was murdered. And tonight, Myra Corbett pays with her life for that crime. The former nurse, at first, protested her innocence. Yes, I'm in here, dear. Oh, I thought you might. What did you cut it off for? Huh? What do you mean? The radio. Oh. Oh, yeah, well, I thought you wanted to talk. Oh, Ted, don't you think I know you better than that? What was on the radio? Well, there wasn't any. Okay. It was about Myra Corbett. The ghost of the chair tonight. Oh. I didn't think you wanted to be reminded. I don't, really. But making such an effort to hide it only keeps it alive, doesn't it? Oh, all right, darling. You know what I came in to ask? If you wanted a cocktail before dinner? The largest one you've got. Fine, I'll get out the ice cube. I know. If I'll fix up the fire. Okay, Maria. A deal. Uh, where are some papers to start it? <laughs> right there by the bookcase. And the name's not mine. It's Maggie. Because, darling, Marie's dead and gone forever. Never did. Neither of us. It was your hand that touched that glass. I know that now. And I could return the favor. But instead, I shall ask that you dispatch your husband. This one, like all the others, now. Just a little bit of poison in the drink, Marie. Any kind of a drink. What kind, Ted? Hmm? What kind of a cocktail shall we have? Oh, huh. <laughs> any kind, darling. Any kind at all. Your 
You've just heard The Burning Court from John Dixon Carr's famous novel, the first in Columbia's new series of outstanding classics and chills by world-famous authors. Tonight's play, ladies and gentlemen, has one rather special significance we think you'd like to know about. As you perhaps have heard, every fine comedian is said to cherish a secret desire to do an abrupt about face. He pines for the part of a blackguard. Well, tonight you witness the fulfillment of one such desire. The role of that literary and quite infamous diehard Gordon Cross was portrayed by none other than Hollywood's expert provoker of laughs, Charlie Ruggles, given the York for the world premiere of his latest screen success, Friendly Enemies. The role of Marie, well, that was enacted by a young lady who long ago won national acclaim as one of Broadway's most accomplished dramatic actresses, Miss Julie Hayden. Thank you, Charlie Ruggles and Miss Julie Hayden, for your splendid performances. The play tonight, as all plays in this series, was produced and directed by Charles Vander, written by Harold Metford and scored by Bernard Herman. Next week, we bring you an intensely exciting and moving drama, The Life of Nellie Jane. This is, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense, a new series of programs with one strict purpose in view, your entertainment. Each week at this time, CBS sets aside 30 minutes to excite you, to mystify you, and on occasion to horrify you with a catalog of the world's great thrillers. Dramas from the stage and screen, from fiction and radio. Dramas that bring you... Suspense. This, the second offering of a new series, is a unique one. Certainly, it is one of the very few pieces of suspense literature that somehow manages to tickle your funny bone while busily engaged in tingling your spine. Make no mistake, though, nobody's kidding. CBS presents its adaptation of John Collier's well-known short story, Wet Saturday. Yes, it's a wet Saturday. Never try to rain harder. I'm Princey, Frederick Princey, just an ordinary family man. I have a son, a daughter, and a wife. I might be out golfing now if it hadn't been for the rain. I'm Mrs. Princey. I plan to drive over to the nurseries this afternoon for some arbiters. The borders, you know. But... Oh, the whole lot of them make me sick. Yes, I'm George. on the air. <laughs> I had a date to go punting. Punting. Couldn't find the blasted punting as well, so... I'm home, too. I... I'm Millicent. I was going to play croquet. That's how I happened to have the mallet. Yes, that's the Princey family. We find them at home. Mrs. Princey, Millicent, George sprawled on a couch, Mr. Princey biting on a dry pipe. Their living room is dull and overstuffed. Rain beats at the windows. They are any middle-class family at home on a wet day, except for one small item. As you sit with them in the living room, you can see through the door to the front porch a pair of men's feet encased in black boots. They look like the feet of a curate. There's a tenseness in the room. The air is charged with excitement, but the feet are very still. Don't keep staring at them. Listen to me, all of you. Don't you see? They'd hang her. That's what they do. They'd hang her. Oh, Fred, it's too awful. It's awful? Catastrophic. I suppose it is sweet, gentle, intelligent girl, respected, loved by the whole village doing a thing like this. Think of the publicity that is disgrace. You think I'm going to resign from the bench the best day? Sell out and live in some foggy hotel abroad? Oh, no, no. No, no, I kill myself. I will. I will. Don't be a fool. Any more than you have been, the governor being. Be quiet. Wouldn't be so bad if it were you. Everybody in the village knows you are not responsible. George. Yes? Get off that couch. Sit up on your spine. Oh. You might be of a little use here if you could think. Listen, Governor, this isn't my funeral. Oh, shut up. 
As long as I can remember, George, there's been a trial and a tribulation to me. Oh, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. You've got to stand it, my dear. And keep that hysterical note out of your voice. You hear? Yes. We are... <clears throat> we are talking about the weather. Now, George. Yeah? George. If he fell down the old well, say, uh, striking his head several times, what about it, eh? I really don't know, Governor. What about it? Don't be an ass. I'm asking you to think. You'd have had to hit the side several times in 30 or 40 feet and, and at all the correct angles. Now, now, no, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. We'll have to go over it all again, Oh, no, Father. No, no. I couldn't. I couldn't. Millicent, we must go over it all again. Oh, Fred, you're torturing her. Oh, face facts, Mater. With him lying there, there's no use pretending it's a picnic. <laughs> they might hang you, Millicent. Oh, stop that shaking. Stop it here. You must stop it. Keep your voice quiet. Millicent, we are talking... Of the weather. Now, we will proceed. I can't. I can't. Oh, should have thought of those boots, Millie. <laughs> I'm not moving them. Well, sit up, George. Stop shuffling your feet. Now, Millicent, look at me. Answer me truthfully, you hear? Answer me. You were in the croquet court. Yes. Who knew you were in love with this wretched curate? <laughs> Who? The whole village. <laughs> They've been sniggering about it at the pub for three years past. <sighs> Millicent, we continue. You were on the croquet court. Yes. You were putting the croquet set into its box. Yes. It, it was starting to rain. I was carrying the balls and mallets into the sun porch. The box was there. You heard someone enter the garden gate and come across the yard? Yes. Could you see who it was? Oh, not at first. I was going into the sun porch. I threw down all the mallets but the red one and turned around. It was with us? Yes. So you called him? Yes. Loudly? Did you call him loudly? Could anyone have heard? No, Father, I'm sure not. I didn't really call him. I... I just spoke his name. He saw me as I went to the door. He just waved his hand and came over. How can I find out from you whether there was anyone about? Whether he could have been seen? I'm sure not, Father. I'm, I'm quite sure. So, you both went into the sun porch? Yes. It was raining hard then. What did he say? He said, hello, Millie. And excuse us coming in the back way, but he set out to walk over to Liston. Yes. And he said, passing the park, he came to house, suddenly thought of me. And he thought he'd just look in for a moment. He, he had something to tell me. Go on. He said he was so happy, he wanted me to share it. He'd heard from the bishop he was to have a vicarage. And it wasn't only that. It meant he could marry then he began to stop and get all confused. And of course, I thought he meant me. Don't tell me what you thought. Tell me exactly what he said, nothing else. Well, well... Oh, oh stop crying. A luxury you can no longer afford. Tell me what happened. He said, no. So. He said it, it wasn't me. Really. It's Ella Bragdon David. And, and he was sorry, and, and all that. Then he went to go. And then? I went back. He turned his back. I had the red man to the croquet set in my hand. I forgot to drop it in the box that he played. I... Did you shout or scream? I mean, as you hit him? No. no. I'm sure I didn't. Did he? Come on, speak up. No, Father. And then? I threw it down. I came straight in here. I went to look for Mother. Oh, poor baby. No. No, I'm 
see the child but I'm afraid. Not such a child, Mater. Oh, Millie, I had no idea Keep you had... quiet. I'm thinking. Hmm. You see, George, he probably told people he was going to Liston. Certainly no one knows he came here, for he, he didn't decide until he crossed the park. He might have been attacked in the woods. We must consider every detail. A curate with his head battered in. Don't, Father. Don't. A curate with his head battered in. Now, who would want to kill with us? Oh, kill with us? Well, I would with Zetta. How do you do, Mrs. Princey? Captain, Captain Smith. Oh, sit down, pray. It mustn't get up for me, Mrs. Princey. You either, Mrs. My word. Just being neighborly on a bad day. I wanted to ask you about those daily bulbs, Prince. He took a shortcut on account of the rain and walked right in. Knew you wouldn't mind. Oh, he heard you, Father. <laughs> My dear, we, we could all have our little jokes. <laughs> Don't pretend to be shocked. There's a little bit of this way, There's a this chair facing the fireplace. Sit down, Mother. Well, it's just uh, straightening the curtains to the sun porch, dear. It looks so gloomy out there. Might as well shut the rain oh, out. Just talking about a little theoretical cure killing, Smollett. <laughs> you know, young people these days, night thrillers, parts on his eyes, justifiable parts on his eyes. Have you heard about Ella Bragdon, Davis? I shall be most properly laughed at. Why? Why should you be laughed at, Smollett? No, and a shot in that direction myself. <laughs> the aunt said yes, too. Haven't you heard? She told most people. Now it'll look as if I got turned down for a white rat in a dog collar. Oh, too bad. Oh, fortune of war. Yeah, fortune of war. Odd how it happens, isn't it? <laughs> Sit down, Smollett. Millicent, console Captain Smollett with your, your best light conversation. You too, Mother. George and I have something to look at outside. This is rain, you know, but it is bad, very bad. Uh, come, George. All right, old governor. Maybe we'll need raincoats. What? Oh, I don't think so. Uh, just make yourself at home, Smollett. Make yourself at home. A cigarette, Captain Smollett? Thank you. Thank you. A nasty day to be going out. Something about the old well. Just off the sun porch door, you know. This terrible sodden weather seems to have loosened some of the stones. Oh, too bad. Dash too bad. Spoils the tennis and croquet, I mean, a day like this. Doesn't it, Millie? Doesn't it, Millie? Oh, yes, it does. She was practicing out on the croquet court earlier, but, uh, oh, do pull your chair nearer the fire, Captain. It was so damp, we thought it would be cozy to light it. Thank you, I'm quite comfortable. I, uh, I hope you don't feel too bad about her, David. Can't always win. Can't say, though, what you women see in these bloodless clerics. Oh, I always thought Mr. Woodward was, uh, he is a very charming man. Quite agree, but why should anyone want to marry him? You wouldn't want to marry him, would you, Millie? Not now. That is up. Are you? Oh. Oh, no. Oh, God. Molly. <laughs> yes. Yes, Princey. Good Lord, man, you, you come in on a fellow suddenly. <laughs> yes, I did. Oh, oh, don't mind this old double barrel shotgun. Been working on it. Molly, may I have your attention for a minute? There's something on the sun porch I'd like to show you. Why, yes. Yes, of course. Smollett, George and I went out to see if we could shoot some rats which have been driven out of the old well by the high water. Afraid they might get into the house. Now, you must listen to me very carefully. Very carefully, or you will be shot by accident. Princey, what got into you? You heard me ask as you came in, who would kill with us? You also heard Millicent make a comment, an unguarded comment. Well, what of it? Very little. Unless you were to hear that Withers had met a violent end this very afternoon. And that, my dear Smollett, is what you are going to hear. What? Withers? Yes. <laughs> Who killed him? Millicent. Good Lord. Yes, a mess. And, of course, you would have remembered and guessed. Maybe, yes. Yes, I, yes, I, I suppose I should. Therefore, you constitute a problem. Why did she kill him? Oh, it's one of those disgusting things. Pitiable, too. She deluded herself that he was in love with her. Good heavens, Millie. Oh, yes, of course, I... I see. 
He had told her about the Davis girl. I understand. Now, I have no wish, as you will comprehend, that she should be proved either a lunatic or a murderer. I could hardly go on living here after that. I suppose not. On the other hand, you know about it. Yes, I see that makes me your problem. <laughs> You're wondering if I could keep my mouth shut. If I promise. I am wondering if I could believe you. But if I promise. If things went smoothly, yes. But not if there was any sort of suspicion, any questioning. You would be afraid of being an accessory. Why, I don't know. I do. What are we going to do? I can't see anything else. You, you'd never be fool enough to do me in. You, you can't get rid of two corpses. Oh, I regard it as a better risk than the other. It could be an accident. Or you and Wither could both disappear. There are possibilities in that. Listen, you, you can't. I can, but there may be a way out. There is. Smollett, you gave it to me yourself. I... I did what? You said you would kill with us. You have a motive. Oh, here, I, I was joking. Of course you saw that. You are always joking. Listen, Smollett, I can't trust you. You must trust me. Else I will kill you now in the next minute. I mean that. You can choose between dying and living. Go on. Now, there's the old well just outside the sun porch door. That's where I'm going to put with us. No one outside knows he has come up here this afternoon. No one will ever look there for him unless you tell them. You must give me evidence that you have murdered with us. I murdered him? Why do you want that? So that I shall be dead sure that you will never open your lips on the subject. I see. What evidence? George, hit him in the face. Sure. <laughs> I'm out of it. Oh, Captain, you should be more careful. Look what your teeth did to my knuckles. Again, George. Okay. <laughs> keep quiet. You women keep out of it. I'm sorry, Smollett, but there must be traces of a struggle between you and Withers. Then it will not be altogether safe for you to go to the police. <laughs> Can't you take my word, man? I will when we are finished. George, yes? get the cokey, Mary. Right, Governor. Take your handkerchief to it. In there, on the sun porch floor. Yes. Yes, I got it, Governor. There, Captain. There's the weapon. As I told you, Smollett. Now, you'll just grasp the end that mashed with a head. I shall shoot you if you don't. But good Lord, you can't. All right. There. There. Now deposit it out by the side of the house, out of the rain, of course. No, wait, George. Uh? First, you'd better pull a few hairs out of his head and put them under the nails of Wither's right uh, hand. Prince, have you gone mad? Do you know what you're doing? With this gun? Yes. Go ahead, George. <laughs> Sorry to mess your hair up, Captain. Uh, uh, oh, shut up, Smollett. Uh, there. That's all we need. Now for Wither's, we'll fix it right up. Be right with you, Governor. Mallet, you may turn around. Widows is just there in the sun porch. Draw back the curtain. Good Lord, Princess. Yes, messy. But we'll get him fixed up. Now you, Mallet, you've just got to drag him through the door and dump him in the old well. <laughs> just beyond the door, Captain. I won't touch him. I won't try. All right. Stand aside. Out of range, George. Right. Only one place I want this bullet to go. Oh, Keep quiet. My aim's done too good. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'll... Yes. Better, Marley. Much better. Go on now. In here. You'll have to take him outside. By the shoulders ought to do it, Captain. Keep quiet, George. Go on, Marley. Go on. You've seen dead men before. Crack him. Crack him. I'll just hold the gun here to make sure that everything goes on. Oh, Lord, come away from the dim window, dear. Don't look. But Captain Smollett, his father's a very resourceful man, Miss Wood. I'm sure what he's doing is right. But the Captain, I can't, I can't stand with him. I mustn't question your dear father. I say, are you two still at it? There's enough trouble around here without blubbering. I'm not blubbering, George. Oh, you see, Everything is perfect. They never looked in our way. You see how crazy it is? I guess.
Yes, it is. Oh, good heavens, man. You're, you're dripping wet. Why, why didn't you slip your raincoat on? <laughs> Tea ready, my dear? In just a minute, dear. I'll ring for Bridget. Exactly what you need, Smollett. Cup of tea. Best thing in the world to ward off a cold. And I want you. Oh, don't mind getting the chair wet. Cigarette? Help yourself. I stick to my pipe, you know. Funny Please, how... Princess, everything's hot, ma'am. Oh, Bridget, yes. Put the tray in front of me here, on the table. Yes, ma'am. That's it. I say, Captain, you've gone and cut your lip. I just knocked it. Oh, how dreadful. Here, Bridget. Yes, Mr. Yes. Captain, this cup. No, no, thank you. I, I, I rather think I'll be running along now, if you don't mind. Oh, Captain Smollett, without any tea. If you don't mind, Mrs. Princess, if I could just have my raincoat. Oh, I'll get it for you, Captain. Oh, this is very distressing, Smollett, very. Oh, I, I'll be all right presently, I'm sure. Here we are, now. Let me help you. Oh, thank you, Thank you, young man. Yes. I'd better go out the front way, Smollett. The walk is dry. Oh, let me hold the door for you, Captain. <laughs> don't worry, old fellow. Don't worry at all. Oh, no, no. I... Nothing serious, I imagine. It'll rest and you'll be as right as rain. By the way, Millicent, you're not looking any too well. No, yeah. not well at all. I'm sure it was that croaky cough. Being outdoors in weather like this is simply foolhardy. The maid is right, Millie. You saw what happened to Captain Smollett. Oh, come along, dear. I shall give you a hot foot bath and put you to bed. And a couple of days in bed, and you'll be fine again. Get plenty of rest, Millicent, and don't worry about a thing. That's the best you are. <sighs> well, get out of a little rest, too, Governor. It's a fine afternoon for a nap. Indeed it is, son. Well, enjoy yourself. I'll see you later. I'll see you all later. Oh, would you get me to police station, please? rather bad for, well, for, for a close friend of ours, unfortunately. We saw him do it. I, I think you'd better send someone over right away. Our man should be there right about now, Mr. Pitney. I, I beg your pardon? I say, our man should be there now. Constable Martin has his post right below your house there. Just rang in. Seems Captain Smollett was with him. Uh, Captain Smollett? They reported some rather queer going down at your place. No, 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 I, I won't, Sergeant. Thank you. Governor! Governor, where are you? Come on. I'm right here. Stop shouting. Oh, we, we have some visitors, Governor. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I, I can see that. Well, Constable, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Trinity. And Smollett, I, I see what a, what a remarkable fellow you are, coming back like this. <laughs> here to reenact the crime? Only the one against me, Princey. The one against the curate. I'll leave to you people. <laughs> Extraordinary sense of humor. Mr. Princey, I just had a look at what's in your well. Not a pretty sight, that. Not pretty at all. Yes, Captain Smollett was thorough, if nothing else. You saw him when he did it, sir, out in the back? No, quite. We were just returning from a walk. Smollett evidently had been laying for the curate, hiding out in those bushes by the road, I imagine. He was never inside this house. Never. And uh, you say, Captain? I say that while I was inside this house, a guest of the family, I was coerced into dragging the curate's body outside and dumping it in the well. Well, there we are. Uh, not entirely, Constable. Uh, I'll just remove my raincoat. There. Uh, and demonstrate how damp I got my clothes when I went outside without it. No. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, quite. <laughs> He undoubtedly removed his coat at some point between here and your post. I might as well tell you that his weapon, a red crookie mallet, is out by the side of the house. I shouldn't be at all surprised, but that you'll find his fingerprints all over it. All over the end of the mallet, Constable. The end that mashed withers his head. And not the end I'd have had to grasp in order to do the mashing. Governor, <laughs> that's a decent try, Smollett. <laughs> but it won't work. There must be other evidences, Constable. 
You'll undoubtedly find them when you examine the body. Oh, he means my hair under Withers' his nails. Well, sir, if you look carefully, I believe you'll find a few of my precious hairs under his son's nails, too. Here, what are you trying to... Constable, this is an utter waste of time. So far as the violent struggle between Smollett and Withers is concerned, Smollett's faith speaks for itself. Quite eloquently, I believe. Oh, but no more eloquently than your son's knuckles. As you see, Constable, a fresh abrasion. He did that on my teeth. Or did he? What? I say, or did he? He might have done that on Withers' teeth. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. I see what you mean, but, but, but I didn't. Governor, he said, I'll keep still, you nitwit. Let me think. Let me think. As a matter of fact, George, the more I think of it, the more I'm convinced it was your voice I heard. Quite a vigorous quarrel. Something about the curate jilting your sister. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Smollett. Very well, Princey. If your son didn't do it, who did? That's what I'd like to know. How about it, Mr. Princey? Well, that... That is a sticker, all right. <laughs> George, my boy, it looks like you're elected. Elected? What do you mean? I didn't do it. Why, I had Keep nothing to do Keep your mouth shut, will you? I won't. I'm not going to take the blame for her. Millie did it. She did it with that mallet, I saw. You could prove that? Prove it? I... I... Yes, her, her fingerprints on the mallet, the handle. Why, George, don't you remember when you made me touch the mallet? Oh, huh? you picked it up with your handkerchief. No, I... George, I'm sure you wiped that handle clean. Oh, well, I could hardly expect you to remember that. If you, you can't even remember killing the curate. Governor, I... I told you to keep still. Oh, Governor, you, you, you're not going to turn me over. You, as you... long as I can remember, George, you've been a trial and a tribulation to me. Governor, I... You shouldn't have done it, son. You really shouldn't. No, George, that was definitely wrong. <laughs> I say, Princey, I think I'll have that cup of tea after all. Nothing like it in weather like this. Wet Saturday, from the short story by John Collier. You have just heard the second in Columbia's new series, a series designed to bring you the best in thrill entertainment. Outstanding dramas from the field of fiction and radio, stage and screen. Dramas of pure... Suspense. This Columbia feature is produced and directed by Charles Vanda, with script by Harold Bedford and score by Bernard Herman. Be with us again next week at this same time when we present Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name is Mary Ann Spitz, and I'm 14 years old. My mother had a defense job, so I do the marketing for our family. Every morning, Mother says to me, Mary Ann, be sure you buy the most for the least money. So lately, I've been buying all the Victory Food Specials. These are marked with a red, white, and blue basket sign with a big red V. The reason I always look for this sign is, well, you have heard the old saying, an army travels on its stomach... I know Uncle Sam needs lots of food to feed our fighting men. An army that, that's going places has to have good things to eat. Now, steak fried rare with French, with French fried potatoes is my favorite meal. But I'd rather have a soldier eat this dinner than eat it myself, if it will get this war over sooner. So, if you have friends or relatives in the armed forces, think twice before you buy the food they need. Look for the victory specials and help win the war faster. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Columbia's play theater of outstanding thrillers, produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from fiction and stage and screen, from the world's great literature of entertaining excitement, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense.
Tonight's adventure in suspense is from the pen of Dorothy Sayers. She called it the Cave of Alibaba. Like the tale told by Scheherazade, a distinguished ancestress in the storytelling art, Miss Sayers' thriller deals with 40 thieves and with two magic words. For your uneasy listening, then, suspense presents... The Cave of Alibaba. On a Saturday afternoon in January, in a grim and narrow house in Lambeth, a man sat eating kippers and reading the daily paper. He was smallish and spare, with brown hair rather too regularly waved and a strong, brown, pointed beard. His double-breasted navy blue suit, his socks, tie, and handkerchief were all scrupulously matched, and his brown boots just a trifle too highly polished. He did not look a gentleman, not even a gentleman's gentleman, yet there was something about his appearance which suggested that he was accustomed to the manner of life in good families. A superior butler, perhaps, yet not old enough to be retired. A footman who had come into a legacy, yes. He had just finished eating, and he was sipping his coffee when a slight noise at the front door caught his ear. Swiftly, too swiftly for a quiet little man sitting, eating kippers and reading his paper on a Saturday afternoon, he sprang up, he dashed through the small hallway, and he flung the door open. Of course, no one in sight. The society is at least dramatic in its delivery of its correspondence. And as if he knew what he would find, he shut the door and turned to the hat stand in the hall. An envelope had been placed there. It was addressed to Joseph Rogers. So Mr. Rogers opened the note. Number 21. An extraordinary general meeting will be held tonight at the house of number one at 11.30. You, you will be absent at your peril. The word is finality. Hmm. Finality. Yes, I think so. The man called Joseph Rogers stood for a moment studying the note... Then he strode to the rear of the house to a tall safe built in the wall. Carefully, he manipulated a dial. He swung the safe door open. He stepped inside into a small strong room. He opened a drawer marked correspondence, placed the note inside, and then came out again. A moment to reset the lock for a new combination, and then he went back into the living room. He reached for the telephone. He lifted it from the cradle and then reconsidered. Too dangerous. He hurried upstairs and clambered into an attic. In the furthest corner, he searched for and found a knothole in the woodwork. He pressed it. A concealed trapdoor swung open, and he was on the loft of the adjoining house. He paused before three cages, in each of them a carrier pigeon. Carefully, he wrote a note, slipped it under a pigeon's wing. There you are, my pretty. There, take it easy now. There you go. Fly straight. 4.30. I'll send another pigeon at 5 and the third at 6. I should have my answer by 9.30 at the latest. Oh, I forgot one thing most important. Mr. Rogers moved through the trapdoor, back into the attic of his own house, and once again he stood before the tall safe built in the wall. He opened the door, stepped into the strong room, moved for a moment quietly in the dark... And then spoke gently. Now, be good, my sweetheart. I'm depending on you. Open, Sesame. Come on now, old thing. Open, Sesame. Open, Sesame. Ah, That's better. That's very much better. By 9.30, his answer was back. All the little piece of paper said was a hasty okay. At a quarter before 11, he took his revolver from a locked drawer, inspected it carefully, yes, loaded it with cartridges from an unbroken packet, and left the house. He walked quickly, keeping well away from the wall, and when he climbed on a bus, he sat next to the conductor, where he could watch all who got on and off. By 25 minutes after 11, he was out on lonely Hampstead Heath, pausing in the shadow of a large tree to adjust a black velvet mask on which in white thread was stitched the number 21. 
Then he stepped briskly to the door of the villa that lay before him and... What is it? Finality. Come in. Go right on through. Number one will check you in. Right. Twenty-one, sir. Lift your mask. Very well, Twenty-one. You may go on to the meeting room. Thank you, sir. The room of the villa in which Mr. Rogers now stood was a large one, a brilliantly lighted room. There was a gramophone in one corner blaring out a jazz tune. To its rhythm, couples, masked men and women, were dancing. Some were in evening dress, some in tweeds and jumpers. In another corner of the room was the bar. Mr. Rogers went up to it and asked the masked man in charge for a double whiskey. He consumed it slowly, leaning on the bar. The room filled. Presently, someone moved across to the gramophone and stopped it. Mr. Rogers looked around. Number one, the massive gentleman in evening dress who had checked him in, appeared on the threshold. A tall woman in black stood beside him. Her mask, embroidered with a white number two, covered her hair and her face completely. Only her, her fine bearing, her white arms, and her dark eyes, shining through the eye slits, proclaimed her as a woman of power, of physical attraction. The masked dancers were silent now, as number one spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, we are short two members tonight. I need not inform you of the disastrous failure of our plan for obtaining the plans of the court Wendelsham Heliscoper. Our courageous and devoted friends, number 15 and number 38, were betrayed and taken by the police. Some of you might fear that under examination these two would break down and give away our society. There is no need for such a fear. I gave the usual orders, and their tongues have been silenced. Their defense will be discreetly compensated in the usual manner. I call upon number 12 and 34 to undertake this agreeable task. They will attend me at my office for their instructions after the meeting. Will the numbers I have named kindly signify by raising their hands that I are able and willing to perform this duty? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your partners for the next dance. <laughs> The gramophone struck up again. Mr. Rogers turned to a girl near him in a red dress. She nodded, and they slipped into the movement of a foxtrot. The couples gyrated solemnly and in silence. Their shadows were flung against the blinds as they turned and stepped to and fro. The girl in red spoke to Mr. Rogers. What's happened? I'm frightened, aren't you? I feel as if something awful was about to happen. It does take one a bit short. Number one's way of doing things. But it's safer like that. Oh, there's poor men. Don't no. talk in, please. You know the rules. Sorry. In silence, the dance continued. And then it came to an end. And then when it had finished, the dancers came again to where number one sat and waited with tense eagerness for him to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, you may wonder why this extraordinary meeting has been called. The reason is a serious one. The failure of our recent attempt was no accident. The police were not on the premises that night by accident. We have a traitor amongst us. <laughs> this last failure was not the first. You'll remember the unfortunate way in which the affair of the Dinglewood pearls turned out. And there were others. However, I am happy to say that our minds can now be easy. All these troubles have been traced to their origin. The offender has been discovered and will be removed. The misguided member who introduced the traitor to our ranks will be placed in a position where his lack of caution will have no further ill effects. There's no cause for alarm. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please take your partners for the next dance. Again, the gramophone took up its bizarre monotony, and the masked dancers glided and turned, and their movements were sharper, more staccato. The girl in red was claimed by a tall mask in evening dress. A hand laid on Mr. Rogers' arm made him start. A small, plump woman in a green jumper slipped a cold hand into his. 
the dance went on. When it stopped, everyone stood detached, stiffened in expectation. The endless interval was over. Number one raised his voice. Ladies and gentlemen, you will no doubt wish to be relieved of the questions on your mind. I will name the persons involved. Number 37. No, no. Iris. I swear on the Iris. You have failed in discretion. You will be dealt with. If you have anything to say in defense of your folly, I'll hear it later. Sit down. Number 37 sank down upon a chair. He pushed his handkerchief under the mask to wipe his face. Two tall men closed in upon him. The rest fell back. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now name the traitor. Stand forward. Number 21. Take off your mask. Number 37. This man was introduced to our society by you under the name of Joseph Rogers. Formerly second footman in the service of the Duke of Denver, dismissed for petty thievery. Did you take steps to verify the statement? I did. I did as God my witness. It was all straight. I had him identified by two of the servants. I asked all over about him. The story was through. I'll swear it was. Number 21. Your name has been given as Joseph Rogers. Is that your real name? Answer me. Is that your real name? No. What is your name? Peter Death Redden Whimsy. Silence! My compliments, Your Lordship. We thought Lord Whimsy was dead. He was killed, so the paper said, two winters ago while shooting big game in Africa. He even left a will, probed of 500,000 pounds. To his mother, I believe, the Dowager Duchess of Denver. Lord Peter Whimsy, indeed. Well known book collector, man about town, distinguished criminologist, took an active part in the solution of several famous mysteries. Taking an active part, if you don't mind. So you deliberately led us to think you were dead and became Joseph Rogers to gain entrance to our society. What has become of the real Joseph Rogers? He died abroad. I, I took his place. And the end of your impersonation to uncover our society. Precisely. I see. The robbery of your own set, upon which we congratulated ourselves, and which you helped to execute, was arranged. Obviously. The robbery of the Duchess, your mother, was arranged by you. It was. It was a very ugly tiara, no real loss to anybody with decent taste. The burglary of the Winthrop Mansion, the theft of the necklace at Covent Garden, the others as well. You arranged them all. All. Uh, may I spoke, by the way? You may not. Numbers 15, 22, 39. You have watched the prisoner. Has he made any attempt to communicate with anybody? Uh, none. His letters and pawns have been opened. His telephone tapped and his movements followed. Even the water pipes in his house have been under observation for Morse code signals. You're certain? Absolutely. Then we may be sure that he has been alone in this adventure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please take oh, your... Oh, Very well. Take the prisoner away. And be sure you explain carefully to him first the manner of his death. I am sure he'll enjoy it. Wait, wait, at least you can let me die decently. Take him away. Stop, I have something to say, something to sell. We make no bargains with traitors. No, but listen, do you think I haven't thought of this? I'm not a fool. I've left a letter. To whom? To the police. If I don't return tomorrow, it'll be open. Mr. Bluff, the prisoner sent no letter. He's been strictly watched for months. I left the letter before I came to Lambeth. Then it can't contain no information of any value. Oh, but it does. The combination of my safe. It did? Has this man's safe been searched? Yes. What did it contain? No information of importance, sir. An outline of our organization, the name of the house, nothing that can't be altered and covered before morning. And did you investigate the inner compartment of the safe? You hear what he says, did you? He's trying to bluff. There is no inner compartment. I hate to contradict you, but I'm really afraid you must have overlooked it. And what did you say was in the compartment, if it does exist? The names of every member of the society with their addresses, photographs, and fingerprints. Oh, 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 what did you say you have contrived to get this information? If by doing a little detective work on my own. I just been watched. True, the fingerprints of my watch has adorned the first page of the collection. That statement can be proved? Certainly. The name of number... Number 40, for example. Stop it. Stop it. If you mention names here, you will certainly have no hope of mercy. Bring the prisoner to my office. Ladies and gentlemen, take your partners for the next dance. Yes. Prove that I know your gang from number one through number 25. Do you want me to prove that I know the others as well? My lord, your story fills me with regret that you are not, in fact, a member of our society. Wit, courage, and industry are valuable in an association like ours. I fear I cannot persuade you. No, I suppose not. Yes? Ask the members kindly to proceed to the supper room.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'll not conceal from you the seriousness of the situation. The prisoner has recited to me 25 names and addresses which were thought to be unknown except to their owners and to me. There has been great carelessness. Fingerprints have been obtained. He showed me some photographs of them. He tells me that the book of names and addresses is to be found in the inner compartment of his safe, together with certain letters and papers stolen from the houses of members and several objects with fingerprints. I believe he tells the truth. He offers the combination of the safe in exchange for a quick death. I think his offer should be accepted. What is your opinion, ladies and gentlemen? The combination is known already. True. This man is Lord Peter Wimsey, a scientist of crime. Do you think he will have forgotten to change the combination? Oh, I say, give him the promise. Time's getting short. Yeah, 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 yeah. You are agreed? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a bargain, Wednesday. What is the combination? The word of the combination is unreliability. And the inner door, the inner compartment. In anticipation of a visit of the police, the inner door is open. Good. Number 12 and 36. You'll go to the prisoner's house and... Why should any more... That's right. Uh, I agree. Nobody ought to be trusted. Then what, ladies and gentlemen, do you suggest? You go yourself. You're the only one that knows all the names. You go yourself. I second that motion. Is the wish of the meeting, then, that I should go? No. I say no. No, don't go. Number one is our president, the head and soul of our society. If anything should happen to him, where should we be? You've all blundered. We have your carelessness to thank for all this. Do you think we should be safe for five minutes if he were not here to repair your folly? Well, there's something in that. If you will pardon my suggesting it, the lady appears to be in a position peculiarly favorable for the reception of the president's confidences. The contents of my modest volume will be no news to her. Why should she not go herself? Because I say she must not. If it is the will of the meeting, I'll go. Give me the key of the house. Here. Is your house watched? No. If I have not returned in two hours, act for the best to save yourselves. And do what you like with the prisoner. <laughs> President has been gone two hours. Traitor! What's happened to him? How should I know? Perhaps he's uh, looked after himself and gone while the going was good. Liar! Oh. He'd never do that. What have you done with him? Speak, or I'll make you speak. Well, I, can, I can only form a guess, madam. I'm afraid that your president may quite inadvertently have left the door of the inner compartment closed behind him, in which case... Yes. Well, let me explain the mechanism of my safe. Hmm? The inner compartment has two doors. The outermost most opens outward with an ordinary key. Oh, do you think that the president is so stupid as to be caught in an obvious trap? Undoubtedly, he will have wedged open that inner door. Undoubtedly, madam. But the sole purpose of that inner door is to appear to be the only one. Hidden behind the hinge of that door is another, a sliding panel, also left open. Inside the compartment is the big, heavy ledger containing all the information about this society. This ledger lies on a steel shelf. Uh, do I make myself clear? Oh, yes, 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 go on. The steel shelf is balanced on a concealed spring. When the weight of the book, the ledger, is lifted, the shelf rises almost imperceptibly, and in rising, it makes an electrical contact. Now, let me draw a picture. Your president steps into the inner compartment, sees the book, takes it up anxiously to examine to see if it's the right one. The shelf rises, the electrical contact is made, and the steel panel behind him slides into place. He's trapped. You devil! What is the word that opens the inner door? Quick, the word. Do you remember the story of Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves? Uh -huh. Well, when, uh, when I had this safe constructed, my mind went back, well, call me sentimental if you will, to my childhood. The words that opened the door are open sesame. Oh. How long can a man live in this devil's trap of yours? Oh, I should think he might hold out for a few hours if he didn't use up all the oxygen by you know, hammering and yelling. I imagine if we go there at once, we'd be able to get him out all right. I'll go myself. I think you'd better take me with you. Why? Well, I'm the only person who can open the door. But you've given me the word. Yes, you have the word. But this door of mine, <laughs> I'm rather proud of it. You know, it's my own invention. It's the latest thing. It will open to the words, open sesame, all right. But to my voice only. Your voice. I choke your voice in my hands. What do you mean, your voice only? Don't clutch my throat like that. You'll wreck my voice and then the door might not recognize it. Ah. Hey, that's better. The door got stuck for a week once and when I had a cold... Is what he says true? Is it possible? Perfectly possible, madam. It will have a microphone arrangement. It could be done also with light vibrations. Oh, we must let him go. Take the ropes off him. Let him go? Nothing. He doesn't go to blab to the police. 
The president's done in, that's all. And we'd all better make traps while we can. It's all up, boys. Right. Chuck his fellow down the cellar and fasten him in. I'll go and destroy the ledgers. 32, you know where the switch is. Give us a quarter of an hour to clear, then you can blow the place to glory. No. No, you can't leave one to die. He's your president, your leader. I won't let it happen. I won't. I'll free this man myself. Here, yeah, none of that. Let me go. Let go of me. Think, Blanche, let me go. think. It'll be light in an hour or two. The police may be here at any moment. The police. Oh, yes. Yes, you're right. No, we mustn't imperil the safety of all for just one man. He himself would not wish it. Throw this man in the cellar and let's get out of here while I time. Uh, here. Uh, well, this is good enough. Leave him here. Right. Uh, now, uh, let's go. Hey, you chaps. Yeah, I should have him. I say, it's lonesome down here in this cellar. You might at least leave a light on. Don't worry about the dark. That thinking you here is the time choose for the bomb that's going to blow out this place. It's all set. You won't have long to wait. Uh, not <laughs> long. <laughs> Who is it? Who's there? Shh. Hold still. So I can cut the ropes. Where well, it isn't too. My compliments, madam, on your loyalty to your president. Quick, quick. They've set the time shoes. The house is mine. Follow me as fast as you can. Number one must be saved. And only you can do it. Well, how did you manage to? Okay, there's no time for questions. Get up and follow me. You will release him. You promise. I promise. But I warn you, madam, that this house is surrounded. When my safe uh, door closed, it gave a signal to Scotland Yard. All the members of the society have taken. <laughs> Never mind them. Here. Outside. Quick. That you, Inspector? Get your fellows away, quick. The house is going up in a minute. Winky! Oh, it's Winky! It's Inspector Parker, old man. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm a bit winded. What happened, Inspector? Oh, about half a dozen of them got blown up. The rest we bagged. Uh, hurry, we must hurry. Who's this? For one of the gang, she's called number two. We must save him, we must. Golly, I clean forgot the gentleman in the safe. Parker, where's your car? It's down the lane. Send for one of your men down to get it. Right. Johnson, bring that car here. Yes, sir. I've got the, the number one of the whole company quietly asphyxiating at home. I promise we'd get back and save him. He's the bloke that we've been wanting. The man at the back of the Morrison case and the Hope Wilmington case and hundreds of others. <laughs> Is this it? Hmm, quite a contraption. Yes, I only hope he hasn't upset the adjustment by something like oh, this. Oh, please, Alice. I hope you haven't heard my voice. Oh, you sound all right. I can only be conversational. Come on, old thing. Show us your faces. Open sesame. Open sesame. Confound you. Open sesame. Open sesame. Let me see. No, he's not. He lived to stand his trial. And so, all's right with the world, as it always is when Lord Peter Whimsey is involved. The Cave of Alibaba by Dorothy Sayers is the story which gave us tonight's suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. Our guest director for this evening was Robert Louis Sheehan. Tonight's radio drama was written by Peter Lyon and scored by Bernard Herman. Romney Brent was Peter Whimsey, William Moulton played number one, and Ira Gerald, the lady in the case. Others in the cast were Kathleen Cordell... Victor Beecroft, Roland Bottomley, J.W. Austin, William Podmore, Ian Martin, and William Malton. Next Wednesday, suspense will not be heard because of a special all-star Hollywood broadcast which Paramount Pictures will present. Two weeks from tonight, at this time, Columbia will bring you another selected story from the world's great literature of thrills. Another study in suspense.
This is Barry Kroger, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you suspense. Columbia's parade of outstanding thrillers, produced and directed by William Spear, and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. And very happy I am to be back in the United States and back on the Columbia Network, even for so short a visit as this one. Back with old friends like Johnny Dietz, who's tonight's director, and Bernard Herman. The Mercury Theater presented tonight's radio play for the first time last year. We came right out then and hailed it as a classic of the medium. Nobody argued the point. A lot of people asked us to do it again, so it's gratifying to get the chance now and to find a favorite of ours in this distinguished anthology of spook shows. Personally, I've never met anybody who didn't like a good ghost story. But I know a lot of people who think there are a lot of people who don't like a good ghost story. For the benefit of these, at least, I go on record at the outset of this evening's entertainment with a sober assurance that although blood may be curdled on this program, none will be spilt. There's no shooting, knifing, throttling, axing, or poisoning here. No clanking chains, no cobwebs, no bony and or hairy hands appearing from secret panels or, better yet, bedroom curtains. If it's any part of that dear old phosphorescent foolishness that people who don't like ghost stories don't like, then again, I promise you, we haven't got it. Not tonight. What we do have is a thriller. It's half as good as we think it is. You can call it a shocker. It's already been called a real Orson Welles story. Now, frankly, I don't know what this means. I've been on the air directing and acting in my own shows for quite a while now, and I don't suppose I've done more than half a dozen thrillers in all that time. Honestly, I don't think even that many, but it seems I do have a reputation for the uncanny. Quite possibly, a little escapade of mine involving a couple of planets, which shall be nameless, is responsible. It doesn't really matter. Don't think I disapprove of thrillers. I don't. A story doesn't have to appeal to the heart. It can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart to be warmed, and sometimes you want your spine to tingle. The tingling, it's to be hoped, will be quite audible as you listen tonight to The Hitchhiker. That's the name of our story, The Hitchhiker. I'm in an auto camp on... Route 66, just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, perhaps it'll help me. Keep me from going, going crazy. I gotta tell this quickly. I'm not crazy now. I feel perfectly well, except that I'm running a slight temperature. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age, unmarried, tall, dark, with a black mustache. I drive a 1940 Buick license number 6Y175189. I was born in Brooklyn. All this I know. I know that I'm at this moment perfectly sane. That it's not me who's gone mad. It's something else. Something utterly beyond my control. Now, I've got to speak quickly. At any minute, the link may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on Earth. The last night I ever see the stars. Six days ago, I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Goodbye, Mother. Here, give me a kiss. And I'll go. I'll come out with you to the car. Oh, no, it's raining. Stay here at the door. 
<laughs> What's this? Tears? I thought you promised me you wouldn't cry. Oh, I know, dear. I, I'm sorry. But I I do hate to see you. Well, I'll be back. It'll only be the, on the course three months. Oh, it isn't that. It's, it's just the trip. Ronald, I wish you weren't drowning. Oh, Mother, there you go again. People do it every day. I know, but you'll be careful, won't you? Promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast. Or pick up any strangers on the road. Oh, gosh. I think I was still 17 here, you told oh. And why? I mean, as soon as you get to Hollywood, won't you, son? Of course I will. Don't you worry. There's nothing going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads with a hot dog or a hamburger stand every 10 miles. <laughs> I was in fine spirits. The drive ahead of me, even the loneliness, seemed like a lark. I reckoned without him. Crossing Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript, with a cap pulled down over his eyes. I would have forgotten him completely, except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw him again. At least, he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb pointing west. I couldn't figure out how he got there, but I thought probably one of those fast trucks had picked him up, beat me to the Skyway, and let him off. I didn't stop for him. And late that night, I saw him again. It's on the new Pennsylvania turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels when I saw him. Standing under an arc light by the side of the road. I seen quite distinctly the bag of cap. Even the spots of fresh rain. He hallooed at me this time. I stepped on the gas like a shot. Lonely countries to be out game because I had no intention of stopping. Besides the coincidences or whatever it was, maybe the Willies. Stop at the next gas station. Yes, sir. Uh, fill her up. Certainly, sir. Check your oil, sir? No, thanks. It hasn't been raining here recently, has it? Not a drop of rain all week. Oh? Oh, I, I suppose that doesn't done your business any harm. Oh, people drive through here all kinds of weather. Mostly business, you know. There aren't many pleasure cars out on the turnpike this season of the year. I suppose not. What, uh, uh, what about hitchhikers? <laughs> hitchhikers here? What's the matter? Don't you ever see any? Not much. If we did, it'd be a sight for sore eyes. Why? Why? Oh, look, I'd be a fool who started out to hitch rides on this road. Look at it. Then, you've never seen anybody? No. Maybe they get the lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house. But then it'd be a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't want to pick up a guy for that long a ride. And you know, this is pretty lonesome country here. Mountains and woods. You ain't seen anybody like that, have you? Oh, no. Oh, no, not, not at all. I was just... Uh... A technical question. I see. Well, that'll be just a dollar forty-nine with the tax. Then gradually passed through my mind a sheer coincidence. I had a good night's sleep in Pittsburgh. I didn't think about the man all next day until well, just outside of Zanesville, Ohio. I saw him again. It's a bright, sunshiny afternoon. The peaceful Ohio fields. Brown with the autumn stubble lay greening in the golden light. I was driving slowly, drinking it in, and the road suddenly ended in a detour in front of the barrier. He was standing. Now let me explain about his appearance before I go on. I repeat, there was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence. There was his attitude menacing. He merely stood there, waiting, almost drooping a little, with a cheap overnight bag in his hand. He looked as though he'd been waiting there for hours. And he looked up. He hailed me. He started to walk forward. Hello. 
Hello? Hello? No, not just now. Sorry. Hello to California? No, not today. The other way. Going to New York. Sorry. I got the car back on the road again. I felt like a fool. I had the thought of <clears throat> picking him up, of having him sit beside me. It was somehow unbearable. At the same time, I felt more than ever unspeakably alone. Hour after hour went by. Fields, the towns ticked off one by one. The light changed. I knew now that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I caught myself searching the side of the road, waiting for him to appear. Sandwiches and pop here, don't you? Yeah, we go in the daytime. We're closed up now for the I know, but I was wondering if you could possibly have a cup of coffee, black coffee. Just. No, let this come away, mister. My wife's a cook. She's a man. Uh, don't shut the door, please. Listen, just a minute ago. Uh, just a minute ago, there was a man standing here right beside the stand, a suspicious looking man. I, I don't mean to disturb you. You see, I was driving along when I just happened to look, and there he was. How's he doing? For nothing. You've been taking a nip. That's what you've been doing. Now, on your way before I call out Sheriff Oates. I got into the car again and drove on slowly. It's getting to hate the car. If I could have found a place to stop, to rest a little. I was in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now. A few resort places there were closed, only an occasional log cabin, seemingly deserted. That's all that broke the monotony of the wild, wooded landscape. And I had seen him at that roadside stand. I knew I'd see him again. Maybe at the next turn of the road. I knew that when I saw him next, I would run him down. But I didn't see him again. I didn't see him until late next afternoon. I stopped a car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma to let a train pass by. When he appeared across the tracks leaning against a telephone pole. Perfectly airless, dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun. Yet there were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking, blindly, I started the car across the tracks. He didn't look up at me. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the back of the car, turning the wheel sharply toward him. I could hear the train in the distance now, but I didn't care then. Along the car. The train was coming closer. I could hear the bell ringing and the crowd twisting. Still, he stood there. And now I knew that he was beckoning, beckoning me to my death. Frustrated and left. I started work at last. I managed to back up. And the train passed. He was gone. I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. After that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this man was or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, I mustn't let myself alone on the road for one minute. Like a ride? Well, what do you think? How far are you going? Oh, uh, where do you want to go? Amarillo, Texas. I'll drive you there. Gee. Uh, you mind if I take off my shoes? My dogs are killing me. Go right ahead. Oh, gee, what a break there. Have you hitchhiked much? Sure, only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get the break. Uh, I should think it would be, though. I'll bet you get a good pickup in a fast car... You did, you could get places faster than, say, another person in another car, couldn't you? I don't get you. Well, take me, for instance. Suppose I'm I'm driving across the country, say, at a nice, steady clip, about 45 miles an hour. 
<clears throat> couldn't, couldn't a girl like you just standing beside the road waiting for Liz beat me to town? Or any town. Why did she got picked up every time in a car doing from 65 to 70 miles an hour? I don't know. What difference does it make? Oh, no difference. It's just a crazy idea I have sitting here in the car. <laughs> Imagine spending your time in a swell car thinking of things like that. What would you do instead? What would I do? If I was a good-looking fellow like yourself, why, it's... I just enjoy myself every minute of the time. I'd sit back and, and relax. I never saw a good-looking girl along the side of the road. Hey, look out. Did you see him? See who? A man standing beside the barbed wire fence. Oh, I didn't see anybody. I it wasn't nothing but a bunch of cows and, and a wire fence. That, no? What do you think he was doing? Trying to run into the barbed There's wire fence? a man fence? there, I tell you. A thin gray man with an overnight bag in his hand. Well, I, I was trying to run him down. Run him down? Kill him? Say so you didn't see him, Maxon? You sure? I didn't see a soul. As far watch as I can Watch for him the next time. And keep watching. Keep your eyes peeled on the road. He'll turn up again. Maybe any minute. There! Look there! How does this door work? I, I got knowledge. Did you see him that time? No, I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect ever to see him. All I want to do is go on living. I don't see how I will very long, driving with you. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't... I... I don't know what came over me, but please don't go. So if you'll excuse me. You can't go. Listen, how would you like to go to California? I'll drive you to California. See, you think elephants all the way? No, thanks. Uh-uh, thanks just the same. Listen, please, just, just one minute, please. You know what I think you need, big boy? Not a girlfriend. Just a good dose of sleep. Please. There, I got it now. Now, you can't go, please. Get your hands off me. Do you hear me? Get your hands off me. She ran from me. As though I were a monster. A few minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick her up. I knew then that I was utterly alone. It was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I tried to figure out what to do, how to get hold of myself. If I could find a place to rest, or even if I could sleep right here in the car for a few hours, along the side of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket when... I saw him coming toward me, emerging from the herd of moving steer. Hello? Maybe I should have spoken to him then. Thought it out then and there. For now, he began to be everywhere. Wherever I stopped, even for a moment, for gas, for oil, for a drink of pop, a cup of coffee, sandwich... He was there. I saw him standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night when I dared to slow down. He was sitting near the drinking fountain, a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. He was waiting for me outside the Navajo reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque when I bought 20 gallons of gas. I was... I was afraid to stop him. I began to drive faster and faster. I was... <laughs> In the lunar landscape now. The great arid Mesa country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly crawling over the face of the moon. Now he didn't even wait for me to stop. Unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads, he waited for me at every other mile. I'd see his figure, shadowless, flitting before me, still in the same attitude, over the cold, lifeless ground flitting over dried-up rivers, over broken stones cast up by old glacial upheavals, flitting in that pure and cloudless air. I was beside myself when I finally reached Gallup, New Mexico. There's an auto camp here. Cold, almost deserted this time of year. I went inside and asked if there was a telephone had the feeling that if only I could speak to someone familiar, someone I loved, I could pull myself together. Your call, please. Long distance. Long distance, certainly. This is long distance. I'd like, uh, I'd like to put in a call to my home in Brooklyn, New York. 
I'm Ronald Adams. I'm, uh, the, the number is Beechwood 200828. Certainly. I will try to get it for you. Albuquerque. New York for Gallup. New York. Gallup, New Mexico, calling Beechwood 20828. I read somewhere that love could vanish demons. It's the middle of the morning. I knew Mother would be home. I pictured her tall and white hair in a crisp house dress, going about her tasks. Be enough, I thought, just to hear the even calmness of her voice. Will you please deposit three dollars and eighty-five cents for the first three minutes? When you have deposited a dollar and a half, will you wait until I have collected the money? deposit another dollar and a half. Will you please deposit the remaining 85 cents? Ready with Brooklyn? Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello? Hello, hello, Mother. This is Mrs. Adams' residence. Who is it you wish to speak to, please? What? Oh, who is this? This is Mrs. Winnie. Mrs. Winnie? I, I don't know any Mrs. Winnie. Is this Beechwood 208828? Yes. Uh, oh, where, where's my mother? Where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams is not at home. She's still in the hospital. The hospital? Yes. Who but... is this calling, please? Is it a member of the family? Well, what's she in the hospital for? been prostrated for five days. Nervous breakdown. But who is Nervous the breakdown? Well, my grandmother never was nervous. It's all taken place since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. Death of her... Death of her oldest son, Ronald? Hey, what's this? What number is this? This is Beechwood 20828. It's all been very sudden. He was killed just six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. And so... So I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in Gallup, New Mexico. I'm trying to think. Trying to get hold of myself. Otherwise, I... I'm going to go crazy. Outside, it's night. The vast, soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa. Mountains. Prairies. Desert. Somewhere among them... He's waiting for me. Somewhere I shall know who he is and who I am. So ends The Hitchhiker, and to Orson Welles, our considerable thanks for his playing of the title role. Mr. Welles... Help wanted. Men, women, and children. Nature of work, hard, monotonous, back-breaking labor. Hours, 75 a week minimum. Pay, few cents an hour. Added inducement. Two meals a day, including several ounces of bad bread and a cup of thin soup. Don't delay. Apply at once. How'd you respond to a want ad like that, Mr. and Mrs. American working man and woman? You'd laugh, wouldn't you, and throw the paper in the trash basket? Dismiss the whole advertisement as some kind of a joke, but believe me, it's no joke. It's a simple statement of the working conditions that exist today in Nazi Germany and the conquered countries under Nazi rule. It's also an exact statement of the working conditions that will be imposed on you and every member of your family if the Nazis win this war. You yourself personally can stop them from winning, as you know. 
You don't have to give up your well-paid job to do it. You needn't have to be a soldier or a sailor or an airman or a nurse or a war worker to ensure American victory. Uncle Sam doesn't ask plain, ordinary, hard-working citizens like you to give him anything. All he asks, all he does ask very seriously and very urgently, is that you loan him ten cents out of every dollar you make. That's all there is to it. Lend Uncle Sam a dime to win this war. And he'll pay you back with interest when he's won it. The easiest, most convenient way to lend him these dimes is to enroll in the payroll savings plan. Just tell your boss to deduct ten cents from every dollar he pays you and lend it to Uncle Sam in your name. Sign up for this simple savings plan today, and when victory comes, you'll have war bonds in your pockets instead of Axis bonds on your wrists. Suspense will be heard again two weeks from tonight. Next Wednesday night, September 9th, the Columbia Broadcasting System will present over many of these stations at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime an address by W. Averill Harriman, United States Land Lease Administrator in London. Mr. Harriman, as the personal representative of the President of the United States, attended the Moscow conferences between Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. Next Wednesday's broadcast will be Mr. Harriman's first public address since his return to this country. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. John Dietz was our guest director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Lucille Fletcher. The original score was by Bernard Herrmann. Will you give a few seconds of your time to help win this war? Then listen. At Stalingrad the other day, a Nazi tank unit attacked a corps of Russian soldiers. The Russians tried to stop the tanks and fought until their guns were silenced. Then did they surrender? Did they retreat? No. Eighteen of them rushed forward with bombs in their hands, got under the tanks, and blew them up. They gave their lives for their country. You and I are not asked to give our lives for ours. All we're asked to do is buy war bonds and stamps. Our American soldiers are giving their lives for us each day. More and more of them every day. Can we do less than loan our money to them? It's such a simple, easy thing to do. Out of every dollar you earn, lend one dime to your country. Do it regularly by joining the 10% Club where you work. And do it now. Our soldiers need your help. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you... Suspense. Parade of Outstanding Thrillers, produced by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's story deals with a remote and dangerous house. And the terrifying thing that happened there, because the rain went on for days and days, it deals with a surgeon and a girl, a giant, and a young man who took a long chance. And over them all, the moan of the night wind and the ceaseless roar of the storm. For your suspenseful listening, we invite you to learn about... Four days of rain had been ceaseless, teeming, pouring with a steady, relentless rhythm. Four solid days. The fields around Colston had been turned into huge puddles that reflected the heavy, swollen sky. And Dr. Morrissey was stirred by a deep anxiety. He stood beside a window in his sanitarium, which rose high on a lonely hill, a few miles from the little town of Colston, and stared into the jagged, spraying screen of rain. It was just three o'clock. Three o'clock of an afternoon he would long remember. He was on the point of sending for Caffrey, the ward attendant, when the door opened, and Caffrey came in, pale, disturbed. Dr. Morrissey, is there anything wrong, Caffrey? I don't know. 
There's a feeling down in the ward. Feeling? This rain's going on too long. The patient's getting uneasy. They're bound to, ain't they? If a guy with good nerves gets jumpy, you can imagine what it does to theirs. Seem to be affecting anyone in particular. Number five's been carrying on. Hitler? Yeah. I brought him up. Nurse Carter's waiting with him out in the hall. Bad of that? He's upsetting the others. He's asking for some guy named Benham. Oh, that's the man he killed. I didn't know he was homicidal. Oh, it was an accident. He was performing a brain surgery on Benham and... Uh, him? Oh, Kettler was a very important surgeon, Catherine. Didn't you know that? He keeps saying so, but it's, it's perfectly true. Very successful, Dr. Kettler was. Until he perfected an operative procedure that he called the Kettler Method. A new process of brain operation. Spent most of his life on it and... Well, when he tried it for the first time on this young lad, Benham, and Benham died on the table, it, it unbalanced his mind. <laughs> I've got to go back down there now. I think you'd better wait while I talk with Kitler. Okay, I'll bring him in. But don't make it long. I don't like the feel of things around here. Nurse, Miss Carter. Yes, we're coming. You can bring him in now. Come along. Dr. Morris, he wants to see you. Does he now? Does he? Come in, Kitler. I'd like to ask Dr. Morris a question. I'd like to ask him a question. Yes, Dr. Kitler. I should like to ask him where Laird Benham is. I know he'll never tell me. But I will, Kettler. Lad Benham is buried somewhere out there under the rain. He is at peace, Kettler. Can't you forget about him? Just forget. You'd all like me to forget about him, wouldn't you? Then you could keep him hidden away forever, couldn't you? Benham is dead, Kettler. You know that. Benham died. He did not. He's alive. He was alive when you and the rest of the envious medical profession stole him from the operating table. Kidnapped him with my bandages still around his head. You were determined to make the Kettler method seem a failure, weren't you? Thank you. Easy, easy now. Believe me, Kitler. I let Benham die. He is now, Dr. Morrissey. He's in the cellar under the wall downstairs, isn't he? Isn't he? Kitler. Let me see him. Say it, Benham. Oh, you'd better take him down, Kefrey. Yeah, all right. Come along now, sir. I'll take him, nurse. You won't show him to me. Even though it would make me well again. My cellars are empty, Kitler. Believe me, Benham isn't there. You sit there in power and order me away. Come on, Kitler. There's something I have to say. I've always been above violence, Dr. Morrissey. But the time comes when there's no other course. This is a warning, Doctor. A warning. And the joke is that you won't heed it. I'm on with you. You won't heed it now. But you'll remember it. And soon you'll remember it. Tables turn, Dr. Morrissey. Tables turn. <laughs> Poor thing. Uh, I'm afraid I'm failing with him. Failing completely. But you're not. It takes time to put a man back together. Oh, it's taking me too long with Ketla. I'm beginning to be afraid. If you'll pardon me, Doctor. Yes? I do think you're making a mistake. With him? No, with yourself. You haven't had a real vacation in three years, Dr. Marcy. Oh, you think I'm wearing a bit thin just now, don't you? And you're right. But I really can't leave my patients in anyone else's hands. Not now, at any rate. No, I'll have to make the best of it. But you need relaxation. I know, I know. Well, I hope to soothe my ragged nerves somewhat over this weekend. Oh? I have some friends coming down from the city Friday night. Leslie and Claire Whitten. Young married couple, beauty West. And I'm just going to relax with them and forget everything until Monday morning. You must, Doctor. You do need it so badly. Oh, by the way, Doctor. Yes? I slipped some of uh, those new sample bandages into your coat pocket. Well, thanks, thanks. I'll have a look at them. I think they're quite good. The salesman said that... Yes, nurse. What is it? Did, did you hear something? Thunder, wasn't it? Something else besides thunder. I thought it. Well, I didn't hear it. <laughs> My nerves must be getting the best of me. Perhaps it's a case of nurse heal thyself, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the only one who needs a rest. You know, it might be a very good idea if we both... <gasps> Dr. Morrissey. I heard that. What is it? It's coming from the ward. Sounds like... That was a shot, nurse. You get on the phone. Call the police at Colston. Hello? 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 Keep at it. Keep at it. Hello? Someone's trying to get in from the hall. Stop the mercy! Stop the mercy! It's Catherine, just a moment. Catherine! Catherine, what is it? The stairs up with me. One of them coming up the stairs. Get the clear out of here. Oh. Oh. Steady, nurse. It's dead, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes. Dr. Morrissey. Hitler. Remember my warning. Remember it, Doctor. Tables turn, Dr. Morrison. Tables turn. (laughs) 
rained for three more days. Friday night came, black, wet, and glistening. The 815 Express groaned into Colston Station, bringing Leslie and Claire Wenton out from the city with their weekend luggage. Isn't Dr. Morrissey sending his car for us, Leslie? Yes, Claire. The chauffeur was supposed to drive us over to the sanitarium to pick up the dock, and then we're all going over to his house together. I don't see any car, do you? I don't see anything but water. Maybe we're rolling over in a skiff. <laughs> oh. Oh, I hate that sound. Like somebody's in agony. I think you're a little depressed, dear. Well, I shouldn't be surprised. My head's still aching dreadfully. Poor lover. How long's that been going on now? Almost a week. It, it frightens me. I don't think it's anything serious. Waiting in the rain like this doesn't do it any good, I'm sure. I don't understand. Doc's usually so punctual, right on the dot. You don't suppose we ought to call the sanitarium? You people, or Dr. Morrissey, yes? Well, uh, yes, yes, we're the Wintons. Doc sent you to pick us up? I, Cato, Dr. Morrissey's chauffeur. You got luggage? Uh, yes. Here it is. I take. You follow me to car. Come. Uh, we're coming. Leslie? Yes? He's, he's tremendous, isn't he? He must be six and a half feet tall. I'm over six myself, darling. He's nearer eight. That's a giant. Get those shoulders. He could snap me in two like a matchstick. Oh, I, I hope he likes it. So do I, light of my life. Ah, waiting. You come, please. But I really don't think he does. <laughs> Coming. The heavy car lurched and hurtled over the rain-soaked road, tearing wildly through the dark and careening up the hillside toward the stark walls of the sanitarium. It skidded to a standstill in front of the main entrance. And cold, black Cato led them inside. The brightly lit corridors were deserted, silent, like always in a nightmare. Claire was aware of her headache growing steadily worse as Cato opened the double doors and ushered them into the waiting room. You'll tell Dr. Morrissey we're here, huh? Doctor, be with you soon. You do not go away. Yes, uh, thanks. I hope we're not staying in here very long. It isn't very cheery, is it? Oh, I don't like places like this. I suppose it's very foolish of me, but, but I always feel as if I'm in some sort of danger. That's the headache again. Everything seems worse than it really is when you're not feeling well. Don't you always find... Leslie. Yes? Yeah? Listen. What is it? Somebody's knocking. Just a moment. Gracias, adios. Who is it, Leslie? I... I don't know. Marge, you do not know me. I am Arturo Alvarez, a South American pianist. Do you have heard of me? Well, sure, I've heard of Arturo Alvarez, but I'd hardly expect to find him. Exactly. In... Humor him. Oh, of course, for a moment I forgot where I was. I've uh, heard of you, Mr. Alvarez. Is there anything I can do for you? Will you help me? I must get out of this place. Oh, sure. I came here several days ago to be treated for a mild nervous trouble. And now, now they won't let me go. I am being held a prisoner. And tonight I am scheduled to give a concert at Carnegie Hall, and I must get out of here. Please, will you help me? Ah, number ten out of the ward again, I see. How many times must I tell you that, that is strictly against the rules? I was doing nothing wrong. I was only telling this gentleman that I must be at Carnegie Hall for my concert. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sure the gentleman was very interested. Hey, Cato. Yes, uh, Doctor. Cato, you will escort number ten back to the ward and see to it that he doesn't wander back into the waiting room. No, no, I will not be taken back to the ward. Help me. Oh, no. Help me. No, 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 oh, no, no. Uh, how strongly he believes in his delusion. Strange fantasy of a diseased mind. Seriously believes that he's Arturo Alvarez. He was telling me. Oh, I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm afraid I haven't been very cordial. Uh, won't you sit down? Is there anything I can do for you? Well, you see, Dr. Morrissey invited us up for the weekend. Oh, yes, of course. He told me he was expecting you. Does he know we're here? I'm afraid not. Uh, Dr. Morrissey was unexpectedly called away on an emergency case, and I'm in charge of the sanitarium until he returns. Well, do you have any idea about when that'll be? Well, it's very hard to say. However, he asked me to ask you to wait and see to it that you're made comfortable. Uh, let me see now, your name is... Winton, uh, Leslie Winton. And uh, this is my wife, Claire. Ah, yes. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Kettler. Dr. Morrissey's assistant. 
Uh, what can I do for you? A bite of food or a drink, perhaps? I don't think so. There's nothing in the world I want so much as an aspirin. Aspirin? Yes, Doctor. She's had a headache that's been troubling her for days. It's terribly annoying. I can well imagine. Annoying and interesting. That is to a man of my profession, of course. But if you'll step into the inner office, I think I could offer you something a good deal more effective. Oh, I hate to trouble you. No know. trouble at all. I find these things most intriguing. Should I, Leslie? I think you might as well. Morrissey won't be back for a long time by the looks of things. Yes, you're quite right, Mr. Winston. Dr. Morrissey won't be back for a long, long time. Oh, well, then, uh, oh, which way do I go? Right this way. The large door on your left. You won't mind waiting alone, will you, darling? Oh, Mr. Winton shall make himself comfortable. There are cigarettes in the box, whiskey in the liquor cabinet, and the radio behind the ferns there. I'm sure you'll be quite happy. Uh, after you, Mrs. Winton. If Dr. Morrissey comes in, let me know. I hope you'll find everything you want, sir. Thanks. Uh, by the way, Doctor. Yes? You said you had something better than aspirin. I didn't know there was anything better than aspirin for a headache. I have something, Mr. Linton. Really? There's a process which I invented myself. One that never fails. A little treatment, very effective, and highly complicated, called the Kettler Method. Please, make yourself at home, Mr. Linton. <laughs> Leslie sat there, alone in the big waiting room for a while. Then creeps began setting in, and he thought to himself, Maybe I'll have that drink after all. He rose and went over to the liquor cabinet that Kepler had pointed out to him and opened it. Well, there's nothing in here but books. Yes, books. Books that were so thick with dust that it was clear they'd been there for months. Huh. No drink for Leslie. Maybe a cigarette. Kepler said the box was full. He picked it up and started opening it. Why, it isn't even a cigarette box that darn things are bookend. Yes, that's just what it was. Leslie began to think it was a tough job making himself at home in that waiting room. And then the idea occurred to him. Maybe the radio works. He went over to the radio then, turned it on, and... We are sorry to announce that the program scheduled for this time from Carnegie Hall has been canceled due to the mysterious disappearance of Arturo Alvarez, the noted South American pianist. Mr. Alvarez was known to be suffering from a minor nervous disorder and was last seen departing on a short trip to Colston in upstate New York. Alvarez. That guy is Alvarez. What's going on here? Claire, Claire. What? Dr. Kidder, open this door. Open it. Do you hear me? It's Claire. Winter. You, tell him to open up. Tell him, tell him. Doctor, send me. Tell you, young lady, headache bad. Very bad. What do you mean? He operates. Operate? He say take long time. He say you not wait. You come back tomorrow. Operate? No, no. Hitler, Hitler. Hitler, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Of course she can hear you, Mr. Winton. The operating table is just inside the door. Bring her out here. Let her go, I tell you, Keller. But I find that an operation is indicated, Mr. Winton. I forbid you to touch her. You forbid? You? I'm in charge here. No one forbids me. Do you understand? You're insane. You're... If you lay your hands on her, I'll kill you. So help me. I'll kill you. Very well, Mr. Winton. If you do not wish me to operate, that's all there is to it. I would scarcely force my service upon you. However, the girl's condition is quite serious, and I... <coughs> ah, good work. Good work, Cato, my boy. A masterstroke. Ah, do you still forbid me, Mr. Winton? Do you? Do you? No, oh, you don't answer. Good, good. Take him to the cellar, Keto, and lodge him there with his mm. friend, Dr. Morris. Okay. They should have a good deal to talk over in the still hours of the night while I cure the young lady's headache unmolested. You've got to pull yourself together, Leslie. Now try. Try to think. Keto brought you down a few moments ago. You've been hit in the head. Can you remember? Yes. I was talking to Kettler, trying to make him let Claire go. Claire? Oh, good Lord, Marcy. Where is she? He, he's got her. Kettler? She's on that operating table up there. We've got to do something. We've got to do something. Well, I'm afraid there's not much we can do. I've been here for three days and nights. What happened? Uh, it was a nightmare come to life. I'd had Kettler in my office for treatment. Yeah? He was off on a wild tangent, insisting that I had a man whom he had killed hidden down here in the cellar. That I and the rest of the medical profession had kidnapped him off the operating table with his head still swathed. 
He thinks I've been keeping this phantom from him all along, even though I've known that just one side of him would cure his mental disorders. He hates me with every fiber of his twisted brain. It's a dangerous case, Leslie. He'll... He'll kill Claire? He may. There's no chance he won't. What's that? Well, all the surgical instruments are locked away. It's possible they may not be able to find him. Isn't there any way we can get out of here? Well, couldn't I have used it? Where does that corridor lead to? To the staircase that goes to the first floor. Well, not a chance. Comes out of the operating room and they keep that door locked as tight as a drum. Besides, Kettler still has the pistol he took from my nurse. I've got to think. I've got to. My head hurts so I can't make good sense. Yes. Let's see that. I think they gave you a nasty cut. Oh, it doesn't matter. Say, Doc. Yes? What was his name? Who? The guy Kettler thought you were keeping from him. The one he killed. Benham. Ed Benham. Why? Was he a young fellow? Yes. Uh, rather tall, slender chap. Say, Doc. Hmm? Do you have any bandages down here? What? Bandages. Why, yes, I think so. They're, they're stored down here. Enough to bandage my whole head, face, and everything? Why? I might have a chance of getting through that door up there. Please, let me go now. Oh, let me go. Leslie, Leslie! You will be better soon, much better. I will take the pain away, Mrs. Winton. Cato, have you found the surgical case? Not found yet. I look. Cato, look. Find it. We must not keep Mrs. Winton in agony. Why did I say? I have to create some order in this place. I want my instrument at hand on a moment's notice. Please, let me go. Oh, let me go. You shall be well again, my dear. I promise you, you shall. Be. Doctor, here, tall, white curtain behind curtain. That's it. Open it. Open it, Tato. Lock. Lock, Doctor. Smash it open. Open it. I do. You'll find scalpels on the top tray. Bring them to me. Yes, Doctor. It's here, Doctor. See, knives. Good, sharp knives. Cato find. He find them. Excellent. How they glitter. Ah, it is good to feel the knife in my hand again. Put the others right beside my pistol here on the table. Please. Oh, please. There, there, my girl. I shall expend all my genius on you. You shall be well again. No. 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 Now to work. What was that? Who's there? Dr. Kessler. Who is it? I have found my way back to you. Open the door, Dr. Kessler. I've come back again. Who are you? You remember? You remember Laird Denham? Hey, dog. Kato! Yes, Doctor. The door! The door! Let him in! He's come back! Let him in, I say! Oh, let me out of here! He's come back! He's come back, Kato! Dr. Kessler. Then I knew it. I knew it all along. You're alive. You're living. Yes, Yes, Dr. Kessler. You. Just as they took you from the table. Yes. They took me away before the operation was complete. Finish it now. Hurry. I can't live much longer. I'm about to die. No, no. Hey, no. Get Venom out of the table. Girl, girl on table. Take her off. Take her out of here. Put her in the cellar. Let Venom take a place. At once, you hear? Yes, Dr. Peter. No. No, I won't be put in the cellar. It might be well if you went down into the cellar, you know. It's nice down there. You'll see old friends, perhaps. Old friends who need help. Hurry. Hurry, I say. Yes, doctor. Come. I'm coming. Are you all right, Venom? We can. Kato! Kato! No, stop wasting time. Leave the door alone. Help me. Help me get Venom on the table. Yes, Dr. Kato, do. Oh, that's right. Now listen carefully. Good. Uh, good. Now, lie back. Lie back. Gently. Gently. All right. Careful now. Here we are. Kato. Give me the knife. Yes, Doctor. Take off the bandages. Mm. From the top, Tato. That's correct. That's proper procedure. There. Yeah, now that's... Hmm. I thought his hair was blonde, not black. Well, perhaps I've forgotten. I've forgotten so many things that... There was a scar on his forehead, I... I clearly remember a scar on his forehead. Well, maybe. Maybe I imagine that too. That's with someone else with brown eyes. Denim. 
That means you have blue eyes. I know they were blue. And your nose. Your nose is thinner and longer. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And your lips. You have thick lips. That I know. Bandages off, Doctor. Dr. Kettler, there's a trick here. You... You're not Benham. You're not Benham. You're that young Mr. Winter. Dr. Kettler, listen to me. Cheat. Cheat. So you wanted me to finish you, did you? Yes, Mr. Winter, I will. I will. Hold him, Cato. Uh, hold him. <laughs> See the knife, Mr. Winton? Watch it glisten as it comes down, 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 and it... <laughs> Too loud for us when you hear him play the piano, dear. That's a marvelous old instrument you have, Doc. It was my mother's. This old house has been in the family for generations. Mm. Who'd ever thought we'd be alive to sit in your house and listen to somebody play a concerto? We wouldn't have been. At least I wouldn't have been if you hadn't snatched that revolver off the table right out from under Kepler's nose before they threw you into the cellar. That was the lifesaver. Made the weekend perfect. <laughs> I'm afraid it wasn't very restful. Hereafter, I'm spending all weekend in a cozy little corner under the L. <laughs> ah, it was worse for Claire than anybody. She had a dreadful time. It was ghastly, all right. Horrible. But you know something? What? My headache. It's completely gone. Kepler method, the tale of a memorable weekend and a long-awaited dead man who didn't return after all. This was tonight's story of Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. John Dietz was our director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Peter Barry and scored by Bernard Herman. Roger DeCoven was Dr. Kepler, John Gibson, Leslie Winton, and Gloria Stewart played Claire Winton. Others in the cast were Guy Rep, Martha Faulkner, Winfield Pony, and Ralph Smiley. Next week at this time, Columbia will bring you another selected story from the world's great literature of thrill. Another study in... Suspense. This is Barry Kroger, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Columbia's parade of outstanding thrillers produced by William Spear. Scored by Bernard Herman. Notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's story by the noted American author T.S. Stribling deals with a crime of murder on an exotic and atmospheric island with ragged beggars who slept in a Hindu temple and awoke with gold in their pockets and a dead girl lying near them and with a strange and mystical entrance into the life of hereafter, which was the experience of an American psychologist. For your suspenseful listening, we invite you to join us for A Passage to Benares. In Port of Spain, in Trinidad, at half past five in the morning, Mr. Henry Pagioli, an American psychologist, stirred uneasily, became conscious of a splitting headache, opened his eyes in bewilderment, and then, with a shock, saw where he was. He got up, arranged his clothing. He tried with his neat psychological mind.
to recapture his dream, to bottle up again the little smoking wisps that still floated about within his aching head. By seven o'clock, he found his way back to the house of Mr. Lowe, his host in Port of Spain. Lowe was already about his coffee with an interested spoon poised above the morning paper. Ah, there you are. Good morning, Bajoli. I say you are quiet. Didn't hear you get up at all. Have some breakfast? Oh, nice. I have been out for a breath of air. What's the news today? Well, the new governor will arrive in Trinidad on the 12th, and, uh, uh... Hello. Another native killed his wife. Tell me, Pajoli, as a psychologist, why do coolies kill their wives? Oh, for various reasons, I imagine. Let's hear some of the facts. Oh, I say this is a coincidence. Really putting on a show for you, Pajoli, on your first visit to Trinidad. How so? Well, you... You remember that wedding procession you and I watched last evening down yeah. at down the Hindu temple? The temple? Well, of course, the cream-colored little bride with the breastplate and the link gold coins and the anklets and all the finery. Mm -hmm. And the bridegroom. What did you say his name was? Boodman Lal? Yes. Well, do you know what's happened? Boodman Lal is in jail this morning, and his cream-colored little bride is dead with her throat cut. No. Do they think he did it? No doubt of it. That's why he's in jail now. He always seemed like a sensible fellow, too. One of our best patrons. Which only proves my contention for Jolie. A bridegroom of only six or eight hours killing his wife without any reason at all. Oh, and there's usually some reason for murder. Maybe. But I say, oh boy, you're, you're missing the point completely. How? Well, suppose you actually had gone and slept in the temple there last night. You mm -hmm. wanted to, you know, remember? And I said, no white man ever stays all night in a cruelly temple. You remember? Yes, I remember. You said it simply isn't done. Well, if... If you had, Pajoli, I'd say, uh, that would have been a pretty kettle, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes. Well, I'm afraid I'll be mixed up in this. Both Mr. Lal and his uncle, Hyrodas, are clients of mine. Old Hyrodas is upwards of $5 million in my bank. Hyrodas? Didn't you tell me he built that temple where the murder took place? Yes. It's what the Hindus call a temple and rest house. Hyrodas gives rice and tea to any traveler who comes in for the night. It's an Indian custom to help mendicant pilgrims. A rich Indian will build a temple and rest house just, just as you Americans erect libraries. Ah. What does it say there about the murder, though? Um, Budman Lal, nephew of the famous Mr. Hyrod Das, was arrested early this morning at his home for the alleged murder of his wife, whom he married yesterday. The body was found at six o'clock this morning in the temple where the wedding ceremony took place. The temple attendants gave the alarm. The victim's head was severed completely from her body and all her jewelry was gone. Five coolie beggars who were asleep in the temple when the body was discovered were arrested. They all claimed ignorance of the crime, but a search of their persons revealed that each beggar had a piece of the bride's jewelry and a coin from a necklace. Goodman Lal and his wife were seen to enter the temple at about 11 last night for the Hindu rite of purification. Mr. Lal, who is a prominent curio dealer, declines to say anything further. Doesn't tell you very much, does it? Ah, uh, how much? What do you make of those beggars? Oh, that's simple enough. Those devils laid in wait inside the temple until the husband went out and left his wife. Then they murdered her and divided the spoils. Ah, but she had enough bangles and g to give a dozen to each man. Yes, yes, you're quite right, Bajoli. That's a fact. Why should they continue sleeping in the temple after they killed her if they did murder her? Well, why shouldn't they? They knew they'd be suspected that they couldn't get off the island without capture, so they thought they might, might as well lie down again and go back to sleep. Hmm. You may be right, Lowell, but that doesn't look like the solution to me. Well... I'm satisfied that's how it occurred. You mean the beggars killed her? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think so. I rather fancy that the actual murderer took the girl's jewelry and went about the temple thrusting a bangle and a coin in the pockets of each of the sleeping beggars to lay a false scent. Oh, come now. That, that's laying it on a bit too thick, Bojo. My dear Lord, it's the only possible explanation for the coins in the beggars' pockets. I know, boy. You've had lots of experience in these things. Come along with me and we'll go up and see Mr. Hyrule Daz and see if we can't help his nephew. I'll be glad to. But we'll go to the temple first. Then we'll call on Mr. Hyrodice. Well, here we are. Why do the police guard at the door? The temple doesn't look sinister in the daylight. Yeah, it just looks dirty. Yeah, let's go in and question the beggars. Excuse me, uh, 
Did any of you fellows hear noises in this temple outside? Oh, much sleep, Said. No noise. Policeman Pancho's wake this morning makes it still here. What's your name? Suda Cham, Said. When did you go to sleep last night? When I ate rice and tea, Said. Mm-hmm. Do you remember seeing Budman Lao and his wife enter this building last night? Uh, yes, remember, Said. Did you see them go out? No, Said. No one remember go out. You were all asleep then, huh? All asleep, Said. Did you have any dreams during your sleep? Hear any noises? Uh, I dream bad dreams, Said. Huh? When policeman punched me awake this morning, I think dream has come true. I'm me, Said. Me, too. Me. Did you all have bad dreams? Yes, all have bad dreams. Look here, Pajoli. I, I I don't see where this is getting us. I do think we ought to be getting on to old Haradatta's house. No, I think we can now entirely discard the theory that the beggars murdered the girls. Oh, what wrong? They told you nothing except that they all had bad dreams. That's the reason. They all had wild, fantastic dreams. That suggests that they were given some sort of opiate near rice or tea last night. It's quite improbable that five ignorant coolies would have wit enough to concoct such a piece of evidence as that. Mm, that's a fact, but I don't believe a Trinidad court would admit such evidence. We're not looking for legal evidence. We're after some indication of the real criminal. Now I suggest that we get onto the house of Hira Das. Please come in, gentlemen. I've been expecting you. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you. A most mysterious murder in the life of my poor nephew will depend upon your exertions, gentlemen. Tell me, what do you think of the beggars that were found in the temple with the bangles and coins? Well, I'm afraid my judgment of the beggars will disappoint you, Mr. Hyredas. Huh? My theory is that they're innocent of the crime. Really? Why do you say that? Because they told me of dreams they had. All their dreams were very nearly identical. You are not English, sir. No Englishman would have thought of that. No, I'm American with a backlash thinking of our uh, battalion. My name's Pagioli. What is your profession, Mr. Pagioli? You are a detective? No, Mr. Das. I'm a psychologist. Oh. Your soul is at least groping after knowledge. However, it gropes as a blind worm, Mr. Pagioli. And we must find the criminal who committed this crime and thus restore my nephew Boodman Lau to liberty. You can imagine what a blow this has been to me after I arranged this marriage for my nephew. You did? Arranged a marriage for a nephew who was in his 30s? Yes, Mr. Padroli. Mm. I wanted him to avoid the pitfalls into which I fell. Ah. He was unmarried and he'd already begun to add dollars to dollars. I did the same thing. And now, look at me. An empty old man in a foreign land. What good is this house where men of my own kind can't come and sit with me when I have no grandchildren to romp and play? No. I've piled up dollars and pounds. I, I've eaten the world, Mr. Pajoli, and found it bitter. Now here I am, an outcast. And why don't you go back to India, Mr. Hyderda? Why, Mr. Pajoli, my mind is half English. If I should return to Benares... I'd walk about thinking what the temples cost. How much was the value of the stone set in the eye of Krishna's image? If I would ever be one with my own people again, Mr. Fajoli, I must leave this Western mind and body here in Trinidad. That's um, very interesting and moving, but uh, we were discussing your nephew, Budman Lau. Wait. In searching for the criminal... I would suggest you look for a moneyed man. Let me tell you my suspicions, and you can work out the details. What are they? I went out of the temple this morning to have the body of my poor murdered me brought here to my villa for burial. I talked to the five beggars, and they told me there was a sixth sleeper in the temple last night. Was there indeed? Yes, Mr. Lowe. A white man. A white man? Yes, Mr. Lowe. All five of the coolies and my man, Guka, told me it was true. But, Mr. Hyradas, decapitation is not an American mode of murder. American? I, I, I was speaking generally. I mean a white man's method of murder. Uh, that is indicative in itself. I meant to call your attention to that point. It shows the white man was a highly educated man who had studied the mental habits 
of other people than his own. So he was enabled to give the crime an extraordinary resemblance to a Hindu crime. But what motive could a white man have? Possibly robbery, Mr. Pajoli. Or if he were a very intellectual man, he might have murdered the poor child by a way of experiment. A murderful experiment? Yes, Mr. Lowe. To record the psychological reaction. Why? Oh, I can't entertain such a theory as that, Mr. Harrod. Oh, no. It is too far fetched. However, it is worth investigating, is it not? Yes, yes, but I'll begin my investigations with the man Guka. By all means, Mr. Pajoli. And in your investigations, gentlemen, hire any assistance you may need. Draw on me for any amount. I want my nephew exonerated, and above all things, I want the real criminal apprehended and brought to the gallows. What do you think of that, Marjorie? White man in that temple. Ah, sounds like pure fiction to me, to, to shield them and allow. You know, these fellows hang together like thieves. Say, it's a jolly good thing we didn't decide to sleep in the temple last night, isn't it? You know, in my opinion, Lowe, the actual criminal is Goodman Lowe. Ah, same here. I thought so ever since I first saw the account on the paper. Somehow these fellows will chop their wives to pieces for no reason at all. Lowe, well, what do you know about Goodman Lowe? Well, he, he was born here, and his oil has been a figure because of his rich uncle. Lived here all his life? Uh-huh. Except when he was in Oxford for six years. Oh, he's an Oxford man. Yes, yes. There they are. That's the trouble. I don't understand. What do you mean, Bozoli? I know that he fell in love with some English girl, but when old Haira Das chose a Hindu child for his wife, Goodman couldn't refuse marriage. No man was going to quarrel with a five million dollar legacy. And then he chose this ghastly method of getting rid of the child bride. Uh, I dare say you're right. I feel sure Bowman Lau killed the girl. I don't like getting tired of walking. There's a cab. Let's hop it my the rest of the way. Hi, Teddy. A cab. I say, oh, hi. Well, aren't you coming? You know, I don't feel that I can conscientiously continue this investigation trying to clear a person whom I have every reason to believe guilty. But, man, don't leave me like this. At least come as far as police headquarters with me and explain your theory about Guga, the temple keeper, and the right. Well, I, uh, I thought I'd go back to your cottage and pack my things. Pack your things. Well, your boat doesn't sail until Friday. Yes, I know, but there's a daily service to cure us all. It's me to go there. Oh, again. no. Come, you can't run off like that just when I stirred up an interesting murder mystery for you to unravel. All right. Well, Jolie, you ought to appreciate my efforts as a host more than that. Well, all right. To the police station. Yes, I... Okay. Hurry up. Chief Vickers, uh, this is my friend, Mr. Pajoli. Mr. Pajoli, Mr. Vickers is chief of Trinidad's police force. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, chief Vickers, I've, um, I've asked Mr. Pajoli's counsel in the Budman Lau murder case. He's already developed a theory as to who is the actual murderer of Mrs. Budman Lau. So have I. Now, in this matter, Chief Vickers, I want to be perfectly frank with you. I'll admit we're in this case in the employ of Mr. Haradaz and are making an effort to clear his nephew, Budman Lau. We felt confident you'd use the skill of the police department of Port of Spain to work out a theory clearing Bowman Lau just as readily as you would to convict him. Our department usually devotes its time to conviction and not to clearing criminals. Yes, yes, I, I know that, but if our theory will point out the actual murderer... What is your theory? Mr. Pajoli's deduction is based on the dreams of the men who were found in the temple. So Mr. Pajoli's deduction is based on dreams. It would be a remarkable coincidence, Mr. Decker, if five men had lurid dreams simultaneously without some physical cause. It suggests strongly that their tea or rice was soaked. Now, if you find out what soporific was used, then have your men search the sales record of the drugstores in the city to see who has lately bought such a drug. You will find the murderer. Uh-huh. How do you like Trinidad, Mr. Fajoli? I like it very much indeed. You've just arrived, haven't you? Yes. In uh, what university do you teach back in the state? Ohio State. A chair of criminal psychology at an ordinary state university? I'm not a professor. I'm simply a docent, and I haven't specialized on criminal psychology. I, I quiz on general psychology. You're not teaching now? No, this is my sabbatical year. You look young to have taught in the university six years, but then you American start young in your land of specialists. 
Now, uh, you, uh, Mr. Fagioli, I suppose you're wrapped up heart and soul in your psychology. I am. You'd uh, do anything in the world to advance yourself in the science. I rather think so. Especially keen on original research work. <laughs> That's what he is, G. Vickers. You know what he asked me to do yesterday afternoon? <laughs> no, what, Mr. Lowe? Oh, I don't think we ought to burden Mr. Vickers with our household anecdotes. Oh, but I'm really curious. Just what did Mr. Fagioli ask you to do yesterday afternoon, Mr. Lowe? Oh, well, really nothing, nothing at all. It's it just a little psychological experiment he wanted to do. And did he do it? Oh, no, 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 no. I wouldn't hear it. Oh, as uh, unconventional as that. Oh, just really nothing, nothing at all. I think I could guess your anecdote if I tried, gentlemen. About a half an hour ago, I received a telephone message from my man stationed at the temple to keep a lookout for you and Mr. Fagioli. A lookout for us? Yes, because one of the coolies under arrest told him that Mr. Fagioli slept in the temple last night. Oh, but that's not true. That's exactly what he didn't do. He suggested it to me, but I said no. You remember, Fagioli, you... You didn't do it. Did you, Pajoli? Did you? You see, he did. Gentlemen, I... I had a perfectly valid and important reason for sleeping in the temple last night, and so I... I can only ask your sympathetic attention to what I'm about to say. Go on. You remember, Lowe, you and I were down there watching a wedding procession. Well, just as the music stopped and the procession entered the building, suddenly it seemed to me as if... as if they'd vanished. Naturally, they'd gone to the building. No, no, I don't mean that. I'm afraid you won't understand what I do mean. That the whole procession had ceased to exist, melted into nothing. You see, that's really the idea in which the Hindus base their notion of heaven, oblivion, nothing. Yes, I've heard that before. Well, our medieval Gothic architecture was a conception of our Western heaven, and I thought perhaps the Indian architecture had somehow caught the motif of the Indian religion, you know, suggested nirvana. That's what amazed and intrigued me. That's why I wanted to sleep in the place. I wanted to see if I could further my shred of impression. Does that make any sense to you, Mr. We're not interested why you went, Mr. Fagioli. We know a murder took place in the temple. You don't... You can't think that I committed a horrible murder as an experiment. You intellectual chaps do some pretty weird things, Mr. Fagioli. Well, only the other day I was reading about two young intellectuals. Yes, these fellows I read about also tried to turn an honest penny by their murder. I don't suppose you happened to notice yesterday that the little bride, Maila Ram was almost covered with gold bangles and coins. Of course I noticed. But I had nothing whatever to do with her. I, I, I did sleep in a temple. By the way, you say you slept on a rug just as the coolies did. Yes, I did. And you didn't wake up either, Mr. Fajoli? No, no. Then did the child's murderer happen to put a coin and a bangle in your pocket, just as he did the other sleepers in the temple? I don't know. I, I haven't looked in my pocket since then. Then please do so now, Mr. Fajoli. Oh, yes. Very honest. You don't happen to have any more, do you? No. I've already been through all my pockets and I haven't any more. Well, that's something. Of course, you might have expected just such a questioning as this and provided yourself with these two pieces of gold, but I doubt it. Somehow, I don't believe that you're an experienced enough man to think of such a thing. However, we shall see. I suppose you have no objection, Mr. Pajoli, to my accompanying you over to have a little search of your baggage in Mr. Lowe's cottage. Now then, Mr. Pajoli, be so kind as to open your trunk. Good heavens. Mm-hmm. Just as I thought. A trunk tray full of bangles and coins. I'll say one thing for you, though, Mr. Pajoli. Your nerve almost got you by. But you... You can't believe that I did it. So. You don't believe I did this, do you? I... I, I don't. In your trunk, Pajoli. If I did it, I was sleepwalking. God, to think that it's possible, but right here in my own... Well, we might as well start back, I suppose. This is all. I'll, I'll go back with you, Paul Jolie. I'll see you through. Somehow I can't. I, I won't believe you did it. Thanks. You know, Paul Jolie, you set out to clear Budman Lal and, well, dash it all. It looks as if you had. No, he didn't. Budman Lal was out of jail at least an hour before you fellows came into police headquarters to see me. Oh. You mean that you turned him loose? Yes. How's that, Chief Vickers? Because, Mr. Lowe, he didn't go to the temple at all with his wife last night. He went down to Queen's Park Hotel and played billiards till one o'clock. He called up a few friends and proved that easily enough. Well, that, that leaves nobody but... Yes? But Jolie. I don't know anything about it. If I did commit the murder, I was asleep. I don't know anything about it. That's all I can say. I don't know anything about it. Perhaps the left in jail will help restore your memory. Well, we'll see. Come now, Pazioli, old man. 
Don't be too downhearted. I promise you, I'll do everything I can. <laughs> In the case against Henry Pajola, having been duly tried by a jury of your peers who have been found guilty and by the powers invested in me, I herewith sentence you to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. To recall a lost dream is the most tantalizing task ever a human brain was gripped to. But if I lie still long enough on this book, Perhaps I can recapture the dream I had in the temple last night. Yes. Yes. It seems to me that the image on the altar moved. And suddenly the dome overhead was opened and left me staring upward into a vast abyss. For I was alone in endless space. Where all creatures and all matter that had ever been or ever would be were wrapped up in me. Pashiori. That's my dream. That's an odd thing. Six men dreaming the same dream in different terms. There must be a physical cause for such a phenomenon. Of course. I've got it. Vickers. Whoa. I have it. I've solved it. Get me out of here. I know who killed the girl. What is it, my friend? I know who murdered the bride. Hold her adapted it. Now listen. Listen. Go tell Beckers to take the gold he found in my trunk and develop all the fingerprints on it. He'll find Hira Das's prints. Also tell him to follow out that obvious clue I gave him. He'll find Hira Das and demand to put the gold in my trunk. See if they don't find brass or steel filings in my room where the scoundrel sat and filed a new key. But they've already done that long ago. Yes. But certainly... And old Hyradas confessed everything. Though why a rich old man like him should have murdered a pretty child is more than I can see. Well, why did he pick on me as a scapegoat? Oh, he explained that to the police. He said he picked out a white man so the police would make a thorough investigation and be sure to catch him. Didn't I? But what I can't see is why the old boy wanted to be caught and hanged. Well, why didn't he commit suicide? Why? I know why. Because according to his religion, in that case his soul would have returned in the form of some beast. He wanted to be slain because he expects his to be reborn instantly in Benares, with little Mael Aran as his bride instead of his nephews. He hopes to be a great man with wife and children, all the things he was not, here in Trinidad. Yes, yes, you must be right. Why didn't you come and tell me about Haradas' confession the moment it occurred? What do you mean keeping me here when you know I'm an innocent man? Why didn't you tell me before this? Because I couldn't. Old Hyradas didn't confess until a month and ten days after you were hanged. So ends the passage to the Mari. T.S. Stribling's tale of mysterious death and death mysterious. This was tonight's story of... Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. John Deitch was our guest director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Carol Case and scored by Bernard Herman. Paul Stewart was Pajoli, Barry Krogel was Mr. Hyra Daff, and Horace Graham played Mr. Lowe. Others in the cast were Alan Dewitt and Guy Rex. Next week at this time, Columbia will bring you another selected story from the world's great literature of thrills. Another study in suspense. This is Barry Kroger, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Columbia's play theater of outstanding thrillers. Produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from fiction and stage and screen from the world's great literature of entertaining excitement. 
presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's story, by America's distinguished author, playwright, Owen Johnson, gathers its suspense in a very gentle way. It doesn't have a spectacular finish, garnished with revolver shots. There are no graveyard watches. There's not so much as a single lifeless body, identified or unidentified. It's a tale told in a club room, the Artists and Writers Club in New York. A tale of high-class robbery and suspicion and of how some ladies and gentlemen... Nervously counted. One hundred in the dark. Ah, that was a fine meal. Me for the club any time. Yeah, here, we can all sit here, Freddy. Yeah. Yes, if you just draw up that chair for Mr. Peters. Oh, yeah. Here you are, Mr. Peters. Thank you. Uh, do you all know Peters? Uh, this is Mr. Steingall. Uh, how do you do? I know him. Uh, Mr. Goldier? Oh, I agree with Matt. Oh, yes. yes. How are you? Oh, you know each other. Yes, yes. And the one who drew up the chair, Mr. Rankin. How do you do? Thank well, you I, guess, I, I guess we're all acquainted now. Um, to get back to our table discussion, Cranium. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, how about a drink? Who'll join me? Oh, yeah, pleasure. pleasure. Fine, yeah. fine. Yeah. Uh, John. Well, now, Stangall, as I said, there are only half a dozen stories in the world. What is more to the point? There's every reason yes, to... Yes, sir. What? Oh. Uh, five uh, with soda, John. Yes, sir. Now, now, where was I? Oh, oh, yes. What is more to the point, gentlemen, is the small number of human relations that are so simple and yet so fundamental that they can be eternally played upon, redressed and reinterpreted in every language, in every age, and yet remain inexhaustible in the possibility of variation. Well, that's true, of course. It's very possible. Take the no. eternal triangle. Two men and a woman. Or two women and a man. Its variations extend to thousands. Is that right, Rankin? Well, in a way. Ah, here we are. Uh, set them down right there, John. Very well, sir. Uh, a little soda. Oh. Uh, here you are. Uh, thank you. And you... Uh, uh, soda, Peter? Yes, please. Uh, another one. Here you are. Thanks. And here's yours. Thank you. And now, a little soda in mine. Uh, well, here's to you all. Cheers. 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 I'm afraid we can't see eye to eye, Quinny. I believe there are situations, original situations, that are independent of your human emotions. That exist just because they are situations. Accidental and nothing else. As for instance? Well, I'll just cite an ordinary one that happens to come to my mind. In a group of five men, well, such as we are here, a theft takes place. One man is the thief. Now, which one? Now, I'd like to know what emotion that interprets. And yet it certainly is an original theme at the bottom of the whole literature. It's not the same thing at all. Ah, detective stories. I could answer that the situation you give can be traced back to the commonest of human emotions. Curiosity. I think, uh, Quinny has you there, Rankin. Hmm. What is the peculiar fascination that the detective problem exercises over the human mind? You will say, curiosity. Hmm. Yes and no. Admit at once that the whole art of a detective story consists in the statement of the problem. Anyone can do it. I can do it. Steingall can do it. Uh, Rankin, I believe even you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> the solution doesn't count. It is usually banal. It should be prohibited. What interest us is, can we guess it? There you have it. The problem, the detective story. Now, why the fascination? I'll tell you. It appeals to our curiosity. Yes. But deeper, to a sort of intellectual vanity. Five men present. The theft takes place. Who's the thief? Who will guess it first? Whose brains will show its superior cleverness? You see? That's all. That's all there is to it. Out of all of which, the interesting thing is that Rankin has supplied the reason why the supply of detective fiction is inexhaustible. It does all come down to the simplest terms. Five possibilities, one answer. Well, the reason is that the situation does constantly occur. It's a situation that any of us might get into any time. Yes, I know of an incident of that kind that happened to a friend of mine last month. Of course, of course, gentlemen, you are glorifying commonplaces. Every crime I tell you expresses itself in the terms of the picture puzzle that you feed your six-year-old. It's only the variation that is interesting. Well, take the well-known instance of the visitor at a club and the rare coin, for example. Well, you all know that story. You've heard uh, it, you? I don't think I have. Uh, sure. Why, it's, it's very well-known. Oh, go ahead, Quinny. Tell it. A distinguished visitor is brought into a club. A dozen men, say, present at dinner, long table. Conversation finally veers around to curiosities and relics. 
One of the members present then takes from his pocket what he announces as one of the rarest coins in existence. Passes it around the table. Coin travels back and forth, everyone examining it. And the conversation goes to another topic. All at once, the owner calls for his coin. It is nowhere to be found. Everyone looks at everyone else. First, they suspect a joke. Then it becomes serious. The coin is immensely valuable. Who has taken it? The owner is a gentleman. Does the gentlemanly idiotic thing, of course, laughs as he knows someone is playing a practical joke on him and that the coin will be returned tomorrow. The others refuse to leave the situation so. One man proposes that they all submit to a search. Everyone gives his assent until it comes to the stranger. He refuses, curtly, roughly, without giving any reason. Uncomfortable silence. The man is a guest. No one knows him particularly well, but still he is a guest. One member tries to make him understand that no offense is offered, that the suggestion was simply to clear the atmosphere. The stranger becomes very firm, very proud, and says, I refuse to allow my person to be searched, and I refuse to give the reason for my action. Another silence. The visitor evidently has the coin, but he is their guest, and etiquette protects him. <laughs> nice situation, eh? Huh? Uh, what's the answer? Well, the table is cleared. A waiter removes a dish of fruit, and there, under the ledge of the plate, where it's been pushed, is the coin. But now explanation, eh? Of course. Solutions always should be. At once, everyone apologizes to him, whereupon the visitor rises and says, Now I can give you the reason for my refusal to be searched. There are only two known specimens of that coin in existence, and the second happens to be here in my vest pocket. Yes, yeah, rather obvious. <laughs> of course, the story is well invented, but the turn to it is very nice. Very nice, indeed. Well, I don't know. Ending is very unsatisfactory. The visitor should have hit on him not another coin, but uh, something absolutely different, something uh, destructive, say, of a, a woman's reputation and a... Great tragedy should have been threatened by the casual misplacing of the coin. Well, I've heard the same story told in a dozen different ways. Oh, it's happened a hundred times. It must continually happen. I know of one extraordinary instance, in fact, the most extraordinary instance of this sort I've ever heard. Peters, you rascal. I see you've been quietly letting us set the stage for you. Well, it's <laughs> not a story that will please everyone. Why not? Because you will want to know what no one can ever know. It has no conclusion, then? Yes and no. As far as it concerns a woman, quite the most remarkable woman I've ever met, the story is complete. All right. Do I know the woman? Possibly. Probably, I should say. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, this should be particularly interesting to you because <clears throat> I believe that most of you are acquainted with the people involved. Uh, the names, of course, are disguised. I think... Uh, yes, I have. Just time before I catch my train to tell it to you. This is... Well, Mrs. Rita Kildare... Inhabited a charming bachelor girl studio. Very elegant. With a duplex pattern and one of the buildings just off Central Park West. She knew very nearly everyone in that indescribable society in New York that's drawn from all levels. And that imposes but one condition for membership. To be amusing. In this mingled society, her invitations were eagerly sought. Her dinners were spontaneous. And the discussions, though gay and usually daring, were invariably under the control of wit and good taste. On the Sunday night of this adventure, she had, according to her custom, sent away her Filipino butler and invited to an informal chafing dish supper seven of her more unusual friends. At seven o'clock, having finished dressing, she put in order her bedroom, which formed a sort of free passage between the studio and a small dining room to the kitchen beyond. Then, going into the studio, she struck a match and was about to light the candlesticks which illuminated the room when the bell rang and a Mr. Flanders, a broker compact, nervously alive, well-groomed, was waiting as she opened the door. Well, you're early. On the contrary, you are late. <laughs> well, in any case, hello, and come inside. Here, let me take your things. Thank you. Well, I'm the first, I suppose. Of course. And since you are, you can be a good boy and help me with the candles. I'm delighted. <sighs> Who's to be here tonight? The Enos Jackson. I thought they were separated. Not yet. How oh, interesting. Only you, dear lady, would dream of serving us a couple on the verge. It is interesting, isn't it? Assuredly. Uh, where did you know Jackson? Through the Warings. Uh, Jackson's a rather doubtful person, isn't he? Uh, well, let's call him a very sharp lawyer. Uh, they tell me, though, he's been gambling pretty much. Indeed. How about yourself? Oh, me? I'm a bachelor. If I lose my shirt, it makes no difference. Is that possible? Probably even. 
Who else is coming? Oh, uh, Maud Lilly. You know her? No, I don't think so. You met her here some time ago, a journalist. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I'd forgotten. Mr. Harris, the clubman, is coming, and the Stanley Cheevers. Stanley Cheevers? Are we going to gamble? Don't tell me you object. <laughs> Certainly not. Only the Cheevers. <laughs> they play quite a game. Yes, well united. <laughs> they have an unusual streak of good luck. <laughs> oh, by the way, it's uh, Jackson, isn't it, who is so attractive to Mrs. Cheever? Quite right. What a charming party. Hey, where does Maud Lily come in? Don't joke. She's in a desperate way. And young Harris? Oh, he used to make the salad and cream the chicken. Ah, see the whole party. I, of course, am to add the element of respectability. Of what? Don't play baby with me, my dear Flanders. I apologize. That's better. No one, of course, knows who else is coming. No one, of course. The Stanley Cheevers entered. A short, fat man with a vacant, fat face and slow-moving eye. And his wife, voluble, nervous, overdressed, and pretty. Mr... Yes, Mr. Harris came in with Maud Lilly. A woman, straight, dark, Indian, great masses of somber hair, held in a little too loosely for neatness, with thick, quick lips and eyes that rolled away from the person who was talking to her. The Enos Jacksons were late, and still agitated as they entered. His forehead had not quite banished the scowl, nor her eyes the scorn. He was of the type that never lost his temper, but caused others to lose theirs. And Mrs. Jackson seemed fastened to her husband by an invisible leash. You looked at her curiously and wondered what such a nature would do in a crisis with a lurking sense of a woman who carried with her her own impending tragedy. As soon as the company had been completed and the incongruity of the selection had been perceived, a smile of malicious anticipation ran the rounds, which the hostess cut short by saying... Well, well, now that everyone's here, this is the order for the night. You can quarrel all you want, you can whisper all the gossip you can think of about one another, but everyone is to be amusing. Also, everyone is to help with dinner. Nothing formal, nothing serious. We may all be bankrupt, divorced, or dead tomorrow, but tonight we'll be gay. That's the invariable rule of the house. <laughs> Get on with the cooking. Uh, Harris, I need you. Right with you. May I be of any help? Thank you, my dear. Oh, Mrs. Cheever, you might come along, too. All right. This is an adorable bedroom. Oh, thank you, dear. Uh, now for my apron. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, tie me up in the back, will you please, Maud? Of course. There you are. Fine, thanks. Now, just let me get my rings off, and I'll be all ready to go to work. Oh, this is such a lovely apartment, Mrs. Kildare. Thanks. Soap and water always seem to do it. Ah, there. Your rings are so beautiful. They are nice, aren't they? But there's only one that's very valuable, the sapphire. Oh, it's beautiful. Let me see. Oh, it must be very valuable. It cost 10000 six years ago. It's been my talisman ever since. For the moment, however, I'm a cook. You're not going to leave the rings there. Why, of course. Now, I'm the cook. Uh, Maud Lily, you're the scullery maid. Harris is the chef, and we're all under his orders. Mrs. Cheever, mm. did you ever peel onions? Oh, good heavens, no. <laughs> well, there are no onions peeled. <laughs> all you have to do is help set the table. Under their hostess's gay guidance, the seven guests began to circulate busily through the rooms, laying the table, grouping the chairs, opening bottles, and preparing the material for the chafing dishes. Mrs. Kildare, in the kitchen, ransacked the icebox and with her own hand shredded the chicken and measured the cream. Flanders, carry this in carefully. Cheever, stop watching your wife and put the salad bowl on the table. <laughs> Everything ready, Harris? All set. All right, uh, everyone sit down. I'll be right in. She went into her bedroom, took off her apron and hung it in the closet. Then going to her dressing table, she drew the hat pin around which were her rings from the pincushion and carelessly slipped them on her fingers. But all at once, she frowned and looked quickly at her hand. Only two rings were there. The third ring, the sapphire, was missing. Stupid. She said to herself and returned to her dressing table. Immediately, she stopped. She remembered quite clearly putting the hat pin through the three rings. 
She made no attempt to search further, but remained without moving, her fingers slowly drumming on the table. Who had taken the ring? Each of her guests had had a dozen opportunities in the course of the time she'd been busy in the kitchen. She ran over their characters and their situations as she knew them. Strangely enough, at each, her mind stopped upon some reason that might explain a sudden temptation. To find out nothing this way. That's not the important thing to me just now. The important thing is to get the ring back. And slowly, deliberately, she began to walk back and forth, her clenched hand beating the deliberate, rhythmic measure of her journey. Five minutes later, as Harris, installed as chef over the chafing dish, was giving directions, spoon in the air, Mrs. Kildare came into the room like a lengthening shadow. Her entrance had been made with scarcely a perceptible sound, and yet each guest was aware of it at the same moment, with a little nervous start. Heavens! Heavens, dear lady, you come in on us like a Greek tragedy. What is it you have for us? A surprise? I have something to say to you. Mr. Enos Jackson. Yes, Miss Kilder? Kindly do as I ask you. Well, certainly. Go to the door. Go to the door? Please. Yes? Lock it. And bring me the key. There you are. You've locked it? As you wish me to. Thank you. Now, the bedroom door. Would you do the same? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Cheever. Yeah? Would you blow out all the candles except the candelabra on the table? Blow out all the candles? Except the candelabra. All right. Oh, for goodness sake, Mrs. Kildare. What is it? I am getting terribly worked up. My, my nerves are all sorry, Mrs. Jackson. That's the last candle. All right. Now listen. My sapphire ring has just been stolen. Oh, you don't mean it. The ring's been taken within the last 20 minutes. I'm not going to mince words. The ring has been taken, and the thief is among you. But Mrs. Kilgare, is it possible? Yes, Mrs. Cheever. There's not the slightest doubt. Three of you were in the bedroom when I placed my rings on the pincushion. Quite true. I was in the room when she took them off. The sapphire ring was on top. Each of you has passed through there a dozen times since. My sapphire ring is gone, and one of you has taken it. I'm not going to miss words. I'm not going to stand on ceremony. But I'm going to have my ring back. Listen to me carefully. I'm going to have that ring back. And until I do, not a soul shall leave this room. I don't care who's taken it. All I want is my ring. Now, I'm going to make it possible for whoever took it to restore it without possibility of detection. The doors are locked and will stay locked. I'm going to blow out the remaining candles in the candelabra, and we're going to count 100 slowly. It'll be in absolute darkness. No one will know or see what's done. But if, at the end of that time, the ring is not here on the table, I shall telephone the police and have everyone in this room searched. Am I quite clear? Everyone take his place about the table and uh, remain standing, please. That's it. That'll do. Now, I'll blow out the candles and count 100. No more, no less. Remember, either I get that ring, or everyone in this room will be searched. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine... 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. Put snapped off the chair, I'm sorry. 
47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, the ring. 74, well, there it is. On the 75, is. 76, yes. 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, oh, really? 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100. Well, well, there it is there. Mr. Cheever, you may hand it to me. Well, now that that's over, we can have a very gay little supper. The light, someone. And there you are, gentlemen. All I say, Peters, that's not all. Absolutely. The story ends there? Story ends there. But uh, who took the ring? <laughs> what? You never found out? Never. No clue? None. I'm not sure I like the story. Uh, it's no story at all. Permit me, it is a story. And it is complete. In fact, I consider it unique because it has none of the banalities of a solution and leaves the problem even more confused than at the start. Well, I don't of see... Of course you don't see, my dear Enkin. You do not see that any solution would be commonplace, whereas no solution leaves an extraordinary intellectual problem. Well, how so? Well, in the first place, whether the situation actually happened or not, which is in itself a mere triviality... Peters has constructed it in a masterly way, the proof of which is that he has made me listen. Any of those present might have taken the ring. There are therefore seven solutions, all possible and all logical. But beyond this is left a great intellectual problem. How so? Was it a woman who lacked the necessary courage to continue? Or was it a man who repented his first impulse? Is a man or is a woman the greater natural criminal? Oh, that's simple, Quinny. A woman took it, of course. Well, on the contrary, it was a man for... The second action was more difficult than the first. The man, certainly. The restoration of the ring was a logical decision. You see? Personally, I incline to a woman for the reason that a weaker feminine nature is strangely susceptible to the domination of her own sex. There you are. We could meet and debate the subject year in and year out and never agree. Uh, I, I recognize most of the characters, Peters. Uh, Mrs. Kildare, of course, is all you say of her. An extraordinary woman. The story is quite characteristic of her. Flanders, I'm not sure of, but I think I know it. I'm positive I do. Did it really happen? Exactly as I told it. The only one I don't recognize is Harris, your humble servant. What? You, Peters? You were there? I was there. I was Harris. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Oh, yes, what is it, John? Mr. Peters, sir, your train. You told me to remind you. Oh, thank you. Yes, I didn't know it was so late. Will you gentlemen pardon me? Huh? Oh, yes, sir. Nice to meet you all. Night. Curious chap. Extraordinary. Well, now, I... I wonder. I wonder if we're wondering the same thing, gentlemen. <laughs> And so, with the enigmatic smile of Mr. Peters, or Harris, ends 100 in the Dark, Owen Johnson's smooth story which gave us tonight's... Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. Tonight's radio drama was written by Jack Anson Fink, directed by John Dietz, and scored by Bernard Herman. Eric Dressler was Mr. Peters, Alice Frost played Mrs. Kildare, and Ted Osborne, Quinny. Others in the cast were Helen Lewis, Joan Shea, Henriette Kay, Frank Reddick, Paul Luther, Stephen Schnabel, Ian Martin, and Barry Kroger. With this evening's performance, Columbia brings to a conclusion the present series of Suspense. If you like these broadcasts, CBS would be pleased to hear from you. Suspense has been a series presented for your relaxation and enjoyment by the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> Yeah.
suspense. thrill of the nighttime, the hushed voice and the prowling step, the crime that is almost committed, the finger of suspicion pointing perhaps at the wrong man, the stir of nerves at the ticking of the clock, the rescue that might be too late or the murderer who might get away, mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. We invite you to enjoy stories that keep you in suspense. For suspense, tonight we present The Lord of the Witch Doctors by John Dixon Carr. The drums were beating that night. The Lord of the Witch Doctors was on his way. Twenty miles off the East African coast, tanned by the blistering heat of the Indian Ocean lies the island of Zanzibar. Here, many years ago... To be exact, in the year 1889. Three nations were rivals for trade with the Imperial German Eagle. At Mogadishu for the Italians. A mixed population boiled along that coast, Portuguese, Arabs, Swahili. On the island itself, Sayyid Khalif, Sultan of Zanzibar, ruled the remains of a once mighty empire. Mohammedan Bantus of the tribe of Zeng. Look over there in the moonlight. That white building, patched and rotted, was the palace where Sayyid Khalif lived with his fat wives and his captive lion. <laughs> Not far away on the hill overlooking the harbor stood the British residency. The British resident, or crown official, held uneasy sway against German and Italian influence. And at the residency on that hot night long... Martha. Yes, Father. Uh, come away from the windows, please. But, Father, those drums are on the mainland. Never mind. Twenty miles from here. I'd rather you stood back. It's the fires I don't like, sir. You can see the red light all this distance. They're having a beano of some kind. You'd better stand back, too, Mr. Harris. Oh, look here, sir. Yes, Mr. Harris? I've been your diplomatic attaché in this place for three years. Couldn't you call me by my first name in private? Just as you please. Lower the sun blinds and turn down the wick of that lamp. You don't think there's any danger? There's no danger whatever, but... Yeah, it don't seem terribly restless tonight. Only natural, my dear, with the drums going. Everybody seems restless. This has been going on for days. You begin to get in your nerves. So you feel it too, eh? And I do wish they had Carly wouldn't tease Nero. Jab at him with a meat fork and that kind of thing. If that lion ever got loose... Oh, nerves, my dear, nothing but nerves. Well, let's face it, sir. There's something very queer going on over on that mainland. Well, suppose there is. All we know is what Nyoka knows. This great witch doctor, whoever he is, has been making a triumphal progress to the coast. The whole bush is afraid of him. You alarm me. Nyoka says he's got horns. He can make himself seven feet tall, like stretching an accordion. Oh, really, Bill Harris? I don't say I believe it. I say it might be dangerous. Now, for instance, could this be one of Dr. Schmidt's tricks? Dr. Schmidt is a friend of ours. Yes, he's also head of the German East Africa Company. And Dr. Schmidt is a gentleman. Look at that coast over there. He's got every native chief in his pocket. Dr. Smith assured me that the German emperor has no more territorial claims in East Africa. We get our trade concessions from Saeed Khalif. Saeed's our only friend, but we can't even be sure of him. The Germans give him trade gin and a grand piano. The Italians give him three new wives for his harem. What do we give him? I have no instructions from London about the situation in this island. No. Somebody in Whitehall probably forgot to post them. For the last time, Mr. Harris, I will not hear His Majesty's government criticized like that. Sorry, sorry. Uh, the, these things take time. If there's any danger, we'll be notified in due course. Yes, sir. Well, they're only our own natives. They beat their own drums, you know. Somebody went past that window. That's probably only Nyoka, my dear. Surely you're not afraid of our own servant. No, but I... Master! Nyoka, listen to me. Don't hang on to that big curtain. You'll pull it down. Now stand up straight and tell me. What is it? He here, Bona. He here, yes, please. Who's here? Big witch doctor here, yes, please. He come up past the moonlight. He walks slow, boom, boom. He got big teeth eat with the outside front door now. What was that? The drums have stopped. Nyoka's 
right, sir. We have got a visitor. There's somebody coming down the hall. Better turn down that lamp, Martha. I, I can't seem to find the lamp. My fingers are all plumb. There's a revolver in the table drawer behind you, sir. I don't need it. Stand perfectly still, all of you. Now, please, friends all, don't be alarmed. Are you English? That's right, miss. Born and bred in Stratton. Hey, which of you is the British consul? I am the British resident, sir. My name is Richardson. May I ask the meaning of this Tom Fuller? Well, that's just what I'm here to tell you. Or maybe I'd better show you. Now, observe me right hand. I hold it up so, and as I live, a lighted cigar. But perhaps the lady doesn't like smoking in the drawing room. Now, look here. There's nothing up my sleeves. I wouldn't deceive you for the world. I turn over me hand, and would you believe it? A glass of water. Is this man insane? Father... I think he's trying to tell you he's a magician. That's right, miss. Direct from the Egyptian hall, Piccadilly. Animal taming and magic. That's my line. Then you're the famous witch doctor that's got all the natives in an uproar? Nobody else, young fella. Yes, well, you tell us what you mean by this nonsense. Scaring everybody when there's no danger. No danger? I suppose you haven't heard about Sayed Caliph and his Gatling guns? Gatling guns? Kindly presented by Dr. Otto Schmidt. And believe me, all you've got is an appointment with a Gatling gun. Unless my nonsense steps in. Here, take a look at this. What, you can't be from the British Foreign Office? Well, that's just what I am, Governor, and going up in the world, don't you think? <laughs> By the way, I'd better give you your instructions. The envelope's pretty dirty and a little bit smelly from being under my furs and devil paint, but... Uh... Read it, sir. Go on and read it. Foreign Office, Whitehall, British Consul, Zanzibar. Bearer of this letter, the great Mephisto... That's me. Real name, Barney Hicks. <laughs> They must be out of their minds. Are they? Listen, old man. I've been three weeks in that jungle with a Swahili interpreter. I've been bitten and stung and fried to death. But Schmidt or no Schmidt, I've got those native chiefs just where I want them. You see what happens when I announce I'm a friend of the great white queen? Why, you'll have a meeting out of your hand. Well, that's true. And all we've got to do is get around, say, Kelly, here on this island. But do we need to get around him? Hey, young lady, be good enough not to speak until you're spoken to. Oh, I'm sorry, father. Say, it may be lazy in the fat of the hippopotamus. He's rather a fine old boy. Is he? You said something about Gatling guns. Now, listen. Here's the game. Father, I don't like this. I've never heard Nero's reckless as that. Never mind, Nero. Go on. Well, I came over here tonight in a steam launch. Tomorrow I'm paying my state visit to the great Sultan Sayyid Caliph. Now, you present me as your friend. And a friend of the great white queen. And I do my best tricks and... <laughs> Is anything wrong with your native boy? Now you've got to be still. You're not afraid of our witch doctor friend, are you? No, I could question. Yeah, what are you doing? Come out from under that sofa. But, Juana, I see something. I look out the window slats. See Juana Baldhead coming up past. Juana Baldhead? That's Dr. Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt? Well, he mustn't find me here. Yes, I quite agree. This is, this is most irregular. Is there a back way out of here? Yes, through that arch. Stay in the back room. Now, I'll show you. Me go with witch doctor. Yes, honey, please. I don't like... Never I mind what you like. like. You go. All right, master. It's all right. They've gone. Yes, about time, too. Well, good evening, Dr. Schmidt. Pleasure to see you. Always a pleasure to see you. Ah, uh, my friends. I wish I could say it was such a pleasure to see you. Isn't it, Doctor? It is at any time but now. Uh, do not mistake me, I beg of you. No, it is that confounded line, Nero. Always I say it will happen, and now it has happened. What about Nero? My friends, I regret. Yes, meat is killed. Yes, tasted blood. <clears throat> What's that? Uh, you would permit that I sit down and take off my sun helmet... I am not young, and I'm tired. It's not saying, Kelly. Yeah, yeah, it is so. Yes, tease that line once too often. Oh, poor old boy. He was our friend. He's not dead. Yeah, yeah, I regret. Yeah, he is dead. Sultan of sense of our state. Oh, God. But how did the lion ever get at him? He drank too much pumba. That was his trouble. He got drunk and think he can do too much. So he opened the door and went to the lion's cage. Into the cage? Yeah, would you believe it? Not easily, but it is true. Over to Paris, there's what you call gnashing of teeth. The sun notice in tears. Did you see this happen, Doctor? No, no, no. I, I go there later and they tell me. It, it's all of us because of some foolish toy, tomb head toy, that he has been struck over the head and thrown into the cage by someone who did not like him. Well, that's more likely, if you ask me. My friend, it is foolishness. Everybody liked old man. He was a father to his people and a kind friend. Doctor, are you telling us that, say, may, may have been put into that cage unconscious? It is what one African the soldier says, yeah. Well, then he may still be alive. Alive? It is impossible. What's well, more than possible? A lion may maul an unconscious man, but it doesn't often kill him. 
This is vital. Vital to Saeed himself and others as well. You're a doctor. Can't you go and make sure? My friend, I regret. I am not that kind of a doctor. Harris, you may be right. I think I'd better go myself. Is this a good idea, sir? I'll stay here and uh, entertain Dr. Schmidt. Unless, of course, he wants to go. Uh, no, no, no. I, I thank you. I, I do not like sights of that sort. I, I have a tender heart and I have illnesses. Besides, you can do nothing. I tell you, he is dead. Yes, we'll see. Uh, Martha, you'd better come with me. Your nurse's training may be of some use at last. Of course. Um, hadn't we better go the back way and speak to Nyoka? Yes. Nyoka mustn't be troubled in that back room. Very good evening to you, Dr. Schmidt. Ah, uh, Mr. Harris. They have good hearts, but they're so foolish. I would give my own right arm to that poor man. Well, well they must have philosophy. They must cheer up. Bad. Yes. Now, Doctor, we're all alone. So we are. So we are. We must sit down and have a nice, comfortable chat. Yes? Definitely, yes. Oh. I wanted to uh, have a word with you anyway. Ah, so? About what, Mr. Harris? Oh, various things. I am happy to give you all the time in the world. I, I like talking to young people. It makes me feel young again myself. Like, uh, Noby? No, the Sayyid Caliph's eldest son, the new sultan. Ah, one fine young man who are savage. Yes, but uh, weak, easy to manage, and very fond of his father, too. It's a wonder he didn't have the lion shot after they got the body away. <laughs> shot with butt, my friend. <laughs> I beg your pardon, him, and I, I do not consider the matters funny. No, no, no. I, but uh, shot with what? These brutes, they have nothing but muzzle-loading muskets. You're near with those? No. Suppose they had Gatling guns. Pardon? Uh, just suppose that, of course. Of course. Well? Ah, my friend. Gatlings would be of no better use. You only wound. To kill a line, you must reach the eye or heart with a high-power bullet. What is the matter with us? Why are we talking of these things? Talking of death, you mean? Of Sayyid Khalif, who gave all the trade concessions on Zanzibar to the British? My friend, I was talking about express rifles. Look here, don't you find it warm in here? Yeah, yeah, a little. Yes, it uh, smells of animals' fur, doesn't it? I'll just raise those sun blinds. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, you must not trouble yourself to do that. It's no trouble. I, I, I beg of you not to trouble. It, it is not necessary. Doctor, you've been mopping your forehead ever since you've been here. A little fresh air never hurt anybody. Here. Here. Isn't that better? Much. Much. Uh, why not sit down, my boy, and we have a nice chat. Fine enough night. No smell of the animal's cage here. <laughs> my friend, you talk like a hunter. Yes. Or a victim. Yes, a fine night. At least for this part of the world. Fire's still burning on the mainland. I wonder if that's a good sign. A what? I wish I knew. And the sea is like skim milk under the moon. And... Good Lord. What is it? What makes you jump? Look there, in the harbor. My friend, I see nothing. Perhaps if I take off my spectacles and vibe... Why, man, you must see it. In the harbor, out at the left there, beyond the shadow of those big palm trees. Don't you see our riding lights? It looks... By George, it is. It's a warship. It is only a German gunboat, my friend. Only a very little German gunboat. German gunboat? My friend, you must not be so distrustful. Uh, that is not kind. Uh, let me get a telescope. But I tell you who she is. It is nothing. She is on what you call a goodwill tour. You are not angry. Angry? <laughs> now, my friend. Well, I, I did not know. I, I could not guess. Uh, that is uh, the England that our heart understands. We know that ourselves. I, I, I tell you something in confidence. The Germans are sensitive. The British objected, the natives feel too strong, I tell the gunboat to go away. I fire an express rifle, it has a sound, boom. You cannot mistake one another. That is why I think of an express rifle. But if nobody will object... Why, I... not the least bit. Tell me, Doctor, do you like it here on this island? Well, just not barely. Don't you ever want to get away from a forsaken mud heap like this? My friend... I am a chairman. My duty is here, as so I stay here. Yes, I know. Between ourselves, that's exactly my position. But you are young. That's not the point. 
It's the importance of the job. In the British don't rule Zanzibar. We hold the trade concessions from Saeed Khalif, and our residency has to protect them. But even you, Doctor, would be surprised at the amount of trade that we have to protect and the revenue that comes out of this island. So now, you don't say so. I do say so. You say it so much? More than you think. Of course, <laughs> I'm not allowed to give you any figures. No, 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 of course not. I, I would not dream of asking you. How, how much would you say it comes to roughly? Oh, come now, Doctor. As one gentleman to another, you're not asking me to give away secrets. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it was only a joke, you understand? Uh, please do not try to uptrip me. I, I, I would try to pull your leg, and uh, it was only a joke, believe me. Yeah. <laughs> it's all in the game, isn't it? Yes, all in the game, as gentlemen. Oh, uh, doctor, you're quite a humorist. Uh, you are not defended, not at all. No, as I was saying, I uh, hold a rather important job. Of course, Mr. Richardson holds an even more important one. He's been very friendly with old Saeed Khalifa on this job. Um... Of course, you know what that job is. Of course. He's the British consul. What is the matter with you? You're not smiling any longer. Why are you looking at me like that? So that's it. That's the game. You made exactly the same mistake that he did. <laughs> I suit it. Dr. Schmidt, have you met the great lord of the witch doctors... The maker of spells and the tamer of lions. I am a good Christian. I pay no attention to what natives say. I, I, I do not believe in witch doctor. No, neither do I. Not in this one, at any rate. What one? The witch doctor who came here tonight and said that he was on a mission for the British Foreign Office. He's an imposter from the word go, and you're working with him. Oh, don't upset your chair like that, Dr. Schmidt. Because if you fall on it, you may hurt yourself. I have not hurt myself, young man. Oh, yes, you have. The fellow who came here tonight addressed Mr. Richardson as the British Consul. That might have been a slip of the tongue. But then you see the letter on the table there? I have my sight, I thank you. That letter is supposed to come from the foreign office. And it calls him the British consul, too. I heard it read aloud. The foreign office may make mistakes. But they don't make mistakes like that. That letter, doctor, is a forgery. It was forged by a German and probably by the German who calls himself Barney Hicks. Or the great Mephisto. He's in the back room now. No, he's not, Governor. He's standing in the doorway behind you now. Yes, I thought I heard you. But don't turn around to look at me. I'm just warning you. Have you got anything to enforce that? Yes. I've got a 500 express rifle that could smear you all over the opposite wall. Kurt, Pastor Aki Matust, no, put don't the cannon. Don't, 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 don't. Well, if you fellows are going to shoot me, I wish you'd speak English about it. Carl, I beg of you. No, no, no. Don't fire that rifle. Exactly. You see, Carl, I'm turning around. This is all day. Uh, now, now, Carl. You see what the doctor means, Carl? If you fire that rifle, you'll send your gunboat out of that harbor just when you need it. Isn't that the signal, Doctor? To send the gunboat away? Carl, I take up. Yes, it is. Very simple, economical German signal. So, you two killed Saeed Khalif. That is slender. That cannot be proved. Had to do it, I imagine. Saeed was the one chief that you couldn't buy or frighten with your witch doctor, so you got rid of him. Tomorrow morning, the witch doctor would have appeared. He'd have scared the daylights out of a weak and superstitious son, Noby. I and... told you I was fairly good at my work, Governor. And I am. Yes. And then the witch doctor would have taken over everything. The British resident had to be bamboozled for 24 hours to keep him out of the way with a ghost story about a, a British agent. And there was a gunboat in the harbor in case of trouble. Slight mistake there, Governor. There is a gunboat in the harbor. Yes. It's really worked out beautifully. The emperor should be pleased. I don't think your white queen will be very happy, though. I'm the great witch doctor to that frightened mob over there. Say it is dead. And there's a German gunboat in the arbor. Listen. I think I hear something. Whoever's out there, stay back. Whoever's out there, stay back. Yeah. Listen to me. Say it's alive. He's alive. This is impossible. We can see him breathe. We don't even think he's badly hurt, but he's still in the cage, unconscious. Still... In the cage? You mean they can't get him out of there? If he wakes up or they attempt anything nearer, we'll tear him to pieces. The whole crowd over there is nearly crazy, but they don't dare go into the cage. Well, gentlemen, you should have been more careful. If they do get Saeed out of there alive, you're done for. Be quiet. Listen. Nobody and the rest of the natives are coming up here now. See here, miss. Are you talking about the old boy's son? Nobody, yes. He wants to see the witch doctor. The witch doctor? This puts you in some slight trouble, Carl. Uh, listen to me, miss. I couldn't get that old buzzard from the, the way from the mat line, even if I... Oh, I've got to get out of here. Too late now, my dear witch doctor. The natives have surrounded the house. Who's that? It's Noby. He's coming down the hall. 
I know me. Speak white language. Carry salt and swan. Which, Doctor? Much respect. Fall and floor. Go ahead. Play your part, Carl. Play your ruddy part. Get up again. Great medicine man. Father hurt. In cage with the lion. You come. Say something, Carl. You can't be a dumb wizard. You come. My dear Nobi, my friend. The witch doctor can't understand you. Be hey, witch doctor. Not speak everything. But witch doctor. No, no. It is not that. He does not hear you. He's in another world. See, see, see how his eyes close. See how he say. I know this. He saved my father. Or maybe all of you. We will kill all white people here. Witch doctor saved my father from lion. You come. Nobby, listen to me. You needn't worry. The great witch doctor can save your father. Go in cage? No, not go in cage. Strike with fire? Yes, that's it. Strike with wizard fire. Open heaven. Flash great light. Narrow scream and die. Father, save. Carl, you must not save him. We remain alive, he will talk. Then the natives will know. You not want to save father? The witch doctor does want to save your father, Nobi. You see that gun under his arm? Gun? Gun no good. Not use gun. Only wound lion. Lion in pain till father. No, that's not like your muskets, Nobi. It's an express gun. It's... It's a magic gun. Magic gun? Listen, Nobi. Magic gun save your father with one shot. Just like that. Lion fall over dead. Your father well again. And our friend. We use gun? Give me gun. No, you could not use it, Nobi. Which doctor can use it best? Tell him to use it. Tell him to be sure that he hits the lion. Oh, look here, Harris. I don't know for this. Yes, Novi. If he wants to hit Nero with that white fire, he can strike the lion dead before you could wink your eyes. Then do. You'd better try it, Carl. And you'd better not miss him, or you know what'll happen to every white person in this room. My hands are shaking. I... A magician with shaky hands? That won't do. I take your shoulder. You follow. Yala, Ngombo! All come. By palace door. All fought over the river, right as day. Thousand torches, all make light. Now do. Now do. See how quiet they get when Nobi raises his hand. They're praying. So are we. We won't do it. We better. I told you that. They're out of hand now. If you miss, you're no witch, Doctor. And if you had any thought of hitting Saeed instead, just imagine what they do to you. I can't see. These torches blind me. You do. I think the old man's moving. If he stirs, the lion will kill him. You know what that means. That's right. Up with the rifle. My hands are shaking. Be careful the sights. It's a point blank shot. No. Allah! Focus! All right, Nobi. The lion is dead. They can go in and carry your father out now. Lion dead? German magic. It's great magic. Yes, Selby, it is. But English magic is greater. English magic better than German magic? Yes, Selby. Now prove it. Turn around. Look out towards the harbor. I stand here. I wave my hand like this. Nothing up my sleeves. I wouldn't deceive you for the world. I wave my hand towards the gunboat in the bay. The gunboat sails away. English magic, Nobi. English magic. And so ends the Lord of the Witch Doctors. Tonight's story of... Suspense.
Next Tuesday, when CBS again brings you Suspense, our story will be The Devil in the Summer House. The broadcast for next week only is scheduled for 10 p.m. Eastern Wartime, a half hour later than usual. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are all collaborators on... Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now let's see. Suspect, suspectant, suspend. Ah, here we are. Suspend. The condition of mental uncertainty, usually accompanied by apprehension or anxiety. Fear of something which is about to occur as, do not keep me any longer in suspense. For our story of suspense tonight, we invite you to enjoy The Devil in the Summer House by John Dixon Carr. Somewhere along the Hudson, perhaps not far from Tarrytown, there is a modest house in its own grounds. Behind it, in a spacious garden, stands a summer house of evil memory. More than 25 years ago, a man shot himself, or at least died, in that summer house. They found Major Kenyon with a scorched bullet hole in his head and a weapon beside him. But we are in the present now. The latticed summer house has grown heavy with vines. And only the other evening, two men came into that garden at twilight, over the shaggy grass, as a storm was brewing along the Hudson. Two men, the lawyer from New York. Who's there? And Captain Burke of the Homicide Squad. Easy, my friend, easy. I was just going to ask you the same thing. My name is Parker. I'm an attorney. You're not... Captain Burke. Yeah, the very same and no other. I thought I recognized you, Mr. Parker. Must be something important to bring you so far from New York at this time of night. I was in Tarrytown anyway. I thought there'd be a housekeeper here. But I don't see any light. You've got business here? Yes, in a way. Have you? I don't know. I'll tell you better after you tell me what brought you to a place that no one has lived in for ten years. Tell me, Captain. Did you ever get an anonymous letter from a dead man? Did you? No, I can't say I did. The letter's anonymous. How do you know the man's dead? Because they're all dead. Every last one of them. Dead and under the ground where they can't be hurt any longer. Look. There's the summer house where Jerry Kenyon used to work. There are the windows of the library and the dining room. Looking good. Confound this lightning. Makes the windows blaze, don't it? Jerry Kenyon hadn't a care in the world. Yet he shot himself. I'll show you the letter. Now, look, Mr. Parker, I couldn't read anything in this light. But if we can get inside the house... Certainly now... we can get into the house. I was the family attorney. I've got the keys. Why should a dead person send me a letter? You got a flashlight, I see. Came here prepared for anything, eh? This is the library. There were always candles on the mantel. Uh, yes, there they are. Have you a match, Captain? Oh, yes, I'll light them. Uh, that's better. Same old heavy furniture. 
Same old thick carpet, same old globe map. Oh, I'm Mr. Parker. This letter that you were talking about. Yeah. Read it. Hey, wait a minute. This thing is dated November 2nd, 1918. That's right, and be careful of that paper. You see how old it is? But it was mailed yesterday. From where? I don't remember. I didn't keep the envelope. Read it. Dear Joe. In case you didn't know it, I am Joe. Dear Joe, if you want to know how Major Kenyon really died... But we know how he died. It was suicide. Are you sure it was? Whoever wrote this letter doesn't seem to think so. If you want to know how Major Kenyon really died, look in the third drawer of the desk in the library. Press hard at the back of the drawer. Yours very truly. That's not signed. That's right. Now, you're sure you don't know who wrote that letter? This is the first time I've been back in this room, Captain. It was almost a home to me once. There's the chair where Isabel sat on the afternoon it happened. Isabel was Jerry Kenyon's wife, beautiful woman. There's the door that the maid let me in by that afternoon. You know, Captain, it seems to me they're all here tonight. Oh. We stand beneath the sounding rafter, and the walls around us are bare as they echo our peals of laughter. It seems that the dead are there. Yet we stand to our glasses steady. You know it? I was in my school reader. How does the rest of it go? Yet we stand to our glasses steady and drink to our comrade lies. Here's a glass to the dead already. Hurrah for the next that dies. Excuse me, Captain. I don't know what's come over me talking that way. I was very fond of these people. Are you going to look in the desk drawer? This is a lot of nonsense. Then why are you here, Mr. Parker? Jerry Kenyon was always a happy man. At least that's what I always thought. Big, boisterous fellow. Yeah. He had a good position with Vitaton. You know, the phonograph company. Yeah, sure, I know. But he'd just been made a major in the army. 1917. There was a war on then, too, if you remember. I remember. To make the world safe for democracy. Old days. Old heartaches. Old memories. I remember that blazing hot day in August. When all the windows were up. I remember this room. And Isabel... That was Jerry's wife, sitting in that chair, knitting. I remember... Oh, yes, Kitty. What is it? There's a man to see you, Miss Cannon. He says his name's Parker. Yes, I'm expecting him. Show him in, please. All right, ma'am. So I take your knitting in your knitting bag? Why should you take my knitting? I don't know, Miss Kenyon. I just wondered. You can come in now. Thank you. Hello, Joe. Hello, Isabel. You sent for me? Joe, I must apologize for Kitty. Servants are getting to be a problem nowadays. She looks pretty enough to get along. Oh, Kitty's got large ideas. She wants to go on the stage, if you please, and do imitations, like Miss Draper. She only knew how hard it was acting all your life. Isabel, you've been crying. I have not. At least... Is that why you sent for me? I missed you. You haven't been here in over a week, Joe. I had an idea Jerry was getting a little tired of having me around this house. Oh, no, Joe. Why, Jerry... Yes, what about Jerry? I wish I knew, Joe. That's why I wanted you here. Where is he, by the way? I want to say goodbye to him before he leaves. He's probably out in the summer house where he works with all those papers. He's got a lot of work to catch up with. He's going overseas tomorrow. Yes, I know. He's out there. He's been out there all day. His last day here. I've been alone. That sounded like a shot. <laughs> yes, it was a shot, Joe. No, dear. It doesn't seem to worry you. <laughs> it's only Paul. Jerry's brother, Paul. Oh. Thought you'd gotten him off your hands for so good. Jerry asked him out. He got here two nights ago. That doesn't make it any easier for you, does it? No, I don't mind. Jerry's fixed him up with a pistol range in the cellar. Paul's a terribly bad shot. Not like the rest of us. <laughs> You don't seem to like it, Joe. Uh, shall I have Kitty go down and tell him? No, 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 it's terrible. As long as he keeps away. Poor Joe. But, uh, about Jerry, who was it this time? Joe, Jerry's been home five days on leave from camp. 
Well, uh, never mind what camp. But he spent four evenings of those five with... with that Fisk woman. Diane Fisk? The redhead with all the money? Oh, she got money? Well... She must have some attractions, then. Please understand me, Joe. It's not that I'm jealous any longer. It's just that... Oh, no, of course not. Jerry goes his way, and I go mine. I may not be without admirers myself, if it comes to that. You have no idea how true that is, Isabel. You know, uh, I was thinking about Jerry. He may not always be lucky. He may meet some girl who's not as broad-minded as I am. And then when he gives her the go by... Paul must be getting really furious down in that cell. He's not hitting anything. He must be using a lot of ammunition. Now, your trouble, Joe, is that you're too much of a gentleman... And if you really want to see Jerry, uh, there he is now. Where? Uh, just standing in the door of the summer house. Uh, look out the window. And finally bright out there. Doesn't he look noble in his new uniform? Sam Brown belt and revolver and everything. Well, look how he turns around and waves his cap at us. Like a real soldier. Real soldiers don't exactly wave their caps, do they? He does. Uh, Jerry? Jerry? Hello there. Jerry, Joe Parker's here. Ooh. Joe Parker. He wants to see you. Into the summer house again. Not a care in the world, Harry. Now, listen, Isabel, you've got to slow down. You'll be crying again in a minute. Come on over here and sit down. Uh, light hurts my eyes, that's all. Well, then we'll just pull these blinds. We'll still be able to see it. There, how's that? It's better, thanks. Now, can I get you anything? Oh, no. You heard the great white chief's orders. I'm to get you something. Uh, what do you have, Joe? High ball? Don't bother with that. Oh, it's no bother. Everything's out in the dining room here. The ice man didn't deliver today of all days, so I'm afraid I can't give you any ice. I uh, read in the paper yesterday that we're likely to have automatic ice boxes any day now. Uh, you know, uh, things that freeze ice by electricity or something. Uh, do you believe that, Joe? I doubt it. Listen, Isabel. Uh, here you are. Not cold at all. It's the best I could do. Thanks very much. What I wanted to say was... Couldn't you get that brother of yours to give up practicing now? Hasn't he done his good deed for the day? Yes, maybe he has. Uh, I'll ring for Kitty. You don't have to call me, Miss Canyon. I'm here. Oh, yes, Kitty. What is it? Tell me to tell you there's another visitor. This time it's a woman. Lady Kitty. Call her a lady, please. Well, maybe. She says her name's Diane Fisk. Diane Fisk? That's Jerry. Uh, Kitty, tell the lady I'm not in. Lady. <laughs> She's a fine lady. I don't want to show my dear. I don't want to <clears throat> anyway, it's too late, Miss Kenyon. She's coming down the hall now. My dear Mrs. Kenyon. <laughs> How do you do, Diane? This is a friend of ours, Miss Fisk, uh, Miss Parker. Oh, now, I don't want to be too greedy. I don't. I wouldn't have intruded for worlds, especially on a day like this. Isn't it awful? But your husband simply insisted, my dear Mrs. Kenyon, he simply wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> I'm sure he wouldn't. Do you know what he's brought from his office as a surprise? No. A phonograph recording machine. And he's going to let us use it. So that we can all hear ourselves talk twice. How oh, nice. Kenny's name, can't somebody stop that firing? Don't fly off the handle. Take it easy. Now. Kitty. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Would you please go down the cellar and tell Mr. Kenyon's brother he's driving us all crazy. Tell him to stop. Yes, ma'am. My dear Mrs. Kenyon, I do hope I haven't offended you in any way. I, I know I'm a silly little chat about they say people who have red hair often are. <laughs> because at your age, you, you must find the heat very trying. Uh, don't you think we'd all better sit down? I I was very much interested in what Miss Fisk said about our phonograph recording machine. Mrs. Kenyon was just talking about a machine to make ice. Yes, yes. Isn't science wonderful? But I do think it was me to Major Kenyon to invite me out here and then go and fall asleep in the summer house. Did you say fall asleep? Yes, of course. How did you know? Well, I came up the back way and I saw him in the summer house with his head forward on the table, taking a nice little snooze. It's very queer. Of course, you couldn't see much except in the bright light of the door, but I think I saw him there. I didn't disturb him, naturally. But I think I'd better disturb him. Oh, now, please don't trouble on my account. The fact is, my dear, I don't altogether trust myself in this room. A woman of my age has to conserve his strength, you know. So if you'll just excuse me. Well, of course, if you... Oh, dear, I just can't think what I'm always saying, because I, I have the best intentions in the world, Mr. Barker. But, uh, Parker. Oh, yes, Parker, but I do somehow manage to offend people being so dependent and everything. <laughs> Except the men, of course. I couldn't offend you, Mr. Barker, a uh, Parker. <laughs> now, could I? <laughs> Madam, I'm not sure. Well, of course, the person I really came to see was Paul, Mr. Kenyon's brother. He's a little young, of course, but he's joining up next month, and I think we should all do our bit, don't you? <laughs> he has such a pleasant personality. 
I think he likes me. Why, if he walked in at that door this minute... Now, how am I ever going to get any place? Someone's always interrupting my revolver practice just when I'm getting to the point where I can... Oh. What, Paul? Good Lord, are you here again? You're a very untidy object, Paul. Well, that's pretty untidy in the cellar. And dirty. I've got cockroaches on me, so keep away. Did you have a good day shooting? Swell. One of the best. Hit the target? On the only shot that mattered, I hit the target dead center. That sounded like Isabel. I think it was Isabel. Why have you got those blinds down? Get them up. What is it? What's wrong with you? What are you looking at through that window? Twenty-five years ago, Captain Burke, we found Jerry Kenyon lying across the table in the summer house. He'd shot himself through the head with his own revolver in the holster. It was lying on the floor beside him. Shot us, I say. When Isabel found him, he'd been dead about half an hour. The doctors proved that, did they? Yes, that shot had been fired against his head. The front of his uniform cap was powder burned where the bullet entered. There's no doubt about that. None at all. We never noticed the real shot because... because... that young lad was shooting off guns like a maniac in the cellar. Precisely. Now they're all dead. By accident, illness, they're all gone. Isabel Kenyon died less than a year afterwards. I think she died just because she was so fond of Jerry. I suppose you've guessed my little secret. Oh, I think I can sort of read between the lines. You were in love with Isabel Kenyon, weren't you? Well, these things happen. I never let her see it, you understand? Women know, pretty generally. So? They're gone. The youngest of them. And I'm left alone with old tunes, old ghosts, wondering why the fellow ever killed himself. Why? Why? And this morning, out of a clear sky, I get a letter saying, if you want to know how Major Kenyon... Really died? Look in the third drawer of the desk in the library. But I tell you, we know how he died. Well, aren't you going to do it? Naturally. I've got a key somewhere here that fits the drawer. Now, uh, listen, Mr. Parker. In my father's country in Ireland, they got a saying that when a man's going to commit suicide... I thought of doing that, too. Once. Then the devil comes in and takes him by the hand and talks to him. They say you can see the devil as plain as I see you just before you pull the trigger. The devil must have been in the summer house that afternoon. Then. Oh, no, he wasn't. What do you mean, Major Kenyon didn't kill himself. He was murdered. My dear Captain Burke, the police covered all that at the time. Everybody had an alibi. They did, did they? Well, think of what I've told you. Isabel and I were together all the time. Paul, her brother, was shooting off guns in the cellar. Diane Fisk. Yeah, what about her? Her chauffeur who drove her there swore he saw her walk straight up to the place. She passed the summer house, but didn't stop there. Well, that checks. Even Kitty the maid could prove she'd never stirred out of the house until just a minute or so before Isabel went herself. Oh, and why did the maid have to leave the house at all? She was taking Jerry the black coffee he drank every afternoon. He'd already been dead half an hour then. And that, my dear Captain, disposes of everybody. Well, now listen, Mr. Parker. You're a good guy, and I'm not going to hold out on you any longer. You see... I say Major Kenyon was murdered because I know he was murdered. By an outsider? By one of the people in the house. That's impossible. Is it? Well, why don't you open that desk drawer and see? What time is it? Uh, it's a quarter to eight. Quarter to eight? And I haven't got much time. For what? Holy St. Patrick, will you open that drawer? If it's waited 25 years, my friend. It can wait a minute more. I've got the key somewhere, Miss Bunch of Keys. Everything the same. Paul never altered when he inherited. Same old desk, same old phonograph. Same old... I think this is the key. Yeah. It opens. There's nothing here except one or two old newspapers. Everything very dirty. The letter says to press hard at the back. Now, have you tried that? Doesn't seem to. Yes, my George, it does work. Well... There seems to be a movable back on a hinge. Well, what's inside? Uh, uh, some sort of flat, round paper parcel. 
sealed with wax. And about as dirty as it can get. Open it, man. Open it. I'm going to. It's a phonograph record. There's a plain white label. Something on it written in pencil. I don't see too well nowadays without my glasses. Uh, here, give it to me. I'll read it to Just you. Go on. A record of how I killed Jerry Kenyon. Say, hey, don't you get it, Mr. Parker? This is the real goods. The murderer is going to tell us his own story 25 years later. Be careful. Whatever you do, don't drop it. You seem to be interested enough now. I don't say I'm not interested. I say I can't believe it. You know, when you were talking about the dead coming back and that kind of thing, you sure started giving me goose pimples. But that's just what it is, a dead person. Now, there's the phonograph. Put that record on. Let's hear what the ghost says. Any of them could have made the record, of course. The apparatus was all here. Don't just stand there by the phonograph. Will it work? Yes, it works. Is it wound up? Yes, it's wound up. Here it goes. Now, look, Mr. Parker. Whose voice do you think it's going to be? I don't know. Now, I want to warn you. The voice you're going to hear from there... Please, be quiet. Listen. I've started it up. Well? Speak up. Who killed Jerry Kenyon? I killed him, Joe, dear. What's about? I'm sorry about it, Joe. But I had to have you for an alibi. And you were so terribly easy to fool. It's only a phonograph record, man. Don't look at it as if it was alive. You said you and I were always together, Joe. But that wasn't quite true. I left you to go into the dining room and mix a highball, remember? Yes. And I was carrying my big knitting bag. Remember that, too? And there was something else in it besides knitting. I'm an awfully good revolver shot, Joe. I told you we were all good except Paul. And the back windows of the dining room faced the same way as the back windows of the library. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. Jerry was in the summer house. I made a sign to him from the window, and he came to the door there. In bright sunlight, 50 feet away. Joe, don't you know what August heat is in a wooden summer house? Didn't you, didn't anybody see that no man would be wearing a cap inside on a day like that? Jerry had taken his cap off before he went into the summer house. We saw him do it. He was bareheaded when he came to the door. So I lifted the revolver and shot him through the head. Then I dropped the gun back in my knitting bag and went back into the library with your drink. Isabel, don't talk back to the thing, there Mary. You'll drive me screwy. There was in my knitting bag, too. I had to use it. It was a duplicate of Jerry's army camp with a powder-burned hole already fired through it in the place I wanted. Very clever of you, Isabel. So I've been the goat for 25 years. I waited for some time and then slipped out to find the body. I fitted a new cap over Jerry's head in place where it ought to go. I put the old cap in my knitting bag. I took his revolver out of the holster and kept it. The gun that I used, I dropped on the floor beside him. So I proved it was suicide. You see? You proved it to me. Joe. Joe, listen, I... I'm very sick. They tell me I'm going to die. You are dead. Joe, I'm afraid. I'm going out in the dark, and I, I don't know what's there. Don't go away, Isabel. Come Joe. On. Yes, for a Okay, I've had just about enough of this. Joe, I want you to tell everybody about it. I want you to tell them how a poor, crazy woman couldn't stand that man any longer, and how... Ma'am. It's cut off, and it's going to stay cut off. Thank you. I've heard about enough, too. But you can't arrest her now, my friend. You can't arrest her now. After hearing that, I'm not going to arrest anybody. Tell me, Captain. Did you know what was on the record? No. That's why I had to hear it. I knew about it, but I wasn't sure what it had to say. But so help me, I never guessed how hard it would hit you. Man, don't you get it even yet? Yes, I get it. Oh, no, you don't. You don't see anything. That was how the fake suicide was managed, yes. That's just how it was all done, bar one or two little things. Only... Only what? Only it wasn't Isabel Kenyon who committed the murder. Did I hear you correctly? You did? This is another one of your little jokes, I imagine. Can't you let me alone? Have you some kind of personal spite against me? What did I have to do? You're going to hear the real truth now if I have to hold you down in that chair. I know Mrs. Kenyon didn't kill her husband because I've just come from talking to the real murderer up the river. But they're all dead. Oh, no, they're not. And I haven't got much time either. That clock's just going to strike eight. What's the time got to do with it? Good deal if you'll follow me. Mrs. Kenyon died less than a year after her husband, didn't she? Yes. 
But it wasn't Mrs. Kenyon's voice you just heard in that record. What? I'm telling you, the real murderer hated her. Hated her like poison and wanted her blamed for the crime. When Mrs. Kenyon died, the real murderer wrote a letter. Well, but she never mailed that letter. She made a lying record of Isabel Kenyon's voice as evidence. Now you figure it out for yourself. Who was pretty enough to take Major Kenyon's eye and strike back like fury when she got thrown over? Who wanted to go on the stage and do impersonations? Kitty, the maid. Ah, you're talking sense. She shot Jerry from the dining room window. And she couldn't borrow Mrs. Kenyon's knitting bag. She went out to the summer house with a gun and the fake cap wrapped in a napkin and a coffee tray. She did go out, I remember. Actually, she got there before Mrs. Kenyon did. But the summer house was dark inside and Mrs. Kenyon never noticed her. The next day, Kitty wrote that letter, but she couldn't bring herself to send it. So she kept that letter till the day before yesterday... Then one of the boys at Sing Sing... Wait a minute. ...thinking he was doing her a kind action, put a stamp on it and mailed it. Did you say Sing Sing? Yes. They're electrocuting her tonight for the murder of an Italian down at Collier's Hook. I found out about the record, all right. But the one thing I wasn't sure of was this, that she had done the job alone. Now, frankly, the way you acted, I thought that you might have been in on it, too. Well, oh, that's why I had to hear it through. And it was anything but a joke. And now, here it goes to blazes forever. Eight o'clock. Now, she's dead. So ends The Devil in the Summer House. Tonight's story of... Suspense. The part of Mr. Parker was played by Martin Gable. Again next Tuesday... At 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime, a story dedicated to the thrill of the nighttime, the hushed voice and the prowling step. Another adventure in suspense. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Nighttime, the hushed voice and the prowling step, the stir of nerves at the ticking of the clock, the rescue that might be too late, the crime that is almost committed, mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventures. We invite you to enjoy stories that keep you in suspense. Can a man stake his life against $25,000? Can another and cleverer man track him down like a hunter, stalking his prey and kill him within five hours? Can you make a bet with death and win? For suspense, tonight we present Will You Make a Bet with Death by John Dixon Carr. <laughs> On a summer day. There's the beach, bright colored with bathing suits. There's the boardwalk, all straw hats and summer dresses. There's the Ferris wheel and the roller coasters. There's, there is all humanity eating hot dogs and having a good time. And over there, beyond that souvenir shop, is the haunted mill. You get into a little boat. You float through a narrow tunnel into the dark while witches scream. But that fools nobody. Does it? There couldn't be any real terror. Could there? While the bands are playing and the crowd goes by and... 
Hey, you need that fraction. It hurts me to see you stand there and miss this. Only ten cents, one dime, the ten part of a dollar to go through the old haunt and kneel and get the thrill of your life. An overstatement, if you ask me. One ticket, please. Did you say one ticket, lady? That's right, one ticket. What's the thrill? A big pardon, lady. I said, what's the thrill? Lady, the gals who come here with their boyfriends don't have to ask that. Ten cents, please. This way and mind the gate. Thank you. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. Get your ticket for the old haunt and kneel where ghosts will walk and call to... Give me some tickets. Uh, just a minute, young fella. I know you want to get into the old haunt and kneel, but there's plenty of time. How many tickets? I don't know. <laughs> you better give me ten. Ten tickets. You hear that, ladies and gentlemen? Here's a young fella who likes the old haunt and kneel so much. He buys ten tickets. Don't call everybody's attention. Listen, I've got a better idea. Whatever boat comes after mine, yeah. I'll give you an extra dollar to send that boat through empty. Now, what's the matter, son? The cops I ain't after you, are they? No, 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 no. It's nothing like that. Will you do it? Well, money talks, young fellow. Okay, go ahead. Isn't there an empty boat here? Well, really? You've got such a great objection to riding in the same boat with me? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean that at all. Don't misunderstand. Then you'd better get in if you want to go. This boat's starting to move. <laughs> yeah, I, I... I better sit down. You certainly had. Look here, I, I... I want to apologize. That's quite unnecessary. This place is rather childish anyway, isn't it? Yes. Isn't it? But I've seen everything else, so I may as well see this. Here we go in the dark. <laughs> oh, what was that? Uh, one of the ghosts, I imagine. From a machine. It sounded like him laughing. There isn't anybody in the boat behind us, is there? Oh, I can't see. It's pitch dark. Listen, Miss... Uh, uh, Miss... My name is Andrews, Betty Andrews. If it's customary to exchange names in a place like this. Mine's Pendrel. Bob Pendrel. Did you say Pendrel? Yes. Do you know it? Oh, no, no, not exactly. It's an unusual name, that's all. I... I don't want you to think I'm out of my mind. Though I very nearly am. But I've got five hours to go. Just five hours. At the end of that time... Either I'll have won $25,000 or, or else... Or else? Or else I'll be dead. <laughs> you know, I wish I'd kept you away from this boat. Well, there's nothing to get alarmed about. For you. I can't tell you much, but I had to tell somebody that or I'd have started yelling. There's just one other thing. Is there? In these places, they've usually got little dim-lighted rooms along the way. Yes, exhibits and things. Yes. Well, when we come to one, I'm going to get out of this boat and hide there. Just don't get alarmed. And don't tell anybody when you go out. Why should you do that? I think I see a light ahead. There is a light, but... Jim, too. That's all but the good. It's... Yes? We're coming around the corner. Look, I'm going to have company when I get off. A waxed dead man on a pile of straw. <laughs> oh, I hope I can stand these noises. Goodbye, Betty Andrews. I wish we'd met at a different time. Mind the boat! Here, what are you doing? Getting out! Don't be an idiot. What's the idea? You need looking after, Mr. Pendrel. And if we must hide, I suppose this is as good a place as any. I won't have it. Quick, quick. There'll be more boats along. Over behind that dead man on the straw. He'll hide us. Hurry. Oh. Now, Mr. Pendrel, in the queerest place I ever get into, please tell me what this is all about. I can't tell you. You said it yourself. If you don't tell somebody, you'll go crazy. <sighs> Maybe you're right. It's against the strict terms of the bet. But this is the last day. And I tell you, I can't hold out any longer. Your voice, lower your voice. It's about coming. I wonder... I wonder if you ever heard of my stepfather, John Destry. Yes. I imagine everybody has. He's a millionaire and... And I'm not. I'm just a chemist. An analytical chemist. Not very successful. So if I'd had time, if I'd had money, I might have worked out a process that would have... Well... I think it would have helped in the war. But he's got money. Yes, he's got money. Well, my mother died years ago. This, this Nestor's a, a big, white-haired, fine-looking fella. You'd think butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. He's got an apartment in the East 60s. Secretary, I never met her. Ballot, cook, that kind of thing. Well, he used to invite me there. I wouldn't go. Then he got hold of a book I had to have. A German work on chemicals. So I went. After dinner in that study of his, over the brandy... <laughs> Oh, my dear Robert, you're quite welcome to the book. Don't mention it. Oh, uh, what do you think of this brandy, by the way? <laughs> it's excellent, thanks. Yes, yes, I thought you'd like it. And now that we're all relaxed, comfortable after dinner, tell me something. Yes, Mr. Destry? 
You hate me, don't you? <laughs> Frankly, I do. And always have. Good, good. <laughs> then you'll be relieved to hear I've always felt the same about you. <laughs> but tell me something else. Did you ever know me to break my word? No, I never did. I'll give you that. I asked you, Robert, because uh, I want to make a little bet with you. That is, uh, if you have the nerve, which I doubt. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't afford to make that uh, You were always careless with money, Robert. <laughs> well, I've been thrifty. I saw that when your mother was alive. But you can afford to make this bet. Look here, in my desk. Well? $25,000, Robert. $25,000 in five $100 bills. And what would I have to bet against that? Your life. What? My life? There's the money in the drawer. Look at it. What wouldn't you give for that money? What wouldn't you give to have it for this precious work of yours that you're so fond of <laughs> and that you've failed in miserably? So far I've failed, yes. Oh, I've had a fairly good life as lives go. My heart isn't as good as it might be, but doctors say I've... I'll last a little while yet. But before I go, there's one pleasure, one little exquisite thrill for me to experience. I want to commit a murder. Yes, I said a murder. My bet is that I can kill you within six months and that you can't stop me. And that I'll never be punished for it. What do you say? Yes or no? I believe you mean that. Of course I mean it. And just how would you propose to kill me? Ah, that would be telling. You know, if I had time to think this thing over... There's no thinking it over. Now. Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> you must need the money badly, Robert. I do need it. But oddly enough, Mr. Destry, that isn't why I'm doing this. No? No. I want to show you you can't play the Lord Almighty and get away with it. Are you challenging me? Yes. You don't think I can do it? I know you can't. I, uh, we, we mustn't get excited, Robert. Uh, there will be conditions to the bet, you understand? What conditions? First of all, you'll never mention this matter to anyone. All right. That seems fair enough. You'll remain within the city limits of New York for six months. You'll spend at least one hour of every day walking the open streets alone. All right. You'll spend at least one hour every evening in your own room, alone. I may come to see you, or uh, <laughs> I may not. Mm. Trying to scare me already, are you? Finally, you'll write out a little note and give it to me. There's pen and paper on the desk in front of you. Write it now. Let's hear what I have to write before I do anything like that. You will write, I am a failure. You can't stop harping on that, can you? I am a failure, and this was the only way out. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. A suicide note? Yes. I intend to use it when I, uh, <laughs> operate. And if I won't write it? Ooh. Then there's no bet. All right, I'll do it. Hmm. It's now, uh, let's see, nine o'clock on the night of January the 10th. If you're alive and not in a madhouse... Does that go into the bargain, too? Yes. At nine o'clock on the night of June 10th, given those conditions... You will receive $25,000. Can't you hear the dice rattle, Robert? <laughs> You're playing with death now. I know it. Uh, aren't you going to finish your brandy? No, thank you. Oh, then uh, pour it back into the decanter. You heard me. Pour it back into the decanter. If you were as careful as I am, you, uh, you wouldn't be where you are now. That's right. Always be thrifty. I can promise you, by the way, that you'll always be perfectly safe as long as you're in this apartment. But that's the only concession I make. Oh, I notice your hands are steady uh, at the moment. I wonder what they'll be like a month from now. <laughs> So you were fool enough to make a bet with John Destry. Listen, Betty. I want to tell you what else happened the same night. I got on a Fifth Avenue bus and started to look through that book that Destry gave me. It was a book that I wanted about poisons. Well, just as I opened it, 
I felt something sharp break my fingers. I looked down, and my hands were covered with blood. He had sewn safety razor blades in a line down the inside edge of the cover. Oh, no. Yeah. A little white card fell out of the book, and I read it. It said, see how easy it is to take you off guard? Those razor blades aren't poisoned, but they might have been. Take warning. Betty, that was six months ago. Six months less five hours of careful, refined torture. And now, I've got only five hours to go. What's he done in the meantime? Nothing. Nothing? I don't understand. Nothing at all. That's the cleverness of it. He's left me waiting, waiting, waiting. Expecting something. Expecting it every hour of the day or night. Once at the laboratory where I work, I opened a box that I thought was from a chemical supply house. And a Mexican tarantula, one of those furry spiders about as big as your fist, oh, no. ran out across my hand. Oh. It was a toy tarantula. He enclosed a card, asking whether I didn't admire it. Not this can't go on. I used to think I didn't have a nerve in my body. I could hold a test tube at arm's length, absolutely steady for minutes at a time. Now look at me. Don't, please, don't. But the waiting's almost over now. Walking the streets, wondering who's behind you. Sitting alone at night, listening for every step on the stair. He's got very little time left now, but he's got to do something. The question is, what's he going to do? Well, maybe he doesn't mean it. Maybe, maybe he's only doing it to scare you. And lose all that money? Oh, you don't know my stepfather. Listen. Huh? I, I don't hear anything. It's just him. There's no sound of running water. The boats have stopped. Then we're all by ourselves in here. All with him. Yes. Oh, Lord, how I wish I hadn't gotten you into this. Oh, I'm all right. Uh, or at least I think I am. I thought I saw him in the crowd outside, but I couldn't be sure. I, I'm seeing him everywhere. Now, Bob, just a minute. Just tell me one more thing. Did you ever see Mr. Destry? I mean, face to face, after that first night? Oh, many times. He came to see you? He came to my laboratory once, yes, but mostly I went to see him. And why? Because it was the only place in the world I could feel safe. He's promised that nothing should happen to you while you were in his apartment. Don't you see? It was part of the torture. Night after night, he'd invite me. And I'd go right up until last night. Last night. We were in that study of his with the devil masks on the walls. And he was sitting behind the big mahogany desk. <laughs> My dear Robert, I'm pleased and uh, even touched to have you here on the last night before you, uh, uh, before you... Why don't you say die and get it over with? Oh, well, let's not say die. No, <laughs> the clergy contend that we never die. We only change. Oh. Now, let that be a consolation for you. Uh, must you be going so early? There's that one hour at home rule to our bet, if you remember. I remember. You're keeping to the rule. Yes, and I mean to beat you with this if it's the last thing I ever do. The last thing I ever do. <laughs> That's an unfortunate choice of phrase, Robert. <laughs> My boy, you haven't a chance. Something's going to happen to you within the next 24 hours when you least expect it. Will you answer me one question? If I choose. Have you decided... How you mean to kill me? I decided that six months ago. And you still think you can get away with it? It's a method which has never been known to fail. I give you my word of honor on that. Is it... Is it... Sudden? Yes, uh, And no. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know what it is? Good night, Mr. Deathry. I, I think I'd better be leaving. No, no, my dear boy. You mustn't go yet. Sit down. Pour yourself a glass of brandy. No, thanks. Uh, then perhaps you wouldn't mind pouring me a little. Uh, my doctor allows brandy, though I'm forbidden spirits. Hmm. I, uh, I notice your hands are shaking uh, quite a good deal. They weren't like that six months ago, were they? No, no. You were full of confidence then. Oh. <laughs> and it grieves me to see you waste tobacco by lighting a cigarette and putting it out immediately. Oh, it's no use lying to you. But I'm going to beat you just the same. You wouldn't like to back out now? After what I've been through? You'd still have your life. I'll keep it, thanks. Mm, that's very unwise of you, Robert. Still, you must decide. Oh, I was expecting my secretary a little later to dictate some letters. But now, um, I think I'll leave her a message that I've gone to bed and uh, turn in myself. Tomorrow, 
is likely to prove an interesting day for both of us. Here's your hat, here's your briefcase, and let me wish you a fun, peaceful, and happy good night. <laughs> Last night, Betty. I saw I had five hours to go. It's less than four hours now. If I can keep away from the old devil until nine o'clock. I wish those boats would start running again. Why? Because it's almost as spooky in here as a real old mill. I know. Even that wax dummy on the straw. Any minute now. You're I... expecting to see him move? So am I. Now don't stand up. It doesn't matter. If the boats aren't running, we can hear anybody who comes along. I hope so. Do you think Destry's got in? Bobby can't have got in. He can't even be here. Why not? Because Mr. Destry told me. Mr. Destry told you. I'm a secretary. <laughs> you know, Betty Andrews, I'm sorry it was you who did this. Did what? You can't guess, can you? Oh, Bob, I didn't come here to trap you or spy on you. If that's what you're thinking, I swear I didn't. No. You only got me to tell you the whole story and lose my bet. I haven't heard a single word you said. Bob, please believe me. He didn't send you here, of course. No, no. And of course you never saw me at his apartment last no, night. No, I swear I didn't. I got there late. He'd gone to bed. I didn't even take off my hat or gloves before I left again. Don't you understand, Bob? I hate him, too. I want to see you beat him. You've got to beat him. You mean that? Look at me and see if I mean it. Betty, I almost believe you. You must believe me. And... Anything else? You better hide behind that dead man, hurry. The thoughts have started up again. I wish I could tell you, Betty, what that means to me. Come on, come on, hurry. Wait a minute, you two. Stay just where you are. Where's that voice coming from? Along the tunnel, I think. But it's not Destry's voice. No, it's a man standing up in the boat. He's coming around the corner. I can see him now. Hurry. The old haunted mill, eh? My golly, if this ain't some place to make a pinch, I never heard of one. What do you mean? Make a pinch? That's what I said. Your name Robert Penderell? Yes. Who are you and what do you want? Police headquarters. You're here to come along with me. I want to see you over in New York. About what? I wouldn't know, lady. But it might be about the murder of John Destry. Oh, no. Did you say the murder of... John Destry? That's right. Somebody poisoned him last night with mercury cyanide. I wouldn't have got you at all, maybe, if the barker outside there hadn't thought the cops were after you to start with. Betty. Yes, Bob? He's beaten me. He hasn't beaten you. Oh, yes, he has. And I know now the weapon Destry was going to use in killing me. What weapon? It never fails. The electric chair. You mustn't talk like that. Don't you see... He never once intended to kill me in the way I thought. Are you coming quietly, Mr. Pendle? Just a minute. He's poisoned himself. But he's left evidence to show I did it. He's killing me the worst way possible. He's won the bet. The money doesn't matter now. If I'm in the death house for murder, what use have I got for all the money in the world? <laughs> Andrew, let me introduce myself. My name's Mullen, Inspector Mullen. It's a pleasure to meet you, Inspector. It's a pleasure to be safe again. I've had you brought here to my office for a little quiet talk. You're in a jam, son. I want you to realize how bad it is. You think I don't realize it? John Destry was poisoned with mercury cyanide administered in a glass of brandy. And only my fingerprints were on the glass besides his own. I can guess. Mr. Destry's body was found this morning lying behind the desk in the study. There was an empty glass with traces of brandy and cyanide. We haven't had the full autopsy report, but the smell of that stuff is pretty distinctive. They tell me uh, you're a chemist, Mr. Pender. That's right. The boys find that eight grains of mercury cyanide are missing from your laboratory. Where he visited me a month ago. And in your briefcase, which you took away from his apartment last night... He handed it to me. I remember. We found over a thousand dollars in cash. Now, take a look at this note. Did you ever see it before? Look. Yes. I wrote it. You admit that? Yes, yes, yes. It says, I was a failure, and this was the only way out. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. Where did you find it? Torn up in little bits. You started to write a confession, and then you couldn't face the consequences. But you shouldn't have left the pieces behind. You're infinite, my boy. Unless... Unless what? 
Now, if you'd like to confess here and now, and maybe we did a little deal about second-degree murder, oh, why... Oh, Inspector, why bother to string me along? What do you mean, string you along? There's no second-degree murder on a poison charge. It's the death house or nothing. He saw to that. It's too bad you had to go and kill him, son. Didn't you know he had an aneurysm? A what? Fatal heart disease. He said that he had heart trouble, but... Heart trouble. His doctor says he couldn't have lived eight or ten months anyway. And you might have got something in the will. So that's why he did it. Did what? Killed himself. You still stick to that crazy story you told the boy? He's going to kill me, isn't he? With 3,000 volts of electricity. Inspector Mullen. What are you doing here, Sergeant? Didn't I say I wasn't to be disturbed? All the same, Inspector. I thought I'd better do it. There's a young lady here, a Miss Betty Andrews. I think you'd better see her. I'll see her when I'm good and ready. I think you'd better see her, Inspector. We've just heard from Mr. Destry's lawyer. Well? He said that that young fellow there, Mr. Pendrell, inherits 25,000 bucks in Mr. Destry's new will. Did you hear that, son? Do you see what you'd have gotten if you hadn't gone and killed him? He was keeping his promise, that's all. A fine lot of good it'll do me now. But look, Inspector, I've just talked to the medical examiner, and he says there's no poison in Mr. Destry's body. Say that again? There's no poison in the old man's body. Somebody's kidding you. An empty glass with the smell of mercury cyanide and a dead man with a congested face behind the mask? What did kill him, then? Well, if you'd like to listen to Miss Andrews, Inspector, she's right here now. I think you'd better listen, Inspector. I've been trying to tell you all afternoon. Go ahead, Miss Andrews. I've been over and over it. And until I got the medical report, nobody would listen. Can you tell us what killed John Destry? Yes. Poison killed him. But the sergeant's just been saying there was no poison in the body. Inspector, will you listen? I was at Mr. Destry's apartment late last night. Well, so what? Uh, you didn't kill him, did you? The servant said he'd gone to bed. So I looked into the study to see if there were any instructions. Was Mr. Destry dead then? I don't know. I couldn't see his body because it was hidden behind the desk. I didn't even learn he was dead until late this afternoon. But I did see a full glass of brandy. Uh, a full glass, did you say? Yes. So I picked up the glass and poured the brandy back into the decanter. That's what he always made us do. And I didn't leave any fingerprints because I was still wearing my gloves. And that was the same glass you later found empty. But you still are not telling us what was the poison that killed John Destry. It was the poison in his own system. He worked out this plot to convict Bob Pendrell. Only just as he stretched out his hand to drink the cyanide... Inspector, I think I see it. It was his last great hour. He couldn't resist such gloating as he'd never known before. That's it. His heart wouldn't stand it. And he fell dead behind the desk. And I think, if you study the expression on his face, you'll find he died laughing. And so ends Will You Make a Bet with Death? Tonight's story of Suspense. The part of Bob Pendrell was played by Michael Fitzmaurice. Betty was played by Leslie Woods. John Destry was played by Nicholas Joy. And in supporting roles were Ted DeCorsia and Charles Slattery. Again next Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. A story dedicated to the thrill of the nighttime. The hushed voice and the prowling step. Another adventure in suspense. William Spear, the producer. Mark Sloeb, the director in the absence of John Dietz. And John Dixon Carr, the author. Our collaborators on... Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. For suspense, tonight we present Menace in Wax by John Dixon Carr. During the French Revolution of 1793, a Swiss girl copied in wax the severed heads of those who had just been guillotined. She married a Frenchman named Toussaint and came to London, and she founded Madame Toussaint's Waxworks. There it is, still in Marylebone Road, near Baker Street Station. Not the original building. That was destroyed by fire. But it remained untouched when a darker shadow than revolution came to England. And they plastered high explosives all along that road and hit the cinema next door. 
We are going to London under the bomber's moon. Late one night in March of 1941, a young man hurried up to the great glass doors of Madame Tussauds. Hey, open up here. Isn't there a night watchman around this place? There is, Governor, and I'm in. Now, what do you want at this hour of the night? My name is Rogers. I'm from the Daily Record. Oh. If you let me get inside, I'll show you my press card. Didn't you get any orders about me? Well, maybe I have at that. Oh, you're the bloke who wants to see the Chamber of Horrors. That's right. <laughs> All right, you may as well come in. My paper got a tip. There's something funny going on around here. Something funny going on here? Yeah, that's a good one. The raid's not very heavy tonight, is it? No, they're going over. You ain't heard where, Governor? We got a teletype flash. There was a Midlands. Lord Lummy, and I've got a sister in Birmingham. Oh, why can't she come and stop in a nice, safe place like London? <laughs> There's the Regent's Park guns opening up again. I can see Thrattle and shakes the hats off the dummies' heads. You know, this chamber of ours is getting to be popular tonight. You mean there's been somebody here before me? Yes. A woman? That's right, Governor. About five feet two inches tall, very pretty. If you like him, brunette and big-eyed and a phony French accent. No, Governor, no. This was only an old lady that lost her handbag. Oh, thank the Lord for that anyway. Now then, what is going on around here? Well, I don't know, Governor. You'll have to ask Pearson about that. Who's Pearson? Oh, he's the bloke that's the watchman down there. He's old and he imagined things. He phoned your paper. <laughs> have you got an electric torch? Yes. Then go straight on through the marble hall and down the stairs on your left. And don't speak to the policeman because he's wax. <laughs> yes, that's the way, Governor. That's the way to the Chamber of Horrors. Thank you. Pearson. Hello, Pearson. Pearson. Yes, sir. Huh? You're looking for me. Oh, uh, gee, I didn't see you there. I must have thought you were one of these wax dummies. Uh, ugly dim light, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Rogers is my name. I'm from the Daily Record. Oh, yes. I'm glad you came over. I phoned your paper myself. Maybe I'm just imagining things, but... Oh, uh... I don't blame you. This place would make anybody nervous, especially during an air raid. Uh, well, sir, it's all right as long as you don't get to imagine they're watching you. Oh, and do you? Oh, yes. Sometimes. That's the gambling group in the center there. Uh-huh. What's that thing over there? That's the famous guillotine. Oh, wait a minute, old boy. You're not trying to tell me that's the original guillotine. No, uh, that was burnt in the fire. Madame Toussaint bought it from Samson, the executioner. Let me tell you something, Mr. Rogers. What? Years ago, if this is straight, a young French woman came in here. There was nobody else in the place. She thought it would be great fun to say she'd put her neck in the same guillotine as Marie Antoinette. So she climbed up on that platform. She snapped the little wooden collar down round her neck, shutting herself in. All of a sudden, she realized she didn't know which spring controlled the collar and which spring controlled the knife. Oh, good Lord, she didn't. No. But they say she went crazy. They say she screamed and screamed. What's that? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you, but sweet mama, I'm so scared myself, I cannot help it. Susie. Oh, no, 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 not Susie. Susie. You make it so it rhyme with floozy. That is not nice. Why, you little devil. I ought to turn you across my knee. What are you doing here? And will you forget that French accent? You're driving me crazy. Uh, you know this young lady, sir. Do I? She works for my paper. She's haunting me. Oh, Bert, that's not nice. I like the way I talk. I only try to give you ideas. That's just what I mean. Now take your arms from around my neck. Uh, she's French, sir. Her mother came from New York like I did. She's got some funny ideas, accents, and disguises. So, I dress up as an old lady, and I come along, too. That is clever, no? Definitely no. But I go into what I think is the lady's room, and there is Jack the Ripper. I'm so scared, I almost kick the ghost. Whatever else you do, miss, for the love of heaven, put out that cigarette. It is not permitted? It is what they are most afraid of in this place. Fire. If you vouch for this young lady, Mr. Rogers... I don't vouch for anybody, but go on now. What's all the mystery here at Madame Tussauds? You see the group over there? It's called the Gamblers. 
That three men and a woman in 18th century costume sitting around a table playing cards? Yes. And about once a week, when the lights are out... Yes? Those dummies do play cards. Is this a publicity trick of some kind? Oh, no, sir. Then what's the game? I'm not crazy. I know they don't actually do it, sir. What I want to know is who changes the cards round in their hands and why? Well, could anybody... Anybody from the outside, I mean, get in to change the cards? Oh, yes. Uh, there's a back door. But why would anyone want to break in here just to change those cards around? Mon cher Ben, écoute. Listen, I have made a discovery. Listen, if you're going to talk, speak English. Or better yet, just keep still. But I have made a discovery. This card game. What about it? It is crooked. Here is a man which has two deuces of hearts in the same hand. Listen, Susie, I don't give a... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's have a look at those cards. Can I give you ideas, yes. Susie, for once you're right. And look here. Two of these players have all the clubs and hearts. The other two have all the diamonds and spades. Susie, how many letters in the alphabet? 26, no? And twice 26 is... 52. The number of cards in a pack. Give me a pencil, Susie, quick. The war office, Whitehall. MI5, Headquarters of Military Intelligence. There next morning in the map room, used as an office by Colonel Warrender. Mr. Rogers, I'm a busy man. I, I... appreciate that, Colonel Warrender. Well, anyhow, sit down. Thank you, sir. Now, what's all this? These cards you claim form a code, is that it? Yes, sir. Now, look, sir. Let each letter of the alphabet represent a card in clubs and hearts. That's 26. And then? And then when you get to the middle of the message, switch the alphabet over to diamonds and spades. Then you won't keep on repeating. Now, will you read what I've got written on this piece of paper? Jack of diamonds, Q. Three of clubs, F. Well, that doesn't seem to mean much. Oh, never mind the cards, Colonel. Just read the letters. Q, F, A, C, T, O, R, Y. Yes, sir. Q factory. Go on. Uh, oh, just a moment. What is that infernal noise? Johnson Burroughs. Uh, don't bother oh. with that, sir. Just read the message, please. Oh. Q factory. 10 p.m., 15th. Today's the 15th of March, Colonel. Well, all preparations made. Use dive bombers. I see. Uh, this message was left openly. So openly that nobody ever noticed it. Yes, the trick's been tried before. No contacts, no gatherings, no letters that might be intercepted. A whole spy ring could walk through that wax museum and read the message without being seen. Are you newspaper men trying to teach me my job? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, I only... No, 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 go on. Well, don't you see? Three or four little boats with portable wireless sets go down the Thames estuary. When they're beyond pursuit, they send that message by radio. Somebody listens. And it's no secret in Fleet Street, sir, that Q Factory is out in the wilds of Gleibyshire. Uh, it's no secret anywhere. And that we're making the Shaftesbury bomber out there. So tonight, unless we do something about it, they're coming over and bomb Q Factory to blazes. Uh, that's impossible. Why? Or can't you tell me? I can tell you this much. Yes, sir? Q Factory is so well hidden that even our own palace can't find it from the air. That's one objection to this message. Any other objection? Yes, this talk about dive bombers. Dive bombers in a night attack? What's the good of a dive bomber if he can't see his objective? Well, suppose somebody showed a light. He'd be shot dead as soon as he showed it. Every inch of country for a quarter of a mile round the factory. A quarter of a mile, Mr. Rogers, is patrolled day and night. Well, just the same. They're going to have a try at it, sir. How? I don't know how. Then if you'll excuse me, Mr. Rogers... Well, listen, I... Colonel Warner. will you give me a pass to go down there to the factory? Certainly not. No one's permitted to go there except the workers. How is the place defended? There's a night fighter station nearby... And several batteries of four 3.7 guns. Then give me a pass to the fighter station or to the gun post. That's a legitimate newspaper request. Well, I, I might manage a pass to one of the gun posts here. Then you'll do it. Well, Fawson, uh, here's that infernal row. It sounds like somebody locked up in a coat cupboard. Yes, as a matter of fact, Colonel, it is somebody locked up in a coat cupboard. A young lady, so-called. A young lady? Who locked her up? I did. And just what the devil do you mean, sir, locking up people in coat cupboards in the war office? Well, she's a bit excitable, Colonel. I thought that uh, she'd better not see you. Well, oh, thanks for the consideration. Uh, there's just one other favor I'd like to ask. As well? If she asks you for a pass, don't give it to her. Don't give it to her under any circumstances. Well, what's her name? Susie Dubois. <laughs> You're rather too late for that, young man. The public relations office granted her a pass two hours ago. What? Oh, a woman to an anti-aircraft battery? Uh, this is what we call a mixed battery. Women on the guns as well as men. She said it would make a good human interest story for the press. I, mm. I must say, I agree with her. 
Uh, well, one moment, Mr. Rogers, before you go. Yes, sir. That gun post is fully two miles from the factory. You can go there, but if you take one step further, you'll be shot on sight by our guards. I warn you. I'll be careful, Colonel. I'll be careful. Somewhere in the West Country, a yellow moon shines over bare trees. A white mist moving clings to the ground. Susie, are you sure we're on the right road? Oh, oh, sure. They have taken away all the signposts in case there is an invasion. I know that. But I follow the map. The map cannot be wrong. We've been driving for hours. Must be... Yes, it is. Nearly half past nine. Half an hour to go. Trees, trees, and still more trees. Look. There's a break in the trees ahead. There will be open country in them. Yeah. That's funny. Look how deep the leaves are here on the road. But one thing I tell you, just between you and me and the bedposts... Gateposts, Susie. The term is between you and me and the gateposts. And speak English. I am speaking English very well, thank you. I do not need your help to be pure. All right, all right. Now, this map. Well, what about it? It say we should go through a lot of villages. Mitford, Archardeen, and Saffron we built. I have not seen any villages. Did you say Mitford? Oui, monsieur. Susie, let me have a look at that map. Come on, come on, hand it over. But what is wrong? It is a perfectly good map. Yes, Susie. It's a fine map. It's an excellent map. Only it's a map of the wrong county. I have made a mistake? No? I don't even believe you can read. This is a map of Barsetshire. We should be somewhere in Glebeshire. Now, where in the devil are we? We're at the entrance to some kind of clearing with leaves. Oh. Hello there. What was that? Hello there. Somebody calling us. If we're in Forbidden Area... I see him now. Where? It's behind us. He came out of a white cottage back there. It's a big, heavy man. With a mustache. Never mind the mustache. He's wearing some kind of a uniform and he's got a rifle. You think he plugged us? No. I think it is not unlikely. Get out those war office passes of ours. Wait. Good evening, my friend. Uh, good evening. Can you tell me... No, we don't mean any harm. Uh, oh, 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 Can no. you tell me what time it is? Oh. oh. <laughs> what time it is? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, uh, 28 and a half minutes past nine. Thank you. I will keep you covered while I set my watch. There. My next question is, would you like me to shoot you both? No. Listen, Mr. Uh, Mr. McAllister. Captain. Captain McAllister. That's right. right. Well, Captain, uh, this girl, uh, she's been reading the wrong map. You see, we don't even know where we are. You are in Hollywood Forest, my friend. Hollywood Forest? Is that good or bad? And you don't know what's just beyond the edge of this clearing? No. There's a big open space of a quarter of a mile. In the middle of that open space... Q Factory. We're right on top of it. Then you have heard of Q Factory, my friend. Captain McAllister, we're from the war office, and we've got passes to prove it. Let's see the passes. We were trying to find gun site number... Uh, I've forgotten the number... But it's here on that card. You've passed the gun, sir. Two miles back up the road. All right. Here are your passes. What are you going to do to us? Uh, I'm not in the regular army. You can thank your stars I'm not. I'm forestry preservation. Oh. You are not going to chuck us in the cooler, is it? <laughs> no. Now turn that car on, get back along this road as fast as you can. If they fire at you, as they probably will... Oh, I wish I am home. Pray no, Mo, I wish I am home. Well, then hope for the best. My watch had stopped and you did me a good turn. Well, hurry along. Hurry. The gun sight of heavy act act battery. Four three point seven guns against a moon growing clear white. White as the concrete emplacements. Sealed against light by the crews, men and women, sitting, waiting, waiting, waiting. Well, sir, uh, glad to have you both here. But this idea of yours about dive bombers attacking a blacked-out factory in the uh, middle of a forest is uh, rather fantastic, don't you think? 
Well, I admit it doesn't make much sense, Captain Bronson, but I have a hunch that I'm right. Well, glad you and Miss Susie drove out. Don't see many strangers. Frightfully boring. Nice country, of course. Good air and everything, but dull. Dull as ditch water. What's that? Only some of the lads and lasses inside. Like to uh, walk along the emplacement here? Oh, is that allowed? Oh, certainly, old boy. Why not? Bright moon tonight, isn't it? Yes, bomber's moon. We, uh, we nearly get shot on our way here. Quiet, Susie. We're not supposed to have been here. If I nearly get shot, I am going to say I nearly get shot. It was a man which is called, uh, uh Miss Callister. Oh, old Mac. Uh, very decent sort, Mac. He's a, a tree doctor. A what? Tree doctor. Got to have wood, you know. But trees start to die. Mac goes round the edge of the clearing and smears him with stuff to keep him well. Uh, how did you come to meet him? Well, the fact is, uh, we nearly got as far as the factory tonight. Oh, then you were lucky to get back alive. There weren't any barrage balloons over the factory, I noticed. Uh, hardly, old boy. They wouldn't advertise, would they? With balloons in open country? And if the Germans did use dive bombers? Oh, they're not coming, old boy. Just make up your mind to that. I wonder if you'll say so at 10 o'clock. Mm, but it is 10 o'clock. It's, uh, well, it's just 10 now. Well, it can't be. We drove here like blazes. It was only half past nine then. Well, then your watch must be very slow, old boy. No, I'm afraid you're wrong. I've never seen it quieter. Cold tonight. Very dry for March. Look all around you. Moonlight. Open country. Not a sign of life in it. Quiet. Peaceful. And silent as the great. What was that? Why, George, I think we've got some visitors. I think we're going to see some fun. Enemy planes approaching south-southwest. Action stations. Enemy planes approaching south-southwest. <laughs> Now, do you believe me? Better stand back, old boy. Operation crew's coming on. I said, now do you believe me? I want you to watch these girls work. They do everything, you know, except actually fire the guns. Now, 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 keep your hair on, old boy. Susie, you still can't see it. Oh, they'll only be going over. You think so? Oh, yes. We sometimes get a crack at them when they're making for Bristol. Standing by for action. Standing by. Listen. I've heard that noise a thousand times. But every time I hear it, I get sick. Mm. They're flying ruddy low, you know. Just what I was thinking. Spotter! Spotter! Any identification? Yonkers, 88. Dive bombers. Height, 5,200. Now, look here, you two newspaper people. Yes, sir. There might be things popping, you know, can't tell. Uh, light to get below. No, no, thanks. I don't like this, Bert, but I'll stay, too. Range finder. Range finder. All targets. Look here, you two. The, uh, those war office passes you gave me, uh, I'm not supposed to keep them. No, I'd better give them back, just in case. Predictor. Predictor. All targets. Here we go, ladies and gents. Fire. <laughs> What is message, sir? Fire. Yes, Corporal. Oh, fire. Night fighters taking off. Oh, fire. Night fighters taking off. Hold fire. Message understood. What is the matter with them? With who? Those marsh planes. They're still a good way off, but they don't come any closer. Hmm. Must be going over after all. They're circling. I think they're waiting for a signal. Anyhow, here are your war office bosses. You, well, you seem to have got them all smeared with oil. Oil? That is all right, Monsieur. When we get them back from Captain McAllister, they have oil on them. I think maybe you drop them on the leaves because there's oil on the tires of the car, too. Then I think how always in this we meet things that burn. At Madame Tussauds last night, they would not let me smoke a cigarette in case of fire. Fire? That's it, fire. What's the matter with you, old boy? Why did that fella, way out at the end of nowhere, want to know what time it was? Are you scatty? McAllister, you told me so yourself. He goes around the edges of the clearing and smears the trees with stuff to keep them well. Well, what about it? Suppose it was crude oil. Suppose between each tree he laid an invisible fuse of dead leaves soaked in oil. I, uh, I don't understand. In 30 seconds, a complete square of fire runs around the limits of the factory grounds. That draws the bombers in. And as the flames blaze higher, they've got enough light to dive on their target. There. Our night fighters are letting loose. Branson, I see it all now. Come on. We've got to get to that tree, Dr. McAllister. It's a matter of minutes. (laughs) 
Susie, is Branson following in the car behind us? Yes. He's following the men with rifles. We've got to get to McAllister's cottage. This McAllister. I bet you ten to one. The real McAllister is either dead or tied up in that cottage. The fellow we saw was an imposter. Look out, Susie. Keep your head down. Oh, those fighters. They will chew up every younger in the place. They have not got the chance of a snowshoe in heaven. No, Susie, not a snowshoe in heaven. You mean it? A... I know you are English at a time like this, but I cannot understand. Look out. I don't see why he hasn't set his signal off. What is delaying him? Why don't he strike a match when the bombers come over? Because he's a good Nazi. A good Nazi? My watch was slow, don't you remember? And I gave him the wrong time. He had orders to strike his match at 10 o'clock, and he'll not do it until 10 o'clock if there are 500 planes instead of 20. Bert. I see him. Where? Far up the road. He's running. Yeah. Yeah, that's him. Think we can reach him before he gets to the clearing? Not the chance of a snowshoe in heaven. Signal Brunson to pass us. A long shot with a Bert. rifle might... Bert, one of the Yonkers is hit. Huh? He's right over it. That's not all. He's unloading his bombs. The whole stick's coming straight down our direction. Keep your head down. I don't feel hurt. Now, this is a dirt road. The bomb sank too deeply before it exploded. We didn't catch the blast. Come on, Susie. McAllister was just ahead of us. Come on, let's get out. We can't drive any farther. This road is full of bomb craters. Wait a minute, Susie. There's McAllister. He... He is dead. Yes, Susie. Killed by a Nazi bomb. Look, on the ground. What are those two white cards? Oh. Hmm. They're all smeared with oil. They must have fallen out of McAllister's pocket just before he got hit. Let's see. Huh. What do you know? What are the cards for? Two tickets for Madame Tussaud's waxworks. I'm afraid our friend's never going to get to use them. Uh-huh. Not the chance of us. No shoe in heaven. And so ends Menace in Wax. Tonight's story of Suspense. Columbia presents these stories of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next Tuesday, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. William Spear, the producer. John Dietz, the director. Bernard Herman, the composer, conductor. John Dixon Carr, the author. Our collaborators on... Suspense. Here is a message of vital importance to every person who drives an automobile in America. There is wide misunderstanding about gasoline and rubber, and the government wants the following facts brought to everyone's attention. Actually, there is no scarcity of gasoline except in some parts of the East, but nowhere in the country is there enough rubber for military and civilian use. Starting two weeks from today, December 1st, mileage rationing goes into effect. This means that no car owner anywhere in the United States will be able to buy gasoline without a mileage rationing book. The purpose is to conserve the rubber we have by eliminating all unnecessary driving. When we think of the tremendous distances our mechanized army is traveling in North Africa and the long road to victory that still lies ahead, this extra effort on our part is slight indeed. Remember, everybody is going to have mileage rationing, so why not be prepared? The best way each of us can save rubber is by sharing our car with others. Let one car do the work for two or three. So why not arrange with the neighbors tonight and start sharing the car tomorrow? It's the one real, important contribution that every automobile driver can make. Don't be a lone rider. Share your car and do your share for victory. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. The 
the hushed voice and the prowling step in the dead of night. The crime that is almost committed. The stir of nerves at the ticking of the clock. The rescue that might be too late. Or the murderer who might get away. Mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. We invite you to enjoy stories that keep you in... Suspense. For suspense, tonight we present The Body Snatchers by John Dixon Carr. Beware of the body snatcher who prowls after dark. Beware of the graves he robs. Beware of the murders he commits to provide new corpses for the doctors. Up to the year 1832, the body snatchers terrorized England. According to the law, only four bodies a year could legally be supplied to the surgeons for anatomical study. And even these were a monopoly granted to the Barbers and Surgeons Company of London. But the study of surgery had to go on. In hundreds of medical schools all over England, perfectly reputable doctors were compelled to buy bodies and ask no questions. In 1828, burst the scandal of Burke and Hare, who found grave robbing too slow and murdered 16 persons in order to supply Dr. Knox of Edinburgh. And so, out of basic good purpose, and the evil of the body snatcher. Turn back the clock now to a cold night just 110 years ago. Look into the brick kitchen of a house on Wandsworth Common, not far from London. There in the light of a tallow dip, this old mother slave in her draggled body. What's that keeping on? Two hours. Two mortal hours at a Dutch clock. And they're not here yet. Mother Slade. In the graveyard, not half a mile off. And once, I thought I heard church bells ring. And one Mother Slade, did you call? No, my girl, I did not call. But I thought I... And what are you doing up at this hour, my girl? I was only locking up, Mother Slade. Ain't it enough to have taken you over from a good-for-nothing mother, not worth the gunpowder to blow her up? Please, Mother Slade. And giving you a good home? And brought you up practically like a lady, with only the housework to do. I'm sorry, Mother Slate. Only I wish you wouldn't talk like that about me own mother. And what do you do, Peggy Lester? You stop up until this hour. You mislay me snuff box twenty times a day. I was only going to say, I thought I heard a horse and cart in the lane. In our lane? Yes, Mother Slate. There it is now. Yes. Easy, my dears. Try it easy with the merchandise. The doctors don't like it if you bump the merchandise. Merchandise, Mother Slade? What's that? I'll tell you what it is, my girl. I didn't mean anything, Mother Slade. It's your Uncle Matt and your cousin Robert coming home from their business. That's what it is. You hear that, Piggy Lister? I didn't miss lay your snuff box. It's on the table. And if you don't want me to take my fingernails to you instead of a strap, you get on up to bed this minute, dear. Yes, Mother Slade. I'm not coming, my dears. Don't be impatient. I'm not coming. Nasty dim light this candle gives. Oh, oh, Mother Slade has got the rheumatics so cool she can hardly move. Just pull back the bar, open the door. Well, Matt, did you get it? Did we get it? Strike my blind, but that's a good one, ain't it, Rome? Stay the gag, caught you, get. Keep inside and shut the door. They ain't after you, ain't they? Can't you hear anything? I thought I heard church still. More like a patient funeral bell if you asks me. Take it easy, Rob. Take it easy. We've shaken them off. Hey, wait. I wish I was a certain of some people. The spades and the sack is still in the cart. Let them stay. Who's a coming to find them? Then you didn't get it after all, you sick pal, Peter. Now, uh, don't you start a blaming us. No, you set your potato trap by the side or that'll make you shut it. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. He was too quick, that's what. The girl was only buried this afternoon. The sooner the better, my dear. What's the good of the merchandise if it ain't fresh, eh? You hold your noise and listen. We left the orphan cart outside like we always do. We creeps up to the lich gate of the churchyard. Walks 
softly, Max. Walk softly, Rob. In your oily beaver hat and neckcloth. Under the starlight and the white frosted elms. Take care of the graves, too. Spring guns may be set in some of them. To protect the dead from marauders. And if the coffin is one of those new iron ones, all your labor will be in vain. Open the gate for safe. I might such a bloody row with them shovels. I can't help it. I'm loaded down with all this stuff. Oh, and who'll do all the work when we do get there? I will. Matt. I. Listen. I can't hear nothing except your teeth are chattering. Matt, there's other people besides us in this here churchyard. Aye, two or three hundred deaders. But they won't bother us. I mean living people. Don't talk so. Somebody's got a dark lantern. I see it flash past the grave's toes. Oh, hey! Can't you see it now? Is it coming straight toward us? Hey, I see him. Come on. They've seen us, Matt. He's a bob. Down behind the gravestones. Crap down. They can't shoot through stone. Matt. It says he is sacred to the memory it's of the... It's a girl's relative. She's been watching her grave. Most oh, oh, If only I had my barkers. First time in two years I've gone without a break of pistols and this happens. So say, got your barkers, Matt Patterson? I got what's just as good. Give me a shovel. What are you going to do? Charge them. This here shovel's got a nice edge. Oh, you daft. They'll have to take time out to reload, won't they? Hear that? Somebody's talking the bill. That'll bring down every pillar within a mile. If you want a tie and ticket and then making your in a rope, stop where you are. But if you don't want to get scragged before your time, follow me. That's all there is to it, Mother Slade. He went out by the gate and blow me if they could stop us. You perishing numbskulls. Did they recognize you? No. We had our neckerchiefs around our eyes. And did you do it? I don't know. There's blood on the shovel. No, that ain't, Mother Slade. I want it off. Anyway, we're here. What I want now is a Christian fire to sit by. And a proper spirits to warm my stomach. There's no spirits in the house, Matt Patterson. Don't you lie to me, you ugly man. Let's go, Matt Patterson. I'm warning you. You better let it go, Matt. Yeah. There's no spirits. Only half a loaf of bread. Don't I know it. I haven't tasted a drop of gin all day. Black dogs on me back. Well? Ark is what I say. The doctor was promised a cork tonight. All right, dearie, he gets a cork tonight. Mm. There's that funeral bell again. What's the clock, old head? Come on, spit it out. A nice young cork without any trouble or bother. Uh-huh. What about young Peggy upstairs? Strongly blind. What about it, huh? You'd have to be mighty careful. Why? You'd have to smother her with a pillow while I stick on her legs. That's what broken hair done up in Edinburgh. Then you don't leave any marks on him. See? He got off a thick weight. What? If the doctors see they've been polished off, just plain murdered, they won't have nothing to do with it. These ways they don't like it. Like it or not, dearie, they all do. Who's buying the beef tonight? Dr. George Arnold. Him? The young fella out for and wait. That's the man, dearie. But I thought he was too pious and holy to play. That's what Dr. Arnold thought, too, till they started putting the screws on him at Bart's College. No court, they said to him. No lecture. No lecture, no student. They all come to it, dearie, sooner or later. What beats me is why they got to have these bodies. You'd think the doctors killed enough people as it is. Without a buying them after they was dead. Don't you question the way of providence, Matt Patterson. You can't drink that. You can't drink not a slave. You stole that noise, Bob Plenty. Do you want to wake the poor girl upstairs? But you can't do it. This Cove Arnold, he knows that. Arnold knows who? He knows Teddy. Teddy there worships the ground he walks on. Oh. He said there are once when Mother Slade broke it, accidentally like, and she can't forget him. 
What's Arnold going to think when he opens up the sack and he finds What his... can Arnold do? He's bought her, ain't he? He can't go to the police and say he's bought her. Peggy. Peggy Lester. Don't do it, Mother Slade. Don't do it. And how do you two thickers know what Mother Slade is a going to do? You're going to kill her, ain't you? Peggy. Peggy Lester. Uh, I thought I heard her moving about upstairs. You did, Mr. Milk and Water. She's on the stairs now. Rob, you're the least to be depended on. Go out and fetch him the set. Don't do it. It'll bring us all bad luck. Matt, you're a lad after me own heart. You stop where you're on just as I tell you. Trim the candle. Let's have it all nice and snug. What does she bring, do you think, Miss? Fifteen guineas. Hmm? Maybe twenty. <laughs> Maybe more. Twenty guineas? Strike me blind. But this is a way of doing business that I like. Did you call me, Mother Slade? That's right, my ducky. That's right, my little pet. Put your wrap around you and your slippers to keep your feet warm and come right down here to Mother Slade. I'm coming, Mother Slade. I'm coming. Who in those times would be a surgeon and still be an honest man? At that drugged hour of the night, look into the sitting room of a spacious house. Many candles are still alight there, though they have burned down nearly to their silver sockets. There is Chinese paper on the walls, and a turkey carpet underfoot. In front of the fire, now almost out, sits Dr. George Arnold with his bottle green coat and heavy hair. Dr. Arnold, sir. Oh, I, 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 I beg your pardon, Mrs. Tancred. Dr. Arnold, sir. It's gone two o'clock. Yes, yes, oh, yes. So it has. You've got a lecture to deliver tomorrow. And you'll be all worn out. Why don't you go on up to bed? Mrs. Tancred. Yes, sir? You're a jewel of a housekeeper. I admire you, and I can't do without you. But would you please go away and let me alone? Oh, sure, I'm very sorry, sir. No offense, Jenny. Oh, uh, stop. I, I shouldn't have said that. I'm I, I'm thinking too much, perhaps. I'm smoking too many cigars, if you'll excuse me. Why must they keep tolling that bell at East Hill Church? Why must they keep it up all night? Well, sir, Elsie says the parson told him to do it. Elsie? Oh, wait. Ooh. Who is Elsie? Dr. Arnold, sir. I know you're always up in the clouds, mooning over books and whatnot, but I did think you'd recognize the name of your own parlor, oh, mate. Oh, that, Elsie? I see. Well? Elsie says it's because of the murder in the churchyard. What murder? Two resurrection men. Body snatchers, sir. Oh, you wouldn't know anything about such people. No, no. No, of course not. They were caught trying to rob a grave. But they got away. One of them was a horrible big fellow. Spit Willie Kendrick's head open with the edge of a shovel. Is anything wrong, sir? No, no not exactly. Well, I thought for a second, see how you look. Did they, did they get the body? Yes, sir. It was Willie Kendrick. His head was split open with a shovel. No, no, I, I mean, did these resurrection men get what they were after? No, sir. Thank God. Oh, you may well say that, Doctor. Well, I wasn't exactly speaking in the religious sense, but never mind. Well, Elsie says there are what she calls peelers all over the place. Peelers? Yes, see, even policemen. After Sir Robert Peel, and somebody from the new detective police that they're using instead of the Bow Street Runners. Well, Mr. Tankard, I'm going to smoke one more cigar, and then I'm going to bed. Very good, sir. You see, sometimes you give orders, then it's too late to recall them. Whatever the medical practice is, you, you can't look your conscience in the face afterwards. Then, I can't tell you how or why, a miracle comes along and saves you, and you're free. You're... What was that? Sounds like a horse and cart in the drive, sir. Mrs. Tancred. Yes, Doctor. Will, will you please go upstairs? Now make haste. Oh, it's visited, sir, or even the Mrs. Tancred, you heard my instructions. Obey them. Sir, there's the front door. Yes, sir. I, I heard it. For the last time, go away. I will admit whatever visitors we have. Yes, sir. Good evening, dearie. Oh, come into the sitting room here, Miss. Uh, Mrs. Slade. No, sir. Just call me Mother Slade. It don't hardly seem natural or friendly to hear anything else. It's a pleasure to curtsy to you, Doctor. Cool. What a lovely room. I, I suppose... Your candles is going out, though. One by one. Poof. 
Then you'll be in the dark. I suppose you've come to report failure. Failure, dear? I, I understand you didn't get what you went after. Bless you, dearie. We got something just as good. Finest piece of merchandise you ever saw. You haven't done here. Bless you, dearie. Mother Slade always keeps her word. Bring the merchandise in, you dears, so the doctor can see it. Oh, please. Oh, of course, dearie, I forgot. The big fellow with the black eyebrows is Uncle Mac. The little fellow with the watery eyes is Cousin Rob. And between them, in that sack, they're carrying... Well, who is it in the sack? Nineteen-year-old girl, dearie. Finest anatomical specimen you ever saw. Well, if you want this here thing dumped, Governor. Easy now, Matt. Why did you bring it here? That's where you told us to bring it, dear. I, I mean, why did you bring it to the front door? Why not to the surgery? Only place in the house where there was lights, Governor. Hurry up now. Where do you want it? Oh, take it. Yes, dearie? Take it over and put it in the cupboard there, where I'm pointing. This cupboard here? Sir. Yes, then, then close the cupboard door. Shame on you two. Tracking your muddy boots over the doctor's lovely turkey carpet. Easy, my dears, easy now. All right, Robin, sit down. Don't bruise the merchandise. Whatever you do, don't bruise the merchandise. Right, my blind, what's the odds? She can't feel it now. There's your body, Mr. Sawbones. Now, let's see your money. Well, just one moment before I give it to you. There ain't no itch in this, is there? There better not be. No, I I made a bargain with you, and I'll stick to it. Thank you. That's uncommon genteel of you. Kind of stand back, sir. You're too sort of fat, heavier than I am, and you don't impress me. Easy, Matt. Catch it easy. I, I want to ask only one question. Where did you get that body? That's a question, dearie, what people in your profession don't ask. Why not? Because they don't dare. That's why. Would the police be interested in where you got the body? No, dearie. Not are so interested in is where we brought it. To your house. It's your responsibility now. Yes, I suppose it is. The victim wouldn't be, by any chance, that pretty little girl you used to treat so unmercifully. You all your noise about how I treated her. I was rather fond of Peggy. Oh, 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 oh. Strike me blind. I think there's all the oh, Get here. out of this house, all of you. Go on, get out. Not without that money, dearie. It's 20 guineas now. There's money on the table under that newspaper. Take what you want, honey. Get out of here before I... Oh, what was that? Ah, what was it? A late visitor, I imagine. Was you expecting anybody? Eh? No. Don't drop the lovely money, Lord. Don't drop it all over the carpet. Pick it up. Stay back where you are, Yes, it's the way you should have come. Through that arch and, and down the passage. Thank you for the rhino, Governor. And no games, mind you. If you know what's good for me. Good night, dearie. Remember, you've got the body now. Yes. I've got the body now. Poor, poor little devil. Oh, In heaven's name, Mrs. Tancred, haven't you gone to bed yet? I had to get up, sir, to answer the oh, bell. Yes, yes, of course. I, I'm sorry. Dr. Holmes, what's the matter with you? Matter? What is a ghost? You're almost crying. Am I? Well, we must remedy that. It's so dark in here. I could barely see you sitting there. The candles going out one after another. Nothing but smoke and a nightly smell of grease in that cupboard door. What about that cupboard door? Oh, I always declare, sir, it won't keep shut without any latch or bolt. If you'll excuse the lift. Mr. Tankard, keep away from that cupboard. Look around, sir. Are you ill or anything? No, but keep away from that cupboard. Who who rang the bell? Oh, dear, I was almost forgetting. It's that man Elsie was talking to us about. What man? The officer of the detective police, sir. He wants to see you. Well, I'll see him, but in some other room, not here, it's... As you say, there's not enough light. Uh, not a bit of it, Doctor. Not a bit of it. Never too dark, as you might say, where the police are concerned. I couldn't help it, sir. You must have followed me down the hall. Uh, are you... Uh, that's right, Doctor. I'm Stalker at your service. Inspector Stalker. Oh. How do you do, Inspector? Mrs. Tankford, you may go. Oh, by your leave, sir. I'll just get some more candles and put them in that bracket by the cupboard. It's not in you. No, you need not trouble. Oh, it's no trouble, sir. Excuse me. First of all, Doctor, I must apologize for intruding as late as this. Oh, not at all, Inspector. Will you be seated? Thank you, sir. Thank you kindly. Now, I dare say you're wondering why I'm here. Oh, yes, I am, rather. It's a bad business, Doctor. A very bad business. You mean the murder in the churchyard? Oh, you've heard about it. Well, my housekeeper said something about a, a man being killed with a shovel. Oh, that's right, Doctor. Not much doubt about who did that. 
No. No, the little fellow dropped his dark lantern with the initials on it. They're professional body snatchers. We've had our eye on them for a long time. Speaking of body snatchers, Doctor... Well? I expect this anatomy law is pretty hard in you surgeons. It's an infamous law, sir. All the same, Doctor, it is the law. Yeah, yes. And if any surgeon happened to be caught with a body, especially a murdered body... What are you, what are you hinting at? Nothing, Doctor, nothing. By your leave, I only want to ask a question. Well? What time did your friends leave? Now, come, Doctor. As one man of the world to another, do you see any green in my eyes? You are not going to say you had no guests when their horse and cart are still at your front door. They didn't get away. No, Doctor, they didn't. For they made a little reception committee as they left by the back door. Bob is on the wrists. Snap. Just as I might reach out and touch your wrist. Like this. What do you mean by Bob is handcuffed? I've got a pair in my pocket. Gags into their mouths. That's to keep them from biting. But do we have to go on with it? You already seem to know everything I could tell you. Not exactly everything. I don't know, for instance, where you've hidden the girl's body. You're a very diligent man, Inspector Stalker. Thank you, sir. I try to do my duty. You said it. A girl? These gin muddled degenerates have been watched every second since they left East Hill Churchyard. They hadn't a body then, but they brought one here. And there's only one other person who lives in the same house with them. Dr. Arnold, sir. Mrs. Tancred, listen to me. Yes, sir. Must you always break in with the most completely old-timed entrances at all the worst period of my life? I was only trying to be helpful, sir. That's right, madam. Always be helpful. You had to have some light. Here's the candle, sir. Part of them. In a big candelabra. We can hang them in the bracket. Ma'am, hold up that light. Hold it high. Really, sir? I'm not in the habit of being spoken to with... Hold it high, I tell you. Do as the inspector tells you, Mrs. Tancred. Mm, this is a very fine carpet you've got here, Doctor. Yes, others have admired it tonight. Mm, but it oughtn't to have footprints on it. Muddy footprints. Footprints leading from the door, past the sofa, past the hearth, over to... Oh, that cupboard. Quite correct. I think that's done it, Dr. Arnold. I think it has, Inspector Stalker. Mm, you couldn't have proved anything against you for that churchyard business, but this. Let, let me open, Bluebeard Cupboard Inspector. Let me be the first to show you what's inside. You wanted a certain body. It appears you've come to the right place. Now, look. Lord Almighty. I'm the body, Mr. Police. Standing up, I'm very much alive. I'm wearing a nice new dress that the doctor gave me. That I gave you? Don't say anything. Please don't say anything. Uh, stop a bit, miss. Aren't you Peggy Lester? Yes. It's not because the doctor has to be so terribly respectable, and a girl who's fond of him has to come here in secret. Wait a minute, everybody. Peggy Lester, you're lying. I am not lying. So that's it. Why didn't I guess it? It's the oldest body snatcher's trick in the world, is it? Of course, the old pinch penny like Mother Slade couldn't sacrifice a good household grudge. Of course they brought the body here, instead of taking it to the surgery, where it might get locked up. Could you be persuaded, Inspector, to, to tell us just what you're talking about? The body snatcher, sir. Oh, what about them? They take a living accomplice and put him into a sack and sell him to a green doctor as a dead man. Yes, but see here, uh, they get the best price they can. Then in the middle of the night, that accomplice gets up and robs the doctor's house. And the doctor can't tell us because he's bought illegal goods. I never intended to go through with it. No, young woman. I tell you, I wasn't going to rob the house. They made me do this. I was going to tell Dr. Arnold. When I found out where they were taking me, I pretended to go through with it so I could warn the doctor. They can hurt so much. You'll agree to almost anything. Mm, that sounds like the truth, but it puts me in a funny position of no mistake. Oh, your, your three murderers, Inspector, seem to be, seem to be leaving. Yes, they're leaving right enough. Trust up like fowls and under guard. Does anybody go with them? Well, how can anybody go with them? I'm willing to believe this girl acted under threats. She's committed no crime. And I don't for the life of me see how we can touch you. Can't touch me? No, sir. I confound you for making me lose a night's sleep. There's no body. We didn't, you didn't even buy a body. Will you tell me, Doctor, just what crime you've committed? <laughs> So ends 
The Body Snatcher. The story of London at midnight, a hundred years ago. And tonight's story of... Suspense. Columbia presents these tales of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next Tuesday, there will be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30, Eastern Wartime. William Spear, the producer. John Deet, the director. Alexander Semler, the composer, conductor. And John Dixon Carr, the author. Our collaborators on... Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. is compounded of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. Stories calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves. Tonight, for instance, as we begin, you may want to ask yourself, how could a young lady, a bride, walk out on a balcony alone and vanish? Completely vanish. We trust that while you are wondering how and why it was done, we shall keep you in... Suspense. Italy in springtime. Italy as we used to know it before the jackal struck. And the island of Capri, 20 miles out across the bay of Naples. Blue water a dazzle under the sun. Behind you the bone white beaches and Vesuvius dull purple in a heat haze. Ahead, as the little steamer from Naples chugs out across the bay, rises Capri. Olive trees and white roads and vineyards above the cliffs. Could young Americans find a better place to spend their honeymoon? While the guitars sing and the warm winds blow and the little steamer carries them. Well, Mrs. Courtney. Well, Mr. Courtney. <laughs> I can't keep it up, Lucy. I'm going to break down and ask if you're happy. Oh, I'll break down, too. I want to walk up to everybody I meet and say, we. Oui. Just like that. What I want to do is turn somersaults myself all along this deck here. I want to say, I've been married to Tom Courtney for practically two weeks. And now we're going to have a villa at Capri for a month. Oh, Tom, I ought to be the happiest woman in the world. Only... But you shivered. What's wrong? Well, ever since we got aboard this ship, people have been staring at me. I can't blame him for that, dear. No, no, I, I mean in, in a funny way and, and muttering. Even your American friend, uh, what's his name? Uh, Granger. Mr. Granger, when you introduced him to me at Naples, I thought his eyes were going to pop out. Be careful, he's standing over by the rail now. Oh. He lives at Capri. <laughs> I like to see him wearing that white ten-gallon hat in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Before Granger made money in oil wells, he was a real old-fashioned cow puncher. And he's proud of it. Good fellow, too. He's too polite to say anything, but he keeps looking around at me, just the same as the rest of them do. Well? Well, Tom, they, they look scared. You know, Lucy, this isn't the time to start imagining things. I know. Well, maybe I'm just so happy I'm afraid it can't last. Oh, don't say that. But wouldn't it be pretty awful if something did happen and we weren't together any longer? Wait a minute. Hasn't this ship stopped? Yes. Well, it is Capri ahead of us, isn't it? It can't be anything else. But it seems a funny place to stop. No sign of a harbor. Only rocks and little gray cliffs. Oh, Mr. Granger. Uh, Mr. Granger. Yes, young fella. Do you happen to know why we're stopping here? Oh, yes, that's amazing, my son. Yeah, we're stopping so that uh, you and your good lady and anybody else who's curious can get a look at the Blue Grotto. The Blue <laughs> Grotto, of course. Oh, just uh, shame your eyes. 
Sam, ma'am. Uh, you see that, that tiny little arch under the cliff? Yes. And all the little white rowboats are coming out towards us? Yes. Now, when the first boat comes alongside, you climb down that iron ladder and get in. The boatman will row you out and through the arch into the grotto. It's a great big dark cavern. The water in there looks as though it's lit up underneath with blue fire. I'd like to go out and see it, Lucy. Oh, I'd love to. Uh, let me give you a little tip, though. The current's pretty fast out there. You'll go shooting under that arch like 60. Are we likely to upset? Oh, no, no, but the arch isn't as high as your head. When you see it coming, lie back flat in the boat. That is, unless you want your block not to hold. <laughs> well, thanks, Mr. Granger. We'll remember. Come along, Lucy. Easy on the ladder, Lucy. Don't look round yet. Oh, I'm all right, darling. And just as good a swimmer as you are. I'm in the boat now. Take one more step. Steady. Now turn around facing the boatman and sit down here. Oh. Oh. What's the matter with the boatman? Easy, man. Do you want to upset us? Sit down. You come back, yes? Come back? Well, I've never been here before in my life. Push off, man. Start rowing. The other boats are piling up behind you. You come back. Start rowing, can't you? And Ari Subito, basta! Oh, he can't take his eyes off us. I wish he'd watch out where he's rowing. You come to live at the Villa Borghese, yes? Tom, how does he know that? He's the lady. She is not dead. Dead? Of course she's not dead. What are you talking about? She never come to Capri before? Never. Then I tell you, she will disappear just like the other one. Disappear? I rest my orders, and I tell you. Tom, aren't we moving rather fast? Yes, that's the entrance to the grotto ahead. I tell you, there was a lady, so much like you at all, coveting back, oh, it scared me. Now look, old man, I don't want to teach you your business, but you've got your back to that grotto. Uh, take a piece of lady back, where she come from? You will not take it to the Villa Borghese. Now, Lucy, flat on your back, down! Signore, signore, I am sorry. I almost make you get hurt. You know you nearly got your own head knocked off. Uh, excuse me, no. I am used to it. Now, I will row you round the blue grotto. I don't think I like it much, Tom. Neither do I. Dark. Except for that blue light under the water. It's transparent. You can see the fish are swimming. It doesn't mean a boatman. This lady who disappeared from the Villa Borghese. Two, three years ago, she disappeared. You say she looked exactly like my wife? See, si, signore. She was going to be married. She was trying on a, what do you call, her wedding dress. Her mother and sisters, they were in the room with her. She walked out on a balcony over the sea. You know what I mean, on a balcony over the sea? And nobody ever hear of her again. You mean... She jumped over into the sea? Oh, a young girl going to be married. Kill herself. No, 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 no. And what did happen? Oh, for the backer, I do not know. But sometimes they say you can meet her ghost in the air. She float just under the water where you can see her and turn over and over. And the wedding veil is still round her face. Tom... Let's get out of here. You want to go, yes? Let's see if this fellow's stringing us along. He's not stringing us along. Then somebody ought to know what this means. If we've inherited a haunted balcony where people disappear like soap bubbles, I say it's too much. Let's get back to our ship and talk to Granger. Yes, Bowman, take us back. Anybody else go to the Blue Grotto? Well, ma'am, no. Not after they saw you go. It's all right. We've just heard the story, Mr. Granger. Oh, I ought to have told you about it myself. All the way out here, I've been cussing myself and thinking what a nornery old badger I am. For not telling you when I first met you in Naples. The girl did vanish, then. By a first-rate miracle, yes. In broad daylight and within 20 feet of her mother and sisters. You don't look like a man who'd believe in miracles, Mr. Granger. Oh, I'm not, son. I'm just telling you what happened. But why is everybody so excited? Somebody must have thrown her off the balcony. Josephine Adams was all alone on a balcony 40 feet up a cliff, smooth as glass. She didn't fall, she wasn't thrown because there was no sound of a splash, and she didn't come back from the balcony because her mother and sisters were in front of the only door. 
Yet, within 15 seconds, 15 seconds, mind you, she just vanished. You believe that? Sure, I believe it, son. Why, it's a fact. Did you know the girl's family? Oh, very well. We've got a real English-speaking colony here. Oh, by the way, in about a half a minute now, I'm going to show you your new home. Oh, can we see it here, aren't you? Oh, sure you can, ma'am. It's on the edge of the cliff. Dr. Davis's house is on one side of it, and my shack's on the other. Uh, that's why I want to ask you a question. Of course. Ask anything you like. Well, I'm an old stager, ma'am, and not exactly up to the high-toned society around here, but do you... Do you trust me? Yes, I think so. Well, then, promise me something. Unless you're with somebody you do trust, keep away from that balcony. Do you honestly think there's danger? Or... I don't know, son. If I did, I wouldn't have to talk this way. Sounds like a dog barking. I thought I heard it before. What well, is a big police dog. And led by a very handsome woman, if you ask me. Oh, Lord, here she is again. Who? The Countess. She lives in our colony. She looks like an American. You take your eyes off for Tom Courtney. <laughs> she is an American. Married a Count Parcheesi or something like that. <laughs> Just call her Nellie. My dear Mr. Granger. Hello, Nellie. It's true. Everybody told me so, but I couldn't believe it until I saw her. She does look exactly like poor Josephine Adams. Just as small, just as dainty. <laughs> Please, is everybody trying to give me the jitters? Nellie, I, I want you to meet some friends of mine. Oh, you don't need to introduce me. I know who they are. You're the nice young couple who've taken that villa. I'm Nellie Lacase. Oh, yes. This is my dog, Tiberius, named after the wicked Roman emperor. You know who used to live at Capri? I must confess I'm terribly fascinated by wicked things. <laughs> Aren't you, Mr. Courtney? Lucy, stop digging me in the ribs. I haven't done anything. No, and you're not going to. Tiberius seems to have taken quite a fancy to you, Mrs. Courtney. Oh. I've never known him to go to a stranger before. Well, I only wish I could borrow him. He might be a charm against... Oh, I don't know. We'll be at the harbor in a few minutes. Then you must let me drive you up to the villa. You won't be able to get any servants, I'm afraid, because they won't stay there. But you can camp out. Look. There's the villa. We're passing it now. Where? On the cliff. Where I'm pointing. Wait a minute. Oh, there must be some mistake. That's not the villa, Borghese. It sure is, son. That's a palace like all the other houses there. And I rented it furnished for about $25 a month. Can't you guess why you got it so cheap, son? If you take my advice, you'll turn around and go back to Naples by the next steamer. Harry Granger, don't be an idiot. Let's have some excitement. Let's have some excitement. Tom is beautiful. Too infernally beautiful, if you ask me. There, there's the balcony. It's all right by daylight, son. Marble and tapestries and whatnot. But at night, when you gotta put out the lights, you start thinking what happened there. The moon over Capri makes a deathly daylight. You could see to read on that balcony if anyone went out there. Frosted glass doors open out on it from a big room on the ground floor. Two determinedly calm persons and a dog sit looking at each other. Lucy, stop it. Stop what? Stop looking over at that balcony. I'm sorry, darling. Uh, why are we sitting here anyway? There's an outer room that's much more comfortable. It's like having a toothache. A very little toothache. I may be dense, Angel, but I, I don't follow you. You put your tongue against the tooth to see if it'll hurt. You know it will hurt, but you go on doing it just the same. Well, that's us. <sighs> Maybe you're right. Oh, Tom, did you ever think we'd have a lovely house like this? Yeah, the house is all right, yes. Then they have to go and spoil everything. Our honeymoon. With this blasted Tommy rot about... Tom, you're as jittery now as I was this afternoon. Oh, even Tiberius is jittery. Yes, I guess I am. Easy, boy. Easy, easy. Well, there's whiskey on the table. In a minute. Not just now. There's nothing wrong with that balcony. Suppose you walked out there this minute. I've had a horrible longing to try it. Just because I know I shouldn't. Well, nothing could attack you. All you'd have to do would be to yell. Well, that'd bring Mr. Granger out on his balcony like a shot. And the neighbor on the other side of us... Who is on the other side, by the way? A specialist in brain diseases. Dr. Davis. He's English. Easy, Tiberius. Easy. Tom, I'm afraid. It's all right, darling. You hold Tiberius's collar while I open the door. Good evening, Mr. Courtney. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Courtney. 
I, I'm no ghost. I'm merely your neighbor, Dr. Rutherford Davis. Oh, oh y- y- yes, of, of course. I, I, I trust you will pardon this intrusion. Uh, no one answered my knock, so I, I ventured to come in. <laughs> it's no intrusion, Dr. Davis, Mr. Courtney. I, I wish I could say work at Capri, but I have a very different message. Well? If you value Mrs. Courtney's life, you'll go back to Naples immediately, sir. Not you, too. I do not say that as a ghost hunter, sir. I say it as a medical man. Um, may I sit down? Oh, of course. Please do. Oh, thank you. We seem to be forgetting our manners. Uh, Dr. Davis, will you, um, will you have a drink? Oh, uh, thank you. Perhaps a small whiskey? Uh, I'll get it, darling. You sit down and talk to Dr. Davis. You're not going back into that room alone. I'm only going to get the drink, Tom. I promise to be good. And Tiberius can come with me. Can't you, Tiberius? <laughs> Oh, I see you've thought of Tiberius from the Countess of Yes, she was kind enough to offer him. Excuse me, I'll be back in a minute. Come on, Tiberius. Hi. I hope this is all right, Doctor. No, sir. It is not all right. Your wife is in very great danger. But why? Because of that balcony? Uh, no. Because she looks exactly like the late Josephine Adams. I don't get it. Uh, Mr. Courtney, did you ever hear of paranoia? It's some kind of mental disease, isn't it? The paranoic begins by imagining that he or she is being persecuted by someone. First, he hears things. A voice in his brain whispers, You'll be killed. You'll be killed. You'll be killed. He hears it in the tick of a clock, in the rattle of a train, in the footsteps on the street. There are holes in the walls through which his enemy is always watching. Invisible speaking tubes bring him messages. There are pains in his joints and nightmares of attempts to poison him. His brain bursts and he kills. He kills. He kills. Oh, boy. Excuse me for speaking so strongly, but how does this affect us? Uh, Mr. Courtney, will you, uh, uh, will you examine this sheet of paper? What is it? The fragment of a typewritten diary. I found it on the cliffs months ago. Don't ask me who wrote it. But I know there's a criminal lunatic on this island. He imagined that poor, inoffensive Josephine Adams was his enemy. So he killed her. Killed her? Oh. I don't know. And what happened to the girl's body? (laughs) I'm not a detective, sir. The body was carried out to sea, perhaps, or washed along the cliffs and into the blue grotto to be lost. But don't you understand the danger to your wife? You're not suggesting that with somebody's cracked brain, your wife is Josephine Adams, created all over again. Kill Lucy? But it couldn't be done. It was done, my friend. Listen. That sounded like a dog howling. Mrs. Courtney is rather a long time in getting that whiskey. She wouldn't go near the balcony. She promised not to go out on the balcony. People do very perverse things, my friend. When they know they shouldn't. Lucy! Lucy! That seems to be Tiberius out on the balcony. I, uh, I, I, I can't see anything else from here. She's gone. She's gone. She's gone. empty balcony, a howling dog, and a sea turned clear silver under the moon. Then, after the tumult and the shouting, there are other pictures. Don't you hear the noise of that motor launch with a half-demented young man at the wheel? Three other familiar figures are gathered around it. Don't you recognize the brunette prettiness of Nelly Lucasa? The white ten-gallon hat of Harry Granger. And the neat, pointed beard of Dr. Davis. But what on earth is he going to do? Out here in this motorboat. I'd like to know that one myself. Listen, please. All of you. Now, take it easy, son. We're with you. What time is it? Time? Yes. What time is it? It's half past two in the morning. Going on for three. Twelve hours. Then the tide ought to be just where it was this afternoon. What's the tag got to do with it? A whole lot. 
Somebody set a trap and made Lucy fall off that balcony. I know it. Oh, that's absurd. If Lucy's been carried out to sea, there's nothing we can do about it. But if she's been carried along with the current and into the Blue Grotto... Blue Grotto? Uh, one moment, sir. You're not proposing to run this big launch under that arch after dark? Yes, Doctor. That's just exactly it. Go on. Do it. I'll back you up. Let's have some excitement. It'll be exciting enough, I assure you. Mr. Courtney, have you got some wild hope of recovering your wife's body? I've even got a wild hope she may be alive. Lucy's a very strong swimmer. You're acting like a nut, son. Get set, everybody. I'm going to swing around. We're in the current now. Better hold tight. I've got to duck my own head when we go through. Everybody else, squat down. I still protest against this. Don't you understand, Mr. Court? Get ready. Here we go. What on earth is wrong? There's no blue grotto. It's as black as pitch. My dear Nellie, I kept trying to tell all of you. The blue grotto effect is caused by the sun's rays. There never is one except when the sun is out. Uh, just how does our friend propose to find anything in here? Listen. Something got hold of the side of the boat. I, I felt it move. Not the dead girl, I trust. There's a hand here. A wet hand. Lucy, she's not alive. Mr. Ranger, help me lift her up over the side. Easy, easy now. Don't tip the boat. Oh, Lucy. Lucy, are you all right? Don't. Are you all right, Lucy? Can you hear me? All right. Just exhausted. I got in here. Couldn't swim out against the current. Oh, don't try to talk. I've got to talk. Are you faint? Tom, who's with you? Only our friends. Who's with you? Is the murderer with you? I was just wondering the same thing. To be shut up in the dark at three o'clock in the morning with a criminal lunatic. Uh... What's that? Now, Lucy, don't hold me so tight. Let go, dear. I'll get the boat started and have you out of here in a second. What's that? Only Dr. Davis. Tom, I've got to tell you. I know how that, that girl, Josephine Adam, died. Almost killed me. Has anybody here got some brandy? Or a flashlight? I have a flashlight, my friend. Will you allow me, as a medical man, to examine Mrs. Courtney? You better keep back for just a second, Doctor. She's hysterical. Uh, give me the flashlight, please. I walked into the other room. Nobody with me. All alone except Tiberius. Yes, Lucy. Somebody called my name. From the balcony, I thought. Very softly. Mrs. Courtney said. Mrs. Courtney. Did you recognize the voice? Yes. That's why I went. Oh, and you better start up this boat and get out of here. I and... won't pay any attention to them, Lucy. Nobody can hurt you now. I went out in the balcony. The bright moonlight. Bright as day. But there was nobody there. Nobody on the balcony? No. I looked out over the sea. And then something came at me. Something flew out of the air and came at me. Just one moment before Mrs. Courtney goes on. Is anybody in this boat carrying a revolver? Not that I know of. Excuse my mentioning it, but I felt something. Metal, like a revolver, uh, brush past my hand. Oh, it was only the flashlight. Excuse me, it was not a flashlight. Mr. Courtney's got the flashlight. Would you please let Lucy go on and finish? Lucy, you were on the balcony and something came at you. Yes. Like a snake, sideways, out of the air. It went over my head, fastened around my neck. It was a rope with a running noose in it. A rope? That's it, a rope. It was thrown from another balcony. I'm small and light like Josephine Adams. But it pulled me sideways and over the rail. I fell. I think I begin to understand what... I couldn't see what happened to Josephine Adams. Frosted glass doors to the balcony. So they couldn't see. I'll take it easy now. You're perfectly safe. But is she perfectly safe? The murderer let her fall on the rope. But the rope was jerked tight long before she struck the water. That broke her neck. Then the murderer lowered her softly. So there wasn't any splash. And the current took her away, rope and all. That's it. It would have happened to me. 
Only the rope must have slipped through the murderer's fingers. Through whose fingers? What did I tell you? Somebody in this boat has got a revolver. Who's overboard? Somebody went, switched on that light, my friend, and shined it on the water. All right, Doctor. There's your light. Look at it. Turning over and over. The water in the blue grotto is red now. Tom, stay close to me. What's all right, Lucy? I swear you're safe enough now. Did he shoot himself? Yes. Did who shoot himself? Who had a balcony exactly like ours on the house next door? Who began life as a cowpuncher and would have known how to use a lasso? Yes, and knew Josephine Adams well. And got it into his maniac's head that Mrs. Courtney was Josephine Adams all over again. Harry Granger. Look. There's his ten-gallon hat floating away. And so ends The Bride Vanishes, a story of mysterious doings. Tonight, Columbia brings you, as a guest star, Peter Lorre, one of the screen's past masters of the art of suspense. Suspense is compounded of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. In this series are stories calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. Tonight, for instance, Mr. Lorre plays for us a doctor, a husband, with something dark and terrible on his mind. Was it murder? And if so, can this at last be the really perfect crime? We trust that while you are wondering, we shall keep you in... Suspense. For Suspense tonight, CBS presents Till Death Do Us Part by John Dixon Carr, starring Peter Lorre. Late one night in December of 1941, a man and his wife sat beside the fire in their country cottage. This man, look at him. A professor of mathematics, stout, middle-aged, guileless as a child. In the remote corner of England where he lives with his pretty English wife, they say of him... Jolly decent fellow, you know, for a foreigner. Isn't he? Always a smile for everybody and so polite. That's why it's such a shame about his wife and that young American. There hasn't been anything between them yet, I'm almost sure. But if the American stays here much longer... Shh, I tell you. A happy man, this Professor Kraft. His cottage in the country is rather isolated. Three miles from the nearest house. No electricity or central heating or telephone. And on December nights like this, a great wind comes rushing off the Sussex Downs. It rattles at the windows, growls in the chimney, and makes unsteady the oil lamp on the table. Professor Irwin Kraft sits before the fire in a snug book-lined room. And across from him, sewing, sits his young wife, Cynthia. A domestic scene. A very domestic scene. Oh, my pet, this is wonderful, isn't it? Oh, so nice and cozy. <laughs> ah, how I enjoy our little home. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be indoors on a night like this, isn't it? <laughs> yes. My darling, have a good day. Just about as usual. No adventures, huh? Not exactly. I walked into the village. Walked? Oh, I really blame myself for burying you out here. I ought to get your car. That's not necessary, thanks. Come now, come. Did something happen to upset my little pet today? No, no, no. You know, darling, I look at you and I marvel. You marvel at what? At a wife who can actually blush. Yes. With a skin so fair and a conscience so transparent that she can actually blush. I wasn't blushing about... About what? About 
anything you might be thinking. <laughs> it's your horrible habit of putting everybody else in the wrong. Oh, but the neighbors don't think that about Papa Croft. The neighbors don't have to live with you. I do. And you mustn't scratch either. Not when we are so snuggy or so cozy. And a kettle on a fire is nearly boiling. And the rum is ready and the lemon juice and the sugar for her medicine. Oh, and must I drink that stuff? I don't like rum. But you have a cold, darling. I haven't got a cold. Really, I haven't. Now, darling, twice today I heard you cough. Uh, you are going to take your medicine, thank you. And take it here and now. And not offend your clumsy old husband by refusing. Why do you keep on treating me like a girl of 16? I love to treat you like that, Cynthia, because, uh, because I cannot fathom your thoughts. You lock up your thoughts. And that is a dangerous English habit. You see, thoughts accumulate and won't be stifled. And sooner or later, when you least expect it... Oh, look out. The cat is boiling over. So it is. Oh, and please, lift it down from there. Of course. Of... I apologize. I oh. apologize, my darling. There. For a second, you know, you almost frightened me. Huh? <laughs> I frightened you? I suppose it's foolish. Well, here we are, my dear. Here we are. Now, see, I put two tumblers on the coffee table. And now, a spoon in each so that the heat doesn't crack them. Oh, dear, must you give me so much rum? Can't I have a small one? But we have to cure that cold of yours, Cynthia. <laughs> now comes the lemon juice. Yeah. And now comes hot water to the top. <laughs> Here we are. And... Two lumps of sugar for each of us. There you are, darling. Now let's drink up, huh? Oh, listen. I didn't hear anything. I did. It, it came from that cupboard over there. It sounded like your accordion. Oh, that's nonsense, darling. That's nonsense. There. There it is again. Well, that's only the wind. Or, or perhaps a rat that got into the cupboard. Oh, and I'm terrified of rats. Go and kill it. Would you mind? Oh, you really set very heavy labors, my sweet, for one of my weight. Well, well, if you insist, all right. Well, I'll take a good heavy poker from the fireplace. And, of course, it means a little trip through the cupboard. Oh, and uh, never mind. You haven't changed your mind, have you? It would probably run out across the floor. Come back. Wouldn't run very far, I'm sure. Well, <laughs> again, if you insist... I can't think what's the matter with me tonight. No? No. You're sure nothing upset you in the village today, huh? Certainly not. How about uh, this young American, that uh, fledgling doctor, what's his name? You mean Dr. Craig? That's it, Dr. Craig. Dr. Craig. Didn't someone say he was leaving today for London and, and then back to the States? I believe so. Uh, that's what Lady Randolph told me. And you didn't say goodbye to him? Certainly not. Well, that wasn't kind of you, darling. That wasn't friendly. But you matter, don't you like my nice hot rum drink? No. But you'll give me no peace till I do drink it. That's right, darling. That's right. Now, take it down like a good girl. I'm keeping you company. See? Oh, how pretty she looks. With her yellow hair in the firelight. And her red mouth. And her light little hands. Very pretty. Oh, uh, there is just one other thing, Cynthia. I, I gave you a letter to post this afternoon. Did you post it? Yes. Registered? Yes. And uh, did you notice to whom the letter was addressed? Everybody notices the address on an envelope. It was to some Mr. Hatterby at Market Shepherd. That's right. But uh, I don't know who he is, if that's what you mean. Oh, Mr. Hatterby is uh, the coroner of this district. The coroner? That's right. That's right. But is there any reason why you should be writing letters to the coroner? Well... <laughs> There will be tomorrow morning. We have been just drinking poison, my love. Why do you drop your glass on me? <laughs> I don't believe you. No? <laughs> uh, this will interest you, Cynthia. You were a trained nurse, and weren't you? Uh... You see, the poison was aconite. Mum shoes. No. Yes, homegrown in our own little garden. You know, one sixteenth of a grain has been a fatal dose. This is telephone here. No car, not even a neighbor. Exactly, my angel. Take your hands off me. Let 
Get up. No, my pet. In about five minutes, you see, the, the first symptoms will come on. Symptoms? Yes. Our throats will grow dry. <laughs> our eyesight will turn dim. No. And presently, we'll lose the use of our limbs. Well, there are convulsions before the end, I believe, but he won't feel them. Let me help. If, if you try to hit at me, Angel, you'll upset that lamp and... Well, if you upset the lamp, his cottage would go up like tinder. We don't want to burn to death, do we? Owen, why are you doing this? Why are you doing it? Why? Do you think all Papa Kraft is blind, my pet? Huh? If I can't have you, Cynthia, nobody else is going to have you. You mean Jim Craig? <laughs> so it is Jim Craig. That was nothing. My tongue slipped. A cynic would say, my dear, that your foot slipped. Do you think I don't know what happened the other night? At the schoolhouse? Schoolhouse? Yes, the Market Shepherd Schoolhouse. At Lady Randolph's little concert in aid of the war relief. Nothing happened. I swear it didn't. No? No. Oh, then it was coincidence, I suppose, that you and that Dr. Craig didn't arrive until the concert was nearly over. Yes. Yes, it was. We didn't go there together. No? We met in the little hall outside the auditorium. It was just as you were finishing your number on the accordion. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh. It's so dark here, I almost bumped into you. Isn't that Mrs. Craig? Yes. Good evening, Dr. Craig. We... We seem to be late. Very late, I'm afraid. I... I was detained on a case. Then I didn't feel like coming here at all. Oh, just a moment before I open that door for you. Won't it look a little funny, our arriving here together? Funny? Why should it? I, no reason at all, only... Cynthia, listen to me. Do you know, Dr. Craig, that's the first time you've ever called me by my first name. I did want to have a word with you somehow. Of course, you've heard the news. What news? Well, on the radio for the past couple of days. Oh, we're too far out to get much news, and my husband isn't interested. He isn't interested? He isn't interested in anything but himself. I'd rather you didn't talk that way about my husband. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you push the door open a little? Lady Randolph is saying something. I'm sure we've all enjoyed our friend Professor Croft's musical numbers on the accordion. <laughs> and the vicar's conjuring trick. <laughs> and little Miss Linshaw's spirited recitation. It only remains for me to tell you that the collection for this little entertainment will amount to this. We get Colonel Thompson. What is it? Colonel Thompson's going across the platform in rather a hurry. Looks like an announcement of some kind. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention. We have just received some late news by the 9 o'clock bulletin. I think I can guess what it is. Following yesterday's declaration against Japan, the Congress of the United States today declared war against Germany and Italy. No applause, please. I think I can say that these things go too deep for applause. We entered a war lightly, and we have learned. But before the vicar ends this meeting... I shall ask the orchestra to play us the song numbered 83 in the book. A song we know is dear to the hearts of all Americans. Close the doors, Cynthia. Jim, this doesn't affect you. Naturally, it does. You won't be leaving England. Probably in a very short time. We'll be needing doctors. But does a formal declaration of war make any difference? What does it mean to you? What does it mean? I, I can't explain it, Cynthia. And following that song, if they're going to need me, I'll go back. But can't you do just as much good here in England? I don't know. That depends on what the army says. And doesn't anything depend on what I say? We haven't got much time, Cynthia. That car will be out in a minute. Yes. And we won't admit it, will we? Admit what? Admit how we feel about each other. I haven't said... Nor I. I was only talking about what we were thinking. No, we won't admit it. You say you can't explain about the war. I can't explain about this. Don't try. It's better this way. Owen's being very good to me. And he's such a childlike person. Yes. Everybody likes him. Oh, he has his tempers. It's not easy to live with sometimes, in spite of what they think. 
But I can't do anything to hurt him. Because he'd never do anything to hurt me. Never, never, never in the world. A very fair estimate of my character, too. That's exactly what I said about you. So you are in love with that fellow? I admit it now. Yes. Tell me, darling, do you feel anything yet? Feel anything? I mean, uh, dryness, muscular contraction of the throat? Yes. Oh, I thought so. I won't die. And I won't. And how do you propose to stop yourself? <laughs> Your only chance would be to reach the village infirmary. And I'll see to it that you don't get there. But what if the poison takes you before it takes me? Then you can't stop me. But it won't, darling. You seem terribly sure of that. You see, the amount I gave you, as you perhaps noticed, was more than I gave myself. I'm going to follow you, my little pet, into the dark, where there are no Dr. Jim Craig's. But not too quickly. I shall still have most of my faculties, Cynthia, when your convulsions... I already begin. Oh. I wonder if you will. Why do you say that? Your legs don't seem any too steady. Ah, I don't know. It must be the heat of uh, the fire, perhaps. So it's very hot in this room. Cynthia, senior darling, listen to me. Yes, Irwin. There, there is a copy of uh, of Taylor's medical jurisprudence on the there over on the shelf there. Please, uh, please get it for me. I'm afraid you'll have to get it for yourself, my dear. That is, if you can. Oh, uh, I'll get it. Uh, uh, mind the lamp, Irwin. We don't want the house of fire, just as you said yourself. I'll mind the lamp. Uh, listen to me. You know, some people's systems aren't tolerant to poisons. The, the experience in minutes would ought to take hours. Does it hurt, Irwin? Does it hurt? Oh, yes. But you'll find out soon enough, my pet. Because, because you'll never make three miles to the village. Never. You think not? I know it. And, and just remember, I, I shall be waiting. Waiting? Out in the dark and cold. Where there is neither marriage nor giving in in marriage, I'll be waiting for my little pet to come and join me. I, I shall be waiting. Owen. Owen. Oh, I hate you. I love you. I'm afraid of you, but I don't want you to die because of me. And, and yet, you are dead, Irwin. But I'm not going to join you. I've never prayed much, Irwin, but I'm praying now. Whatever comes over my wits and makes my senses weak, give me strength enough to get to the village. Just give me strength enough to get to the village. An empty room now, except for the motionless figure by the fire. The great wind enters through an open front door and makes the lamp shake dangerously on the tables. The whole house creaks. Otherwise, it is very quiet. Suddenly, the corpse sits up. Professor Kraft looks pleased, doesn't he? Very pleased. Very alert. As he moves over to a certain cupboard door. <laughs> well, and now I think the real fun can begin. <laughs> patience, 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 my friend, while I open the cupboard door. <laughs> well, there we are. I hope you haven't been too uncomfortable, Dr. James Craig. I'm all right, thanks. So you managed to get the gag out of your mouth, huh? I managed it, yes, just now. 
I'm too late. Well, you are still securely tied up, I'm glad to say. You know, you gave me several very, very unpleasant moments, young man, when you when you got your foot on that accordion. Did I? Well, Cynthia thought you were a rat and wanted me to kill you. You know, she shows very good sense sometimes. I could hear both of you talking. Thanks very much. Oh, of course, you could, of course. Excuse me, please. I, I forgot that. Yes, and I could see you, too, through a crack in the door. Well, you were intended to see us. But now, come on. First of all, I'll drag you out of here. Yes, now, let me take you. Yes. Now we can sit down and have a nice, cozy little chat. Huh? How much aconite did you give Cynthia? How much? Oh, about uh, two grains. Two, two grains? Well, then she can't possibly... No, she can't possibly live until morning. But she can live long enough to testify that she saw me die. And how much poison did you take yourself? I? None. None at all? No, none at all. But you mixed those drinks out of the same materials I saw you do it. Well, but there was many poison in the room, young man. You see, two lumps of sugar steeped in aconite were dropped into Cynthia's glass. I marked them, and I didn't make a mistake. <laughs> Can you see the beginnings of Papa Croft's plan? Why, you... You see, uh, Cynthia left the door open, my friend. And there is a very strong wind blowing tonight. Well? Just observe how it lifts the table cover, flutters the magazines, makes the lamp tremble. I shouldn't be surprised, you know, if uh, if one of those lamps blew over. A fine crash in a sheet of flame. What? <laughs> and when they come here tomorrow morning, after Cynthia's testimony in my letter to the coroner, they'll expect to find at least a, at least a few charred bones among the ruins. And, of course, they must find some remains. Whose remains? Yours. Yes, you've got me tied up pretty well, haven't you? And now, you see... <laughs> now comes the best. You were last seen going to the railway station, to London, and then to America. Nobody, nobody will inquire after you. Except Cynthia. That's right, except Cynthia, who will be dead. That I waylaid you and brought you here while Cynthia was in the village will not be known to our good coroner, and I shall disappear. What do you think of it, young man, huh? I think it's rather good, huh? You're, you're going to let me burn to death? Yes, and I shall enjoy the necessity. By the way, too bad you missed my performance at Lady Randall's concert. It was very nice. But uh, then I think you were otherwise occupied. You could call it that? Occupied, I think, in making love to my wife. You hurt my vanity, young man, and you are going to suffer for it. I've never made love to your wife. No? No. But I don't suppose you could possibly believe that. Are you already begging for mercy? Now, come on, now, come on. Are you begging for mercy? No, I think not. Dr. Craig, I don't like the way you're taking this. I really don't. Don't you? No. You ought to be afraid. All decent men should be afraid. And no man is heroic when he sees death coming. But you are as white as a plate. Can't take your eyes off me. And seem to be expecting something. Maybe I am expecting something. Yeah? Well, <laughs> I think I can persuade you to tell me what's on your mind, my friend. If I use the poker out of the fire, huh? You see, you see, I'm a mathematician. I leave nothing to chance. Do you hear that, Professor Kraft? A car has stopped out in front. Well, they won't come in here. But of course they will. It's probably the home guard. Look, you fool, you've left the front door standing wide open in a blackout. Don't be childish. Do you think to upset me with that? Something's upset you. Take a look at yourself in the mirror. Hmm? Nothing. Nothing can upset my plans now. Everything is ready. My clothes and my money are in a stable. This place, this pretty little cottage, will be a furnace. All I have to do is... <laughs> All I have to do is pick up that lamp. You see... Like this, and something is wrong with me. Oh, you're not acting this time, are you? You're not pretending now. You, you swine! What have you done to me? I have done nothing. You, you have done something to me. I, I can feel it. There, there is sweat all over me. My, my throat, choking. <laughs> It sounded like, like my wife's voice. It was.
was Cynthia's voice. What is wrong with you? I certainly think you were drunk. I'm sorry, Lady Randall. Stopping me in the road and asking to be taken to the infirmary at 80 miles an hour, and then finding there is nothing wrong with you. Oh, but, but it can be. It is impossible. Oh, but it is. You see, your plans didn't include the fact that Cynthia doesn't like rum. Mm. Remember, you poured a very large drink for her and a small one for yourself. Mm. And you filled both glasses with hot water. Mm. Oh, remember, when she got, got you to leave her and come over to this cupboard, mm. she changed the glasses then. You're the one who swallowed the poison, two grains of aconite. No. no. Help me. Please. Help me. Nothing on earth can save you. Help me, please. In the name of... Baby, please. Please help me. Nothing on earth can save you. Please. No. You won't. <laughs> then. And then I'll show you. I'll. I'll take you with me. <laughs> I'll take everybody with me. Where are you going? I'll. I'll get that lamp. I'll take you with me. I look at you. You can't even I'll, see. You're blind. You're I'll, staggering straight into that cupboard. I'll, I'll take you. I'll take you with me. <laughs> I'll take you. Jim. Jim, what are you doing here? Come in, Cynthia. Come in and take a look at the man who died twice. And so ends Till Death Do Us Part, starring Peter Lorre. Tonight's story of Suspect. Columbia presents these tales of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next Tuesday, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. Mr. Laurie was starred as Professor Kraft. He was supported by Alice Frost as Cynthia, David Gothard as Dr. Craig, and Mercedes McCambridge as Lady Randolph. William Spear, the producer, John Deeks, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer, conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on... Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Tonight, Columbia brings you his guest star. Hollywood's genial character actor, Stuart Irwin. The story is by the author of The Thin Man and the Maltese Falcon, Dashiell Hammett, one of America's acknowledged masters of the art of suspense. Suspense is compounded of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. In this series are stories calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. Tonight, for instance, Stuart Irwin plays for us a pleasant, easygoing assistant chief of police in a small town who, to everyone's surprise, was instrumental in solving a murder. We trust that with this tale we shall keep you in... Suspense. For Suspense tonight, CBS presents Stuart Irwin in Two Sharp Knives by Dashiell Hammett. Shortly after 2 a.m., a poker game had just broken up at Ben Kensley's, the doctor coroner of Deerwood City. Scott Anderson, Deerwood's chief of police, and Wally Shane, his assistant, were standing outside. Where are we heading for, Scott? Let's walk across the street, Wally. Railroad station. Gee, aren't you afraid of the excitement, chief? Don't you think that watching the 211 come in is apt to be too much for your blood pressure? Well, if it is, Wally, you can always carry on. You've been a pretty good imitation of an assistant to me for some time now. Yeah? Yeah. If anything happens to me, you'd be the chief. Don't worry. It won't be any harder for you to fool the public as chief. Hi, Elmer. Uh, howdy, Scott. Uh, hello, Wally. 
Kind of late for you boys to be around, ain't it? No, I don't know. We sort of figured we'd put the town to bed tonight. How's the 211? On time? Right on the nose. She ought to be blowing for the bend in just about three seconds now. Yep. What did I tell you? It's her now. Expecting anyone on her, Scott? No, I'm around not expecting anyone. Well, and I just thought we'd come over and watch you come in, that's all. You know, Elmer, you never can tell who might get off, though. Dick Turpin and Henry Morgan, Jesse James, Dick, Jack the Ripper, or six officers of Mor- Murder Incorporated, or even your Aunt Gussie. I guess you're right, Wally. Well, here she be. Pardon me, Jim, but I gotta be rolling the wagon out to the baggage car. Well, I can't complain. I can't complain, Cap. Well, maybe you can't, Elmer, but I sure can if you hold us up with that freight there. You got more, much more? Nope. Yeah, this is the last piece now. There you are, Cap. All done. Okay. See you tomorrow, Elmer. Hey, Scott. Do you see what I see? You mean, do I see the man who just got off that train? The answer's yes. Well, he's a ringer for the guy we got a picture of. That is the guy. Well, then, what do we do now? We take him, Wally. My car's at the corner of the alley. Oh, but, Scott... We'll tail him up the street. Okay, Scott. There he goes now, over toward the taxi stand. Come on. Let's follow him. Hello, Farman. Huh? Oh, I... I don't believe You're Mr. I... Farman, aren't you? Yes, I am. Philadelphia? Yes. I'm Scott Anderson, Chief of Police. What? Chief of... What's happened to her? Happened to who? Oh, oh no, you don't. No. Let me go. Right. You think you can pull that sort of stuff okay. with me? You're Stop very much... Let me get a crack at that mug. Oh, no, no, no. Wait a minute. No. Wait a minute. Hold it, Wally. Well, Furman? Oh, I... I... I'm sorry. For a moment there, I thought you weren't really a policeman. Thanks. Nice to know I look almost human. Yes, it... It was silly of me. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, let's get going now before anything else happens. Okay, Furman, get in the car. I'll drive, Scott. Here you go. I'll, uh, are you taking me to police headquarters? That's right. What for? Philadelphia? I, uh, I don't think I understand. You understand that you're wanted in Philadelphia for murder, don't you? Murder? Why, that's ridiculous. That's... Who told you that? Well, it's a cinch he didn't make it up. But wait, uh, there must be... Take it easy now. Sweden will get down to headquarters. And I'll show you what I mean. Now then, here's the circular on Lester Furman. It was sent out by the Trans-America Detective Agency in Philadelphia. Take a look at it. Oh, yeah. $1,500 reward for the arrest and conviction of Lester Furman, alias Lloyd Fields, alias J.D. Carpenter, for the... for the murder of Paul Frank Dunlap in Philadelphia on December 8th, 1942. Well... It's a lie. You're Furman, aren't you? Oh, yes, but... That's your picture on the circular, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes, but I... Hey, I... Scott, I see you and Wally got Furman, huh? Oh, hello, Judge. Uh, you lucky stiffs. Now you two split a grand and a half reward. i uh, never seen nothing like it. You know, if it ain't vacations in New York at the city's expense, it's reward dough. Judge, someday, if you don't remember you're the jailer around here, not the D.A., Hmm? You're going to be wearing your teeth on the outside of your lips, and I'll be the guys who arrange them that way. Savvy? Uh, just because you caught a guy who was hot in Philadelphia. It's a lie. It's a frame-up. You can't prove anything. There's nothing to prove. I never killed anybody. I won't be framed. Take it I easy, won't be framed. Furman, take it easy. You're wasting your breath on us. Save it for the Philadelphia police. We're just holding you for them. But it's not the police. It's the Trans-America we Detective. We turn you over to the Philadelphia police. Mr. Anderson, I... I... Well, then... Then there's nothing I can do now? There's nothing any of us can do till morning. You'll have to search you now, then we won't bother you anymore till they come for you. What, I... Wally, you look through his bag. I'll see what he's got in his pockets. Okay, Scott. Well, all he's got on him are some business cards, a few letters, a hundred and... hundred and sixty dollars, a book of checks in the Philadelphia bank, and a few odds and ends. What's with the bag, Wally? Not much. A couple of changes of clothes, some toilet articles, and... Oh, here's a thirty-eight, Loaded. 
Pretty little thing, isn't it? Okay, put those things in what I got in the vault. All right, George. You can take Fermin now and lock him up. This is the most ridiculous come thing Come on, I... darling, come on. We ain't had nobody in our little hoosco for three days running. There you are. You'll have it all to yourself. Just like a sweet of the rich. What time? Come on, in you go. I tell you, 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 you're making a mistake. I demand to be allowed to get in touch with my lawyer. Hey, how about you boys cutting me in on a little of that blood money, huh? Oh, sure, George, sure. I'll forget all about that two and a half you've been owing me for three months. Mm-hmm. Make Fleming as comfortable as you can, George. Take good care of him. He's valuable, huh? Yeah, now, if it was some bum that didn't mean a nickel to you. George, any day now, I'm going to forget that your uncle is county chairman and throw you back in the gutter just to see how high he'll bounce. Remember that. Oh, Scott, I, I didn't mean nothing. That's I... all, George. Never mind the rest. I'm going home now. If anything's urgent, I can reach there. But get this. I don't want to be disturbed. Unless it is urgent. Hello. Hello. Scott, this is Wally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, what, what, what time is it? It's five after six in the morning, and you'd better come right down, Scott. That fellow Furman's hung himself. What? Furman hung himself? Yep, by his belt, from a window bar. Dinner and a mackerel. I'll be right in, Molly. Phone Doc Camsley and tell him I'll pick him up on my way down. No doctor's going to do Furman any good, Scott. Well, it won't hurt to have him looked at. You'd better phone the chronic court at Douglasville, too, and file a routine report. Already did that. And what's more, hold on to your seat. The DA's on his way over, in person. The DA? Yeah. I'll be there before you hang up, Wally. Chief, Ted Carroll, the DA, is here, and he's plenty hot under the collar. What's he burning about? Oh, he's just mad, running up quite a phone bill on us, too. Been calling Philadelphia every couple of minutes since he got here. What kept you so long? Ah, I couldn't get my car started. Now, right, let's go in and see the old buzzer. No, Ted? Listen, Scott, what is all this? Oh, well, what? There's some funny business going on here. What's funny about it? Man hangs himself. Just another case of suicide. Sure, it was suicide. But I just telephoned Transamerica. Dug a guy out of bed there. And he said they'd never sent out circulars on Furman. Didn't know about any murder he was wanted for. All they could tell me about him was he used to be a client of theirs. I don't know what to say, Ted. I don't either. Oh, a fine chief of police you are. What on earth kept you so long? Car store. Came as quick as I could. It's just so crabby, Ted. Nothing. I guess it's just the district attorney in Ah, oh, now, come, come, gentlemen. Nobody'd know you two are staunch admirers of each other. <laughs> okay, Wally. Tell me, what do you make of it? Well, there's plenty wrong, Scott. First, that Trans-America thing. They never sent out circulars about Furman. And now, get this. I talked to the Philly police just before you came in. There wasn't even any Paul Frank Dunlap murdered. There wasn't? No. What did you get out of Furman before you let him hang himself? That he was innocent. Didn't you grill him? Didn't you find out what he was doing in town? Wally, didn't you? What for? He admitted he was Furman. The description fitted him. The photograph was him. The Trans-America Detective Agency is supposed to be on the level, ain't it? Philadelphia wanted Furman. We didn't. But stop. I sure, Ted. If I'd have known he was going to hang himself. Yeah, but then if your aunt wore pants, he'd be your uncle. He said Furman had been a client of Trans-America. Did they tell you what the job they did for him was? His wife left him a couple of years ago, and he had them hunting for her for five or six months. But they never found her. They're sending a man up here tonight to look things over. Yeah, huh? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going out and grab a quick bite. But I might as well tell you, Scott, there's going to be trouble over this. I know that, Ted. There usually is when somebody dies in a jail cell. Well, so what's become of that 1,500 fish now, huh, Scott? What happened here last night, George? Nothing. Foreman hung himself. Did you find him? Uh huh. Wally took a look in here to see how things was before he went off duty, and he found him. You're asleep, I suppose. Well, uh, I was catching a nap, I guess, but everybody does that sometimes, Scott. Even Wally sometimes when he comes in off his beat between rounds. Yeah, but I always wake up when the phone rings or anything. Oh, sure. 
Well, suppose I had been awake. Can't hear a guy hanging himself, can you? Did Doc Cantley say how long Clement had been dead? Yeah, he done it about five o'clock, he said he guessed. Oh, you want to look at the remains, Scott? They're over at Fritz's undertaking, Paula. Not now. Hey, and speaking of firemen, what are you going to tell the guys from Transamerica when they show up here tonight? <laughs> Come in, come in. Oh, uh, they, they told me I'd find you here. You're Chief Anderson, aren't you? Yes, that's right. I'm Carl Reesing, assistant manager of the Trans-America Detective Agency in Philadelphia. This is Mr. Wheelock, who was Lester Furman's personal attorney. Glad to know you, Mr. Reesing. How do you do, Mr. Wheelock? Hmm. How do you do? I know you gentlemen are already in possession of most of the details concerning Mr. Furman from the time he arrived in Deerwood until the time of his death. But perhaps you don't know that the police of most towns in our corner of the state have also received copies of this same reward circular. Take a look at it. Oh, oh. I must say this circular is an excellent forgery. You're sure it's a forgery, Mr. Reesing? Oh, yes. There's no doubt about it. But it's an excellent forgery. Tell me, Mr. Wheelock, was Mr. Furman a native Philadelphian? Oh, my, yes. He was a well-known, respectable, and prosperous citizen of Philadelphia. Married, I believe? In 1934, he married a 22-year-old girl named Ethel Bryan, daughter of a Philadelphia family. And the Furman's had a child. Isn't that right, Mr. Wheelock? Yes, born in 1936, but the child lived only a few months. Mr. Furman's wife disappeared after the child's death. Well, what year was it that she disappeared? Mr. Reesing should remember that. His agency worked on the matter. Oh, I remember it well. Uh, Mrs. Furman disappeared in 1937. We never heard anything of her again, although Furman spent a lot of money trying to locate her. What did she look like, Mr. Reesing? Uh, just a moment. Uh, I have a picture of her right here in my briefcase. Uh, uh, here it is. Quite pretty, isn't she? If you care for that type. I see what you mean, Mr. Wheeler. She's attractive as that. Judging by this photo, I'd say that she was a small-featured, pretty blonde, with a weak mouth and large, somewhat staring eyes. Oh, that's an accurate enough description, all right. If you don't mind, I'd like to have a copy made of that photograph, Mr. Reesing. Oh, you can keep that one if you like. It's one that we had made up at Transamerica. Uh, her description's on the back. Thanks. Did uh, Furman have a divorce, sir? No, sir. He was a lot in love with her, and he seemed to think that the child's dying made her a little screwy so that she didn't know what she was doing. Uh, that's right, isn't it, Mr. Wheelock? That is my belief, Mr. Leasing. Uh, you said Furman had money, Mr. Wheelock. Uh, about how much did he have? And who gets it? I should say his estate will amount to perhaps a half a million dollars left in its entirety to his wife. Mm -hmm. It's quite a handy sum for anyone to have, I'd say. Mr. Wheelock, everything shows that somebody framed Furman into the Deerwood jail. That frame-up drove him to suicide. But there has to be something else. A lot else. Well, then, what are you going to do? I'm going across the street to the undertaking parlor and have a look at Farman. I'll see you later. Hello, Doc. Hi, Scott. I figured you'd come over here to the Undertaker's pretty soon. What's in your mind, Doc? Uh, let's uh, get out of this crowd. I, I want to tell you something. I just got rid of two guys in my office. Let's go back there. Suits me. Two of those uh, bruises uh, showed, Scott. What bruises? Furman. Well, up under the hair, there were, there were two bruises. Well, why didn't you tell me? I'm telling you now, Scott. You weren't here when I made my examination. This is the first time I've seen you since then. Why didn't you spill the stuff about Furman's bruises when you were testifying at the inquest, then? Uh, I'm a friend of yours. Do I want to put you on a spot where people can say you drove this chap to suicide by third degreeing him too rough? Ah, you're nuts. How bad was Furman's head? Well, Scott, uh, that didn't kill him, if that's what you mean. There's nothing the matter with his skull. Just a couple of bruises nobody had noticed, and unless they parted the hair. I thought you ought to know, though. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Yes, who is it? This is Fritz, the undertaker. Listen, Scott, there's a couple of ladies over here that want to take a look at Furman. Is it all right? Who are they? I don't know. I'm strangers. What do they want to see him for? I don't know. Wait a minute. Can I please see him? Why do you want to see him? Well, I... I'm... His wife. Furman's wife? Yes. 
Oh, 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 certainly. I'll be right over. So long, Ben. I've got to go back to the undertakers. So long, Scott. Hey, Scott. What do you want, Wally? I want to talk to you a minute. Over here where we won't be seen. Okay, what is it? A couple of dames came into Fritz's undertaking place just as I was leaving. One of them's Hotshaw Randall, a babe with a record as long as your arm. She's one of that mob you had me working on in New York last summer. Does she know you? Sure, but not by my right name. She thinks I'm a Detroit rum runner. I mean, did she recognize you just now? I don't think she saw me. Anyway, she didn't give me a tumble. You don't know the other one? No, she's a blonde, kind of pretty. Okay, Wally, stick around a while, but stay out of sight. Maybe I'll be bringing these dolls back with me. Whatever you say, Chief. Oh, there you are, Scott. I wondered hey, you, when you were coming. Uh, this is Mrs. Furman, and this is Mrs. Crowder. How do you do? Hiya, Chief. They just saw the body. Mrs. Crowder? I thought your name was Randall. What do you care, Chief? I'm not hurting your town any. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me Chief. You city slickers, I'm the town whittler. Thank you for letting me see him. It's all right, Mrs. Furman. But I'll have to ask you and your friends some questions. So if you'll just come across the street to headquarters, we'll get on with the routine. <laughs> any questions, I want to tell you something. Mrs. Furman, your husband didn't commit suicide. He was murdered. Murdered? Ah, oh, Chief, we got alibis. We were in New York, and we can prove it. And you're likely to get a chance to. What brought you down here, anyway? Murdered? Well, who's got a better right to come down here? She was still his wife, wasn't she? She's got a right to look out for her own interests, hasn't she? Mm-hmm. Uh, it reminds me of something. Uh, excuse me a second. Uh, I've got to make a phone call in the next room. Officer Hamill speaking. This is it Scott. Yes. Is Wally around? No, he's not here. He said you told him to keep out of sight. I'll find him for you, though. Right. Uh, tell Wally I want him to go to New York tonight. Send Mason home to get some sleep. He'll have to take over Wally's night trick. Oh. Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, do you think I had had anything to do with Lester's, with his death? I don't know, Mrs. Furman. I know he was killed. I also know I left you something like half a million. Wow, dollars? Dollars. All right, Chief. Let's stop clowning. The kid here didn't have a thing to do with whatever you think happened. No? No. We read about Lester Furman committing suicide in yesterday morning's paper. And about there being something funny about it. And I persuaded her she ought to come down to deal with him. Anderson, I wouldn't have done anything to hurt Lester. I left him because I wanted to leave him. I wouldn't have done anything to hurt him for, for money or anything else. Had I wanted money from him, I would only have had to ask him for it. That's the truth, Chief. For years I've been telling Ethel she was a chump not to tap him. But she never would. I wouldn't have hurt him. Why'd you leave him then? Oh, I don't know how to say it. The way we lived wasn't the way I wanted to live. I wanted... Oh, I don't know what... Anyway, after the baby died, I couldn't stand it anymore. Excuse me. Hello? Oh, yeah, Hammer? Hmm? You gave Wally the message? Yes, yes, I want him to go to New York tonight. Okay, where is he? Home? He is home, huh? Okay, thanks. Thanks. This is, uh, Furman. Uh, this circular it's got your husband in the jail... Did you ever see that picture before? No. Why, well, that's... It can't be. It, it's a snapshot I had. have. It's an enlargement of it. Who else has one? Nobody that I know of. I don't think anyone else could have one. You still got yours? Yes. Don't remember whether I've seen it recently. It was some old papers and things. But I must have it. Well, Mrs. Farman, it's stuff like that that's got to be checked up. Neither of us can dodge it. There's two ways we can play it. Yes. Mrs. Farman... I can hold you here on suspicion until I've had time to investigate things. Or I can send one of my men with you to check up in New York. Yes? I'm willing to do that if you'll speed things up by helping him all you can. If you promise you won't try any tricks. I promise. I'm as anxious as I All right. It's all right. How'd you come down? We drove down. We got a great big car. That's my car, see? That big green job across the street. Yeah. Yeah. And my man can ride back with you, but... No funny business. Oh, I don't worry, Chief. Come on. 
They're going to see Wally Shane. The man is going to drive to New York with you. Wally? Who is it? Scott, Wally. Come in. Ladies first. Harry. Harry. Careful. No, you don't. No, you don't. Oh, he was reaching with that gun, Wally. Already got you covered. I guess you win, Scott. Yeah, I guess I do. Come along back to headquarters with me like a good little boy. Molly, you're under arrest for murder. The minute I saw those two dames going into Fritz's. Then when I was dug and out of sight, I ran into you, and I was afraid you'd take me over there with you, so I had to tell you one of them knew me. Figured you'd want to keep me undercover for a little while anyhow. Long enough for me to get out of town. Why didn't you get out, Wally? Well, I dropped in home to pick up a couple of things before I scram, and that phone call of Hamels catches me, and, and I fall for it. You see, Scott, I figured you're not on to me yet, and are going to send me back to New York to see what dope I can get out of the dames. Well, you fooled me, brother. And I thought you'd fall for that. Then you didn't just stumble into all this accidentally, did you? No, I didn't, Wally. I figured Fairman had to be murdered by a copper. The no reward circuit was well enough to make a good job of forging one. Incidentally, who printed that Fairman circular for you, Wally? Now, I'm not dragging anyone in with me. It was only a poor mug that needed dough. Okay, Wally. You see, I knew only a copper would be sure enough of the routine to know how things would be handled. Only one of my coppers would be able to walk in a Furman's cell, bang him across the head, and string him up on the... Those bruises showed, you know. They did? I guess I should have wrapped two towels around that blackjack. Well, gee, Scott, I seem to have slipped up on a lot of things. So that narrows you down to my coppers, and... Well, you told me you knew the Randall woman. There it was. And I figured you were working with him. What got you like this, Wally? Same thing that gets most saps into jams, a yen for easy dough. And I was in New York, see, Scott, working that Dutton job for you, palling around with big shot racketeers, passing for one of them, and... Yes? Well, I got to figuring that my work takes more brains than theirs, and they're taking in big money, and I'm working for coffee and cakes. That kind of stuff gets you, Scott. Anyway, it got me. Mm-hmm. Then I ran into this Ethel Furman, and she goes for me like a house of fire. I liked her, too, see, so that's dandy. But one night, she tells me about how much dough her husband's got and how he feels about her, and I get to thinking... Thinking what? I think she's nuts enough about me to marry me. So I get to thinking, suppose he died and left her his role. Mm-hmm. I see. So I run down to Philly a couple of afternoons and look firm and up, and everything looks fine. I took my time working out the details, meanwhile writing to her through a fellow in Detroit. Go on. Finish one. Well, I decided to do it. I sent those circulars out to a lot of places, not wanting to point too much to this one. And then when I was ready, I phoned Furman, telling him to come to Deerwood Hotel that night. And sometime before the next night, he'd hear from his wife, Ethel. I knew he'd fall for any trap that was baited with her. Only, I guess I'm not as sharp as I thought I was, Scott. Maybe I are, Wally. Maybe I are. That doesn't always help. Old man Camsley... Ben's father used to have a saying, to a sharp knife comes a tough steak. Well, sorry you did it, Wally. I always liked you. I know you did, Scott. I was counting on that. Dashiell Hammett's Two Sharp Knives, starring Stuart Irwin. Tonight's story of suspense. Columbia presents these tales of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. 
next week, suspense will not be heard because of a special holiday broadcast. Columbia's review of the events of the year, 12 crowded months, which has been scheduled. On the following Tuesday, January 5th, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. William Spear, the producer, John Deet, the director, and Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor, are collaborators on Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.